Chapter Twenty Two of the Pioneers, or the Sources of the Susquehanna, a Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty Two Men, boys, and girls desert the unpeopled village, and wild crowds spread o'er the plain by the sweet frenzy driven. Somerville. From this time to the close of April, the weather continued to be a succession of neat and rapid changes. One day the soft airs of spring seemed to be stealing along the valley, and in unison with an invigorating sun, attempting covertly to rouse the dormant powers of the vegetable world, while on the next the surly blasts from the north would sweep across the lake and erase every impression left by their gentle adversaries. The snow, however, finally disappeared, and the green wheat fields were seen in every direction, spotted with the dark and charred stumps that had, the preceding season, supported some of the proudest trees of the forest. Ploughs were in motion, wherever those useful implements could be used, and the smokes of the sugar camps were no longer seen issuing from the woods of maple. The lake had lost the beauty of a field of ice, but still a dark and gloomy covering concealed its waters, for the absence of currents left them yet hidden under a porous crust, which, saturated with the fluid, barely retained enough strength to preserve the continuity of its parts. Large flocks of wild geese were seen passing over the country, which hovered for a time around the hidden sheet of water, apparently searching for a resting place, and then, on finding themselves excluded by the chill covering, would soar away to the north, filling the air with discordant screams, as if venting their complaints at the tardy operations of nature. For a week the dark covering of the Otsego was left to the undisturbed possession of two eagles, who alighted on the center of its field and sat eyeing their undisputed territory. During the presence of these monarchs of the air, the flocks of migrating birds avoided crossing the plain of ice by turning into the hills, apparently seeking the protection of the forests while the white and bald heads of the tenants of the lake were turned upward with a look of contempt. But the time had come when even these kings of birds were to be dispossessed. An opening had been gradually increasing at the lower extremity of the lake, and around the dark spot where the current of the river prevented the formation of ice during even the coldest weather, and the fresh southerly winds that now breathed freely upon the valley made an impression on the waters. Mimic waves began to curl over the margin of the frozen field, which exhibited an outline of crystallizations that slowly receded toward the north. At each step the power of the winds and the waves increased, until after a struggle of a few hours the turbulent little billows succeeded in setting the whole field in motion, when it was driven beyond the reach of the eye, with a rapidity that was as magical as the change produced in the scene by this expulsion of the lingering remnant of winter. Just as the last sheet of agitated ice was disappearing in the distance, the eagles rose, and soared with a wide sweep above the clouds, while the waves tossed their little caps of snow in the air, as if rioting in their release from a thraldom of five minutes' duration. The following morning Elizabeth was awakened by the exhilarating sounds of the Martins, who were quarrelling and chattering around the little boxes suspended above her windows, and the cries of Richard who was calling in tones animating as signs of the season itself. "'Awake! Awake! my fair lady! The gulls are hovering over the lake already, and the heavens are alive with pigeons. You may look an hour before you can find a hole through which to get a peep at the sun. Awake! Awake, lazy ones! Benjamin is overhauling the ammunition, and we only wait for our breakfasts, and away for the mountains and pigeon-shooting.' There was no resisting this animated appeal, and in a few minutes Miss Temple and her friend descended to the parlour. The doors of the hall were thrown open, and the mild, balmy air of a clear spring morning was ventilating the apartment, where the vigilance of the ex-steward had been so long maintaining an artificial heat with such unremitted diligence. The gentlemen were impatiently waiting for their morning's repast, each equipped in the garb of a sportsman. Mr. Jones made many visits to the southern door, and would cry, 
See, Cousin Bess, see. Duke, the pigeon roosts of the south have broken up. They are growing more thick every instant. Here is a flock that the eye cannot see the end of. There is food enough in it to keep the army of Xerxes for a month, and feathers enough to make beds for the whole country. Xerxes, Mr. Edwards, was a Grecian king who— No, he was a Turk, or, or a Persian, who wanted to conquer Greece, just the same as these rascals will overrun our wheat-fields, when they come back in the fall. Away! Away! Bess, I long to pepper them! In this wish both Marmaduke and young Edwards seemed equally to participate, for the sight was exhilarating to a sportsman and the ladies soon dismissed the party after a hasty breakfast. If the heavens were alive with pigeons, the whole village seemed equally in motion with men, women, and children. Every species of firearm, from the French ducking gun, with a barrel near six feet in length, to the common horseman's pistol, was to be seen in the hands of the men and boys, while bows and arrows, some made of the simple stick of walnut sapling, and others in a rude imitation of the ancient crossbows, were carried by many of the latter. The houses and the signs of life apparent in the village drove the alarmed birds from the direct line of their flight, toward the mountains, along the sides and near the bases of which they were glancing in dense masses, equally wonderful by the rapidity of their motion and their incredible numbers. We have already said that, across the inclined plain which fell from the steep ascent of the mountain to the banks of the Susquehanna, ran the highway on either side of which a clearing of many acres had been made at a very early day. Over those clearings, and up the eastern mountain, and along the dangerous path that was cut into its side, the different individuals posted themselves, and in a few moments the attack commenced. Among the sportsmen was the tall, gaunt form of leather stocking walking over the field, with his rifle hanging on his arm, his dogs at his heels. The latter now scenting the dead or wounded birds that were beginning to tumble from the flocks, and then crouching under the legs of their master, as if they participated in his feelings at this wasteful and unsportsmanlike execution. The reports of the firearms became rapid, whole volleys rising from the plain, as flocks of more than ordinary numbers darted over the opening shadowing the field like a cloud, and then the light smoke of a single piece would issue from among the leafless bushes on the mountain, as death was hurled on the retreat of the affrighted birds, who were rising from a volley, in a vain effort to escape. Arrows and missiles of every kind were in the midst of the flocks, and so numerous were the birds, and so low did they take their flight, that even long poles in the hands of those on the sides of the mountain were used to strike them to the earth. During all this time Mr. Jones, who disdained the humble and ordinary means of destruction used by his companions, was busily occupied, aided by Benjamin, in making arrangements for an assault of more than ordinarily fatal character. Among the relics of the old military excursions that occasionally are discovered throughout the different districts of the western part of New York, there had been found in Templeton, at its settlement, a small swivel, which would carry a ball of a pound weight. It was thought to have been deserted by a war-party of the whites in one of their inroads into the Indian settlements, when perhaps convenience or their necessity induced them to leave such an encumbrance behind them in the woods. This miniature cannon had been released from the rust, and being mounted on little wheels was now in a state for actual service. For several years it was the sole organ for extraordinary rejoicings used in those mountains. On the mornings of the Fourth of July it would be heard ringing among the hills, and even Captain Hollister, who was the highest authority in that part of the country on all such occasions, affirmed that, considering its dimensions, it was no despicable gun for a salute. It was somewhat the worse for the service it had performed, it is true, there being but a trifling difference in size between the touch-hole and the muzzle. Still, the grand conceptions of Richard had suggested the importance of such an instrument in hurling death at his nimble enemies. The swivel was dragged by a horse into a part of the open space that the sheriff thought most eligible for planning a battery of the kind, and Mr. Pump proceeded to load it. Several handfuls of duck-shot were placed on top of the powder, and the Major Domo announced that his piece was ready for service. 
The sight of such an implement collected all the idle spectators to the spot, who, being mostly boys, filled the air with cries of exultation and delight. The gun was pointed high, and Richard, holding a coal of fire in a pair of tongs, patiently took his seat on a stump, awaiting the appearance of a flock worthy of his notice. So prodigious was the number of the birds that the scattering fire of the guns, with the hurling of missiles and the cries of the boys, had no other effect than to break off small flocks from the immense masses that continued to dart along the valley, as if the whole of the feathered tribe were pouring through that one pass. None pretended to collect the game, which lay scattered over the fields in such profusion as to cover the very ground with fluttering victims. Leatherstocking was a silent but uneasy spectator of all these proceedings, but was able to keep his sentiments to himself until he saw the introduction of the swivel into the sports. "'This comes of settling a country,' he said. "'Here I have known the pigeon to fly for forty long years, and, till you made your clearings, there was nobody to skirt or to hurt them. I loved to see them come into the woods, for they were company to a body hurting nothing, being, as it was, as harmless as a garter-snake. But now it gives me sore thoughts when I hear the frighty things whizzing through the air, for I know it's only a motion to bring out all the brats of the village. Well, the Lord won't see the waste of his creatures for nothing, and right will be done to the pigeons, as well as others, by and by. There's Mr. Oliver as bad as the rest of them firing into the flocks as if he was shooting down nothing but Mingo warriors. Among the sportsmen was Billy Kirby, who, armed with an old musket, was loading, and, without even looking into the air, was firing and shouting as his victims fell even on his own person. He heard the speech of Natty, and took upon himself to reply. "'What, old leather-stocking?' he cried, grumbling at the loss of a few pigeons. If you had to sow your wheat twice and three times, as I have done, you wouldn't be so massifully feeling toward the devils. Hurrah, boys! Scatter the feathers! This is better than shooting at a turkey's head and neck, old fellow. It's better for you, maybe, Billy Kirby, replied the indignant old hunter, and all them that don't know how to put a ball down a rifle barrel, or how to bring it up again with a true aim but it's wicked to be shooting into flocks in this wasty manner, and none to do it who know how to knock over a single bird. If a body has a craving for pigeon's flesh, why, it's made the same as all other creatures, for man's eating, but not to kill twenty and eat one. When I want such a thing I go into the woods till I find one to my liking, and then I shoot him off the branches without touching the feather of another, though there might be a hundred on the same tree. You couldn't do such a thing, Billy Kirby. You couldn't do it if you tried. "'What's that old cornstalk, you sapless stub?' cried the woodchopper. "'You have grown wordy since the affair of the turkey. But if you are for a single shot, here goes at that bird which comes on by himself.' The fire from the distant part of the field had driven a single pigeon below the flock to which it belonged, and frightened, with the constant reports of the muskets, it was approaching the spot where the disputants stood, darting first from one side and then to the other, cutting the air with the swiftness of lightning, and making a noise with its wings not unlike the rushing of a bullet. Unfortunately for the woodchopper, notwithstanding his vaunt, he did not see this bird until it was too late to fire as it approached, and he pulled the trigger at the unlucky moment when it was darting immediately over his head. The bird continued its course with the usual velocity. Natty lowered his rifle from his arm when the challenge was made, and waiting a moment until the terrified victim had got in a line with his eye, and had dropped near the bank of the lake, he raised it again with uncommon rapidity, and fired. It might have been chance, or it might have been skill, that produced the result. It was probably a union of both. But the pigeon whirled over in the air, and fell into the lake with a broken wing. At the sound of his rifle, both his dogs started from his feet, and in a few minutes the slut brought out the bird still alive. The wonderful exploit of leather stocking was noised through the field with great rapidity, and the sportsmen gathered in to learn the truth of the report. "'What,' said young Edwards, 
Have you really killed a pigeon on the wing, Natty, with a single ball? Haven't I killed loons before now, lad, that dive at the flash? returned the hunter. It's much better to kill only such as you want, without wasting your powder and lead, than to be firing into God's creatures in this wicked manner. But I came out for a bird, and you know the reason why I like small game, Mr. Oliver. And now I have got one, twill go home for I don't relish to see these wasty ways that you are all practicing, as if the least thing wasn't made for use, and not to destroy. "'Thou sayest well, Leather Stocking,' cried Marmaduke, "'and I begin to think it time to put an end to this work of destruction. "'Put an end, Judge, to your clearings. Ain't the woods his work as well as the pigeons? "'Use, but don't waste.' Wasn't the woods made for the beasts and birds to harbor in? And when man wanted their flesh, their skins, or their feathers, there's the place to seek them. But I'll go to the hut with my own game, for I wouldn't touch one of the harmless things that cover the ground here, looking up with their eyes on me, as if they only wanted tongues to say their thoughts. With this sentiment in his mouth, Leatherstocking threw his rifle over his arm, and, followed by his dog, stepped across the clearing with great caution, taking care not to tread on one of the wounded birds in his path. He soon entered the bushes on the margin of the lake, and was hid from view. Whatever impression the morality of Natty made on the judge, it was utterly lost on Richard. He availed himself of the gathering of the sportsmen to lay a plan for one fell swoop of destruction. The musket-men were drawn up in battle array, in a line extending on each side of his artillery, with orders to await the signal of firing from himself. "'Stand by, my lads,' said Benjamin, who acted as an aide-de-camp on this occasion. "'Stand by, my hearties, and when Squire Dickens heaves out the signal to begin firing, do you see, you may open upon them in a broadside. Take care and fire low, boys, and you'll be sure to hold the flock.' "'Fire low!' shouted Kirby. "'Hear the old fool. If we fire low we may hit the stumps, but not ruffle a pigeon.' "'How should you know, you lubber?' cried Benjamin, with a very unbecoming heat for an officer on the eve of battle. "'How should you know, you grampus? Haven't I sailed aboard of the Bodiche for five years, and wasn't it a standing order to fire low and to hull your enemy? Keep silence at your guns, boys, and mind the order that is passed.' The loud laughs of the musket-men were silenced by the more authoritative voice of Richard, who called for attention and obedience to his signals. Some millions of pigeons were supposed to have already passed that morning over the valley of Templeton, but nothing like the flock that was now approaching had been seen before. It extended from mountain to mountain in one solid blue mass, and the eye looked in vain over the southern hills to find its termination. The front of this living column was distinctly marked by a line but very slightly indented, so regular and even was the flight. Even Marmaduke forgot the morality of leather stocking as it approached, and in common with the rest brought his musket to a poise. "'Fire!' cried the sheriff, clapping a coal to the priming of the cannon. As half of Benjamin's charge escaped through the touch-hole, the whole volley of the musketry preceded the report of the swivel. On receiving this united discharge of small arms, the front of the flock darted upward, while at the same instant myriads of those in the rear rushed with amazing rapidity into their places, so that when the column of white smoke gushed from the mouth of the little cannon, an accumulated mass of objects was gliding over its point of direction. The roar of the gun echoed along the mountains, and died away to the north like distant thunder, while the whole flock of alarmed birds seemed for a moment thrown into one disorderly and agitated mass. The air was filled with their irregular flight, layer rising above layer, far above the tops of the highest pines, none daring to advance beyond the dangerous pass, when suddenly some of the headers of the feathered tribes shot across the valley, taking their flight directly over the village, and hundreds of thousands in their rear followed the example, deserting the eastern side of the plain to their persecutors and the slain. "'Victory!' shouted Richard. Victory! We have driven the enemy from the field. Not so, Dickon," said Marmaduke. The field is covered with them. And, like the leather stocking, I see nothing but eyes in every direction as the innocent sufferers turn their heads in terror. Full one half of those that have fallen are yet alive, and I think it is time to end the sport. 
if sport it be. Sport, cried the sheriff, it is princely sport. There are some thousands of the blue-coated boys on the ground, so that every old woman in the village may have a pot-pie for the asking. Well, we have happily frightened the birds from this side of the valley, said Marmaduke, and the carnage must of necessity end for the present. Boys, I will give you sixpence a hundred for the pigeons' heads only, so go to work, and bring them into the village. This expedient produced the desired effect, for every urchin on the ground went industriously to work to wring the necks of the wounded birds. Judge Temple retired toward his dwelling, with that kind of feeling that many a man has experienced before him, who discovers, after the excitement of the moment has passed, that he has purchased pleasure at the price of misery to others. Horses were loaded with the dead, and after this first burst of sporting, the shooting of pigeons became a business with a few idlers for the remainder of the season. Richard, however, boasted for many a year of his shot with the cricket, and Benjamin gravely asserted that he thought they had killed nearly as many pigeons on that day as there were Frenchmen destroyed on the memorable occasion of Rodney's victory. End of chapter 22 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter Twenty Three of the Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a Descriptive Tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter Twenty Three Help, masters, help! There's a fish hangs in the net, like a poor man's right in the law. Pericles of Tyre. The advance of the season now became as rapid as its first approach had been tedious and lingering. The days were uniformly mild, while the nights, though cool, were no longer chilled by frosts. The whippoorwill was heard whistling his melancholy notes along the margin of the lake, and the ponds and meadows were sending forth the music of their thousand tenants. The leaf of the native poplar was seen quivering in the woods. The sides of the mountains began to lose their hue of brown as the lively green of the different members of the forest blended their shades with the permanent colors of the pine and hemlock. And even the buds of the tardy oak were swelling with the promise of the coming summer. The gay and fluttering bluebird, the social robin, and the industrious little wren were all to be seen enlivening the fields with their presence and their songs, while the soaring fish-hawk was already hovering over the waters of the Otsego watching with native voracity for the appearance of his prey. The tenants of the lake were far famed for both their quantities and their quality, and the ice had hardly disappeared before numberless little boats were launched from the shores, and the lines of the fishermen were dropped into the inmost recesses of its deepest caverns, tempting the unwary animals with every variety of bait that the ingenuity or the art of man had invented. But the slow, though certain, adventures with hook and line were ill-suited to the profusion and impatience of the settlers. More destructive means were resorted to. And, as the season had now arrived when the bass fisheries were allowed by the provisions of the law that Judge Temple had procured, the sheriff declared his intention by availing himself of the first dark night to enjoy the sport in person. "'And you shall be present, Cousin Bess,' he added, when he announced this design and Miss Grant, and Mr. Edwards, and I will show you what I call fishing, not nibble-nibble-nibble, as Duke does when he goes after the salmon-trout. There he will sit for hours in a broiling sun, or perhaps over a hole in the lee, in the coldest days in winter, under the lee of a few bushes, and not a fish will he catch, after all this mortification of the flesh. No, no, give me a good seine that's fifty or sixty fathoms in length, with a jolly parcel of boatmen to crack their jokes the while with Benjamin to steer, and let us haul them in by thousands. I call that fishing. "'Ah, Dickon!' cried Marmaduke. "'Thou knowest but little of the pleasure there is in playing with the hook and line, or thou wouldst be more saving of the game. I have known thee to leave fragments enough behind thee, when thou hast headed a night-party on the lake, to feed a dozen famishing families.' "'I shall not dispute the matter, Judge Temple. This night will I go.' and I invite the company to attend, and then let them decide between us. 
Richard was busy during most of the afternoon making his preparations for the important occasion. Just as the light of the settling sun had disappeared, and a new moon had begun to throw its shadows on the earth, the fishermen took their departure, in a boat, for a point that was situated on the western shore of the lake, at the distance of rather more than half a mile from the village. The ground had become settled, and the walking was good and dry. Marmaduke, with his daughter, her friend, and young Edwards, continued on the high grassy banks at the outlet of the placid sheet of water, watching the dark object that was moving across the lake, until it entered the shade of the western hills, and was lost to the eye. The distance round by land to the point of destination was a mile, and he observed, "'It is time for us to be moving. The moon will be down ere we reach the point, and then the miraculous halls of Dickon will commence.' The evening was warm, and after the long and dreary winter from which they had just escaped, delightfully invigorating. Inspirited by the scene and their anticipated amusement, the youthful companions of the judge followed his steps as he led them along the shores of the Otsego, and through the skirts of the village. "'See,' said young Edwards, "'they are building their fire already. It glimmers for a moment, and dies again like the light of a firefly.' "'Now it blazes,' cried Elizabeth. "'You can perceive figures moving around the light. Oh, I would bet my jewels against the gold beads of Remarkable, that my impatient cousin Dickon had an agency in raising that bright flame and see, it fades again, like most of his brilliant schemes. "'Thou hast guessed the truth, Bess," said her father. "'He has thrown an armful of brush on the pile, which has burnt out as soon as lighted. But it has enabled them to find a better fuel, for their fire begins to blaze with a more steady flame. It is the true fisherman's beacon now. Observe how beautifully it throws its little circle of light on the water. The appearance of the fire urged the pedestrians on, for even the ladies had become eager to witness the miraculous draught. By the time they reached the bank, which rose above the low point where the fishermen had landed, the moon had sunk behind the top of the western pines, and, as most of the stars were obscured by clouds, there was but little other light than that which proceeded from the fire. At the suggestion of Marmaduke, his companions paused to listen to the conversation of those below them and examined the party for a moment before they descended to the shore. The whole group were seated around the fire, with the exception of Richard and Benjamin, the former of whom occupied the root of a decayed stump that had been drawn to the spot as part of their fuel, and the latter was standing with his arms akimbo, so near to the flame that the smoke occasionally obscured his solemn visage, as it waved around the pile in obedience to the night airs that swept gently over the water. "'Why, look you, squire,' said the major-domo, "'you may call a lake-fish that will weigh twenty or thirty pounds a serious matter. But to a man who has hauled in a shovel-nosed shirk, do you see, it's but a poor kind of fishing after all.' "'I don't know, Benjamin,' returned the sheriff. "'A haul of one thousand Otsego bass, without counting pike, pickerel, perch, bull-pouts, salmon-trouts, and suckers, is no bad fishing, let me tell you.' There may be sport in sticking a shark, but what is he good for after you have got him? Now any one of the fish that I have named is fit to set before a king." "'Well, squire,' returned Benjamin, "'just listen to the philosophy of the thing. Would it stand to reason that such a fish should live and be catched in this here little pond of water, where it's hardly deep enough to drown a man, as you'll find in the wide ocean, where, as everybody knows, that is, everybody that has followed the seas, whales and grampuses are to be seen, that are as long as one of the pine-trees on yonder mountain?" "'Softly, softly, Benjamin,' said the sheriff, as if he wished to save the credit of his favorite. "'Why, some of the pines will measure two hundred feet, and even more.' Two hundred or two thousand, it's all the same thing,' cried Benjamin, with an air which manifested that he was not easily to be bullied out of his opinion on a subject like the present. Haven't I been there? And haven't I seen? I have said that you fall in with whales as long as one of them there pines. And what I have once said I'll stand to." During this dialogue, which was evidently but the close of much longer discussion, the huge frame of Billy Kirby was seen extended on one side of the fire, 
where he was picking his teeth with splinters of the chips near him, and occasionally shaking his head with distrust of Benjamin's assertions. "'I've a notion,' said the woodchopper, "'that there's water in this lake to swim the biggest whale that ever was invented. And as to the pines, I think I ought to know something concerning them. I have chopped many a one that was sixty times the length of my help, without counting the eye. And I believe, Benny, that if the old pine that stands in the hollow of the Vision Mountain just over the village, you may see the tree itself by looking up. For the moon is on its top yet. Well, now I believe, if that same tree was planted out in the deepest part of the lake, there would be water enough for the biggest ship that ever was built to float over it, without touching its upper branches, I do. "'Did he ever see a ship, Master Kirby?' roared the steward. "'Did he ever see a ship, man, or any craft bigger than a lime-scow or a wood-boat on this here small bit of fresh water?' "'Yes, I have,' said the woodchopper stoutly. "'I can say that I have, and tell no lie.' "'Did he ever see a British ship, Master Kirby, an English line of battleship, boy? "'Where did he ever fall in with a regular built vessel, with starn-post and cut-water, gar-board streak, and plank-shear, gangways and hatchways and waterways, quarter-deck and forecastle, aye, and flush-deck? "'Tell me that, man, if you can.' Where away did he ever fall in with a full-rigged, regular-built, necked vessel?" The whole company were a good deal astounded with this overwhelming question, and even Richard afterward remarked that it was a thousand pities that Benjamin could not read, or he must have made a valuable officer to the British Marine. It is no wonder that they overcame the French so easily on the water, when even the lowest sailor so well understood the different parts of a vessel. But Billy Kirby was a fearless white and had great jealousy of foreign dictation. He had risen on his feet, and turned his back to the fire, during the valuable delivery of this interrogatory, and when the steward ended, contrary to all expectation, he gave the following spirited reply. "'Where? Why, on the North River, and maybe on Champlain. There's sloops on the river, boy, that would give a hard time on it to the stoutest vessel King George owns.' They carry masts of ninety feet in the clear of good solid pine, for I've been at the chopping of many a one in Vermont State. I wish I was captain in one of them, and you was in that board dish that you talk so much about, and we'd soon see what good Yankee stuff is made on, and whether a Vermonter's hide ain't as thick as an Englishman's. The echoes from the opposite hills, which were more than half a mile from the fishing point, sent back the discordant laugh that Benjamin gave forth at this challenge, and the woods that covered their sides seemed, by the noise that issued from their shades, to be full of mocking demons. "'Let us descend to the shore,' whispered Marmaduke, "'or there will soon be ill blood between them. Benjamin is a fearless boaster, and Kirby, though good-natured, is a careless son of the forest, who thinks one American more than a match for six Englishmen. I marvel that Dickon is silent where there is such a trial of skill in the superlative. The appearance of Judge Temple and the ladies produced, if not a pacification, at least a cessation of hostilities. Obedient to the directions of Mr. Jones, the fishermen prepared to launch their boat, which had been seen in the background of the view, with the net carefully disposed on a little platform in its stern, ready for service. Richard gave vent to his reproaches at the tardiness of the pedestrians, when all the turbulent passions of the party were succeeded by a calm, as mild and as placid as that which prevailed over the beautiful sheet of water that they were about to rifle of its best treasures. The night had now become so dark as to render objects, without the reach of the light of the fire, not only indistinct, but in most cases invisible. For a little distance the water was discernible, glistening, as the glare from the fire danced over its surface, touching it here and there with red quivering streaks. But at a hundred feet from the shore there lay a boundary of impenetrable gloom. One or two stars were shining through the openings of the clouds, and the lights were seen in the village, glimmering faintly, as if at an immeasurable distance. At times, as the fire lowered, or as the horizon cleared, the outline of the mountain, on the other side of the lake, might be traced by its undulations, but its shadow was cast, wide and dense, on the bosom of the water, 
rendering the darkness in that direction trebly deep. Benjamin Pump was invariably the coxswain and netcaster of Richard's boat, unless the sheriff saw fit to preside in person, and on the present occasion Billy Kirby and a youth of about half his strength were assigned to the oars. The remainder of the assistants were stationed at the drag ropes. The arrangements were speedily made, and Richard gave the signal to shove off. Elizabeth watched the motion of the bateau as it pulled from the shore, letting loose its rope as it went, but it soon disappeared in the darkness, when the ear was her only guide to its evolutions. There was great affectation of stillness during all these maneuvers, in order, as Richard assured them, not to frighten the bass who were running into the shoal waters, and who would approach the light if not disturbed by the sounds from the fishermen. The hoarse voice of Benjamin was alone heard issuing out of the gloom as he uttered in authoritative tones, "'Pull larboard oar! Pull starboard! Give way together, boys!' and such other indicative mandates as were necessary for the right disposition of his sane. A long time was passed in this necessary part of the process, for Benjamin prided himself greatly on his skill in throwing the net, and in fact most of the success of the sport depended on its being done with judgment. At length a loud splash in the water, as he threw away the staff or stretcher, with a hoarse call from the steward of Clear, announced that the boat was returning. When Richard seized a brand from the fire, and ran to a point as far above the center of the fishing-ground as the one from which the bateau had started was below it. "'Stick her in dead for the squire, boys,' said the steward, "'and we'll have a look at what grows in this here pond.' In place of the falling net were now to be heard the quick strokes of the oars, and the noise of the rope running out of the boat. Presently the bateau shot into the circle of light, and in an instant she was pulled to the shore. Several eager hands were extended to receive the line, and both ropes being equally well manned, the fishermen commenced hauling in with slow and steady drags. Richard standing to the center, giving orders, first to one party and then to the other, to increase or slacken their efforts, as occasion required. The visitors were posted near him, and enjoyed a fair view of the whole operation, which was slowly advancing to an end. Opinions as to the result of their adventure were now freely hazarded by all the men, some declaring that the net came in as light as a feather, and others affirming that it seemed to be full of logs. As the ropes were many hundred feet in length, these opposing sentiments were thought to be of little moment by the sheriff, who would go first to one line and then to the other, giving each small pulls, in order to enable him to form an opinion for himself. "'Why, Benjamin!' he cried, as he made his first effort in this way. "'You did not throw the net clear. I can move it with my little finger. The rope slackens in my hand.' "'Did you ever see a whale, squire?' responded the steward. I say that, if that there net is foul, the devil is in the lake in the shape of a fish, for I cast it as far as ever rigging was rove over the quarter-deck of a flagship. But Richard discovered his mistake when he saw Billy Kirby before him, standing with his feet in the water, at an angle of forty-five degrees, inclining southward, and expending his gigantic strength in sustaining himself in that posture. He ceased his remonstrances, and proceeded to the party at the other line. "'I see the staffs!' shouted Mr. Jones. "'Gather in, boys, and away with it! To shore with her! To shore with her!' At this cheerful sound Elizabeth strained her eyes and saw the ends of the two sticks on the seine emerging from the darkness, while the men closed near to each other and formed a deep bag of their net. The exertions of the fishermen sensibly increased and the voice of Richard was heard encouraging them to make their greatest efforts at the present moment. "'Now's the time, my lads,' he cried. "'Let us get the ends to land, and all we have will be our own. Away with her!' "'Away with her it is!' echoed Benjamin. "'Hurrah! Ho-a-hey! Ho-a-hey! Ho-ah! "'In with her!' shouted Kirby exerting himself in a manner that left nothing for those in his rear to do but to gather up the slack of the rope which passed through his hands. "'Staff ho!' shouted the steward. "'Staff ho!' echoed Kirby from the other rope. The men rushed to the water's edge, 
some seizing the upper rope and some the lower or lead rope, and began to haul with great activity and zeal. A deep semicircular sweep of the little balls that supported the seine in its perpendicular position was plainly visible to the spectators, and as it rapidly lessened in size, the bag of the net appeared, while an occasional flutter on the water announced the uneasiness of the prisoners it contained. "'Haul in, my lads!' shouted Richard. "'I can see the dogs kicking to get free. Haul in, and here's a cast that will pay for the labor.' Fishes of various sorts were now to be seen, entangled in the meshes of the net, as it was passed through the hands of the laborers, and the water, at a little distance from the shore, was alive with the movements of the alarmed victims. Hundreds of white sides were glancing up to the surface of the water, and glistening in the firelight, when, frightened at the uproar and the change, the fish would again dart to the bottom in fruitless efforts for freedom. Hurrah! shouted Richard. One or two more heavy drags, boys, and we are safe. Cheerily, boys, cheerily, cried Benjamin. I see a salmon trout that is big enough for a chowder. Away with you, varmint, said Billy Kirby, plucking a bull pout from the meshes, and casting the animal back into the lake with contempt. Pull, boys, pull. Here's all kinds, and the Lord condemn me for a liar if there ain't a thousand bass. Inflamed beyond the bounds of discretion at the sight, and forgetful of the season, the woodchopper rushed to his middle into the water, and began to drive the reluctant animals before him from their native element. "'Pull heartily, boys!' cried Marmaduke, yielding to the excitement of the moment, and laying his hands to the net with no trifling addition to the force. Edwards had preceded him, for the sight of the immense piles of fish that were slowly rolling over on the gravelly beach had impelled him also to leave the ladies and join the fishermen. Great care was observed in bringing the net to land, and after much toil the whole shoal of victims was safely deposited in a hollow of the bank, where they were left to flutter away their brief existence in the new and fatal element. Even Elizabeth and Louisa were greatly excited and highly gratified by seeing two thousand captives thus drawn from the bosom of the lake and laid prisoners at their feet. But when the feelings of the moment were passing away, Marmaduke took in his hands a bass that might have weighed two pounds, and after viewing it a moment, in melancholy musing, he turned to his daughter and observed, "'This is a fearful expenditure of the choicest gifts of Providence. These fish, Bess, which thou seest lying in such piles before thee, and which by to-morrow evening will be rejected food on the meanest table in Templeton, are of a quality and flavor that, in other countries, would make them esteemed a luxury on the tables of princes or epicures. The world has no better fish than the bass of Otsego. It unites the richness of the shad to the firmness of the salmon. Author's insertion? Of all the fish the writer has ever tasted, he thinks the one in question the best. End author's insertion. "'But surely, dear sir,' cried Elizabeth, "'they must prove a great blessing to the country, and a powerful friend to the poor.' "'The poor are always prodigal, my child, where there is plenty, and seldom think of a provision against the morrow. But if there can be any excuse for destroying animals in this manner, it is in taking the bass. During the winter, you know, they are entirely protected from our assaults by the ice, for they refuse the hook, and during the hot months they are not seen.' It is supposed they retreat to the deep and cool waters of the lake at that season, and it is only in the spring and autumn that for a few days they are to be found around the points where they are within the reach of a seine. But like all the other treasures of the wilderness, they already begin to disappear before the wasteful extravagance of man. "'Disappear, Duke! Disappear!' exclaimed the sheriff. "'If you don't call this appearing, I know not what you will.' Here are a good thousand of the shiners, some hundreds of suckers, and a powerful quantity of other fry. But this is always the way with you, Marmaduke. First it's the trees, then it's the deer, after that it's the maple sugar, and so on to the end of the chapter. One day you talk of canals through a country where there's a river or a lake every half mile, just because the water won't run the way you wish it to go. And the next you say something about mines of coal though any man who has good eyes like myself, I say with good eyes, can see more wood 
than would keep the city of London in fuel for fifty years. Wouldn't it, Benjamin?' "'Why, for that, squire,' said the steward, "'London is no small place. If it was stretched on end, all the same as a town on one side of the river, it would cover some such matter as this here lake. Though if I dares to say that the wood in sight might serve them a good turn, seeing that the Londoners mainly burn coal. Now we are on the subject of coal, Judge Temple, interrupted the sheriff. I have a thing of much importance to communicate to you, but I will defer it until to-morrow. I know that you intend riding into the eastern part of the patent, and I will accompany you, and conduct you to a spot where some of your projects may be realized. We will say no more now, for there are listeners. But a secret has this evening been revealed to me, Duke, that is of much more consequence to your welfare than all your estate united." Marmaduke laughed at the important intelligence, to which in a variety of shapes he was accustomed, and the sheriff, with an air of great dignity, as if pitying his want of faith, proceeded in the business more immediately before them. As the labor of drawing the net had been very great, he directed one party of his men to commence throwing the fish into piles, preparatory to the usual division, while another, under the superintendence of Benjamin, prepared the seine for a second haul. End of chapter 23 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 24 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. CHAPTER Twenty-Four. While from its margin, terrible to tell, three sailors with their gallant boatswain fell. Falconer While the fishermen were employed in making the preparations for an equitable division of the spoil, Elizabeth and her friends strolled a short distance from the group, along the shore of the lake. After reaching a point to which even the brightest of the occasional gleams of the fire did not extend, they turned, and paused a moment, in contemplation of the busy and lively party they had left, and of the obscurity which, like the gloom of oblivion, seemed to envelop the rest of the creation. "'This is indeed a subject for the pencil!' exclaimed Elizabeth. "'Observe the countenance of that woodchopper, while he exults in presenting a larger fish than common to my cousin Sheriff.' And see, Louisa, how handsome and considerate my dear father looks by the light of that fire, where he stands viewing the havoc of the game. He seems melancholy, as if he actually thought that a day of retribution was to follow this hour of abundance and prodigality. Would they not make a picture, Louisa? You know that I am ignorant of all such accomplishments, Miss Temple. "'Call me by my Christian name,' interrupted Elizabeth. "'This is not a place, neither is this a scene for forms.' "'Well, then, if I may venture an opinion,' said Louisa timidly, "'I should think it might indeed make a picture. The selfish earnestness of that Kirby over his fish would contrast finely with the, the, the expression of Mr. Edwards' face. I hardly know what to call it, but it is a—it is—you—you you know what I would say, dear Elizabeth.' "'You do me too much credit, Miss Grant,' said the heiress. "'I am no diviner of thoughts or interpreter of expressions.' There was certainly nothing harsh or even cold in the manner of the speaker, but still it repressed the conversation, and they continued to stroll still farther from the party, retaining each other's arm, but observing a profound silence. Elizabeth, perhaps conscious of the improper phraseology of her last speech, or perhaps excited by the new object that met her gaze, was the first to break the awkward cessation in the discourse, by exclaiming, "'Look, Louisa, we are not alone. There are fishermen lighting a fire on the other side of the lake, immediately opposite to us. It must be in front of the cabin of leather stocking.' Through the obscurity, which prevailed most immediately under the eastern mountain, a small and uncertain light was plainly to be seen, though, as it was occasionally lost to the eye, it seemed struggling for existence. They observed it to move, and sensibly to lower, as it carried down the descent of the bank to the shore. Here, in a very short time, its flame gradually expanded and grew brighter, until it became the size of a man's head. 
when it continued to shine a steady ball of fire. Such an object, lighted as it were by magic, under the brow of the mountain, and in that retired and unfrequented place, gave double interest to the beauty and singularity of its appearance. It did not at all resemble the large and unsteady light of their own fire, being much more clear and bright, and retaining its size and shape with perfect uniformity. There are moments when the best regulated minds are more or less subjected to the injurious impressions which few have escaped in infancy, and Elizabeth smiled at her own weakness while she remembered the idle tales which were circulated through the village at the expense of the leather stocking. The same ideas seized her companion and at the same instant, for Louisa pressed nearer to her friend, as she said in a low voice, stealing a timid glance toward the bushes and trees that overhung the bank near them, "'Did you ever hear the singular ways of this natty spoken of, Miss Temple? They say that, in his youth, he was an Indian warrior, or, what is the same thing, a white man leagued with the savages, and it is thought he has been concerned in many of their inroads in the old wars.' The thing is not at all improbable, returned Elizabeth. He is not alone in that particular. No, surely. But is it not strange that he is so cautious with his hut? He never leaves it without fastening it in a remarkable manner. And in several instances, when the children or even the men of the village have wished to seek a shelter there from the storms, he has been known to drive them from his door with rudeness and threats. That surely is singular to this country." It is certainly not very hospitable, but we must remember his aversion to the customs of civilized life. You heard my father say, a few days since, how kindly he was treated by him on his first visit to his place." Elizabeth paused and smiled with an expression of peculiar archness, though the darkness hid its meaning from her companion, as she continued, "'Besides, he certainly admits the visits of Mr. Edwards, whom we both know to be far from a savage. To this speech Louisa made no reply, but continued gazing on the object which had elicited her remarks. In addition to the bright and circular flame was now to be seen a fainter, though a vivid light, of an equal diameter to the other at the upper end, but which, after extending downward for many feet, gradually tapered to a point at its lower extremity. A dark space was plainly visible between the two, and the new illumination was placed beneath the other the whole forming an appearance not unlike an inverted note of admiration. It was soon evident that the latter was nothing but the reflection, from the water, of the former, and that the object, whatever it might be, was advancing across, or rather over, the lake, for it seemed to be several feet above its surface, in a direct line with themselves. Its motion was amazingly rapid, the ladies having hardly discovered that it was moving at all, before the waving light of a flame was discerned losing its regular shape, while it increased in size as it approached. "'It appears to be supernatural,' whispered Louisa, beginning to retrace her steps toward the party. "'It is beautiful,' exclaimed Elizabeth. A brilliant though waving flame was now plainly visible, gracefully gliding over the lake, and throwing its light on the water in such a manner as to tinge it slightly though in the air. So strong was the contrast the darkness seemed to have the distinctness of material substances, as if the fire were embedded in a setting of ebony. This appearance, however, gradually wore off, and the rays from the torch struck out and enlightened the atmosphere in front of it, leaving the background in a darkness that was more impenetrable than ever. "'Ho, oh, Natty! Is that you?' shouted the sheriff. "'Paddle in, old boy!' and I'll give you a mess of fish that is fit to place before the governor." The light suddenly changed its direction, and a long and slightly built boat hove up out of the gloom, while the red glare fell on the weather-beaten features of the leather stocking, whose tall person was seen erect in the frail vessel, wielding, with the grace of an experienced boatman, a long fishing-spear, which he held by its center, first dropping one end, and then the other, into the water, to aid in propelling the little canoe of bark we will not say through, but over the water. At the farther end of the vessel a form was faintly seen, guiding its motions and using a paddle with the ease of one who felt there was no necessity for exertion. 
The leather stocking struck his spear lightly against the short staff which upheld, on a rude grating framed of old hoops of iron, the knots of pine that composed the fuel, and the light, which glared high, for an instant fell on the swarthy features and dark, glancing eyes of Mohegan. The boat glided along the shore until it arrived opposite the fishing ground, when it again changed its direction and moved on to the land, with a motion so graceful and yet so rapid that it seemed to possess the power of regulating its own progress. The water in front of the canoe was hardly ruffled by its passage, and no sound betrayed the collision, when the light fabric shot on the gravelly beach for nearly half its length, Natty receding a step or two from its bow in order to facilitate the landing. "'Approach, Mohegan,' said Marmaduke. "'Approach, Leather Stocking, and load your canoe with bass. It would be a shame to assail the animals with the spear, when such multitudes of victims lie here, that will be lost as food for the want of mouths to consume them.' "'No, no, Judge,' returned Natty, his tall figure stalking over the narrow beach and ascending to the little grassy bottom where the fish were laid in piles. I eat of no man's wasty ways. I strike my spear into the eels or the trout when I crave the creature. But I wouldn't be helping to such a sinful kind of fishing for the best rifle that was ever brought out from the old countries. If they had fur like the beaver, or you could tan their hides like a buck, something might be said in favor of taking them by the thousand with your nets. But as God made them for man's food, and for no other discernible reason, I call it sinful and wasty to catch more than can be eat. Your reasoning is mine. For once, old hunter, we agree in opinion, and I heartily wish we could make a convert of the sheriff. A net of half the size of this would supply the whole village with fish for a week at one haul." The leather stocking did not relish this alliance in sentiment, and he shook his head doubtingly as he answered, "'No, no, we are not much of one mind, Judge, or you'd never turn good hunting-grounds into stumpy pastures. And you fish and hunt out of rule. But, to me, the flesh is sweeter where the creature has some chance for its life. For that reason, I always use a single ball, even if it be at a bird or a squirrel. Besides, it saves lead. For when a body knows how to shoot, one piece of lead is enough for all, except hard-lived animals." The sheriff heard these opinions with great indignation and when he completed the last arrangement for the division, by carrying with his own hands a trout of a large size, and placing it on four different piles in succession, as his vacillating ideas of justice required, gave vent to his spleen. A very pretty confederacy, indeed! Judge Temple, the landlord and owner of a township, with Nathaniel Bumpo, a lawless squatter, and professed deer-killer, in order to preserve the game of the county. But, Duke, when I fish, I fish. So away, boys, for another haul, and we'll send out wagons and carts in the morning to bring in our prizes." Marmaduke appeared to understand that all opposition to the will of the sheriff would be useless, and he strolled from the fire to the place where the canoe of the hunters lay, whither the ladies and Oliver Edwards had already preceded him. Curiosity induced the females to approach this spot. But it was a different motive that led the youth thither. Elizabeth examined the light ashen timbers and thin bark covering of the canoe in admiration of its neat but simple execution, and with wonder that any human being could be so daring as to trust his life in so frail a vessel. But the youth explained to her the buoyant properties of the boat, and its perfect safety when under proper management, adding in such glowing terms a description of the manner in which the fish were struck with the spear that she changed suddenly from an apprehension of the danger of the excursion to a desire to participate in its pleasures. She even ventured a proposition to that effect to her father, laughing at the same time at her own wish, and accusing herself of acting under a woman's caprice. "'Say not so, Bess,' returned the judge. "'I would have you above the idle fears of a silly girl. These canoes are the safest kind of boats to those who have skill and steady nerves. I have crossed the broadest part of the Oneida in one much smaller than this." "'And I the Ontario,' interrupted the leather stocking. "'And that with squaws in the canoe, too. But the Delaware women are used to the paddle, and are good hands in a boat of this nature. If the young lady would like to see an old man strike a trout for his breakfast, she is welcome to a seat. John will say the same, seeing that he built the canoe, 
which was only launched yesterday. For I'm not over-curious at such small work as brooms and basket-making and other like Indian trades. Natty gave Elizabeth one of his significant laughs, with a kind of nod of the head, when he concluded his invitation, but Mohegan, with the native grace of an Indian, approached, and taking her soft white hand into his own swarthy and wrinkled palm, said, Come, granddaughter of Miquan, and John will be glad. Trust the Indian. His head is old, though his hand is not steady. The young eagle will go, and see that no harm hurts his sister. Mr. Edwards, said Elizabeth, blushing slightly, your friend Mohegan has given a promise for you. Do you redeem the pledge? With my life, if necessary, Miss Temple, cried the youth, with fervor, the sight is worth some little apprehension, for of real danger there is none. I will go with you and Miss Grant, however, to save appearances. With me, exclaimed Louisa, no, not with me, Mr. Edwards, nor surely do you mean to trust yourself in that slight canoe. But I shall, for I have no apprehensions any longer, said Elizabeth, stepping into the boat and taking a seat where the Indian directed. Mr. Edwards, you may remain, as three do seem to be enough for such an eggshell. It shall hold a fourth, cried the young man, springing to her side, with a violence that nearly shook the weak fabric of the vessel asunder. Pardon me, Miss Temple, that I do not permit these venerable Karens to take you to the shades unattended by your genius. Is it a good or evil spirit? asked Elizabeth. Good to you. "'And mine,' added the maiden, with an air that strangely blended pique with satisfaction. But the motion of the canoe gave rise to new ideas, and fortunately afforded a good excuse to the young man to change the discourse. It appeared to Elizabeth that they glided over the water by magic, so easy and graceful was the manner in which Mohegan guided his little bark. A slight gesture with his spear indicated the way in which Leatherstocking wished to go and a profound silence was preserved by the whole party, as the precaution necessary to the success of their fishery. At that point of the lake the water shoaled regularly, differing in this particular altogether from those parts where the mountains rose nearly in perpendicular precipices from the beach. There the largest vessels could have lain, with their yards interlocked with the pines, while here a scanty growth of rushes lifted their tops above the lake, gently curling the waters, as their bending heads waved with the passing breath of the night air. It was at the shallow points only that the bass could be found, or the net cast with success. Elizabeth saw thousands of these fish swimming in shoals along the shallow and warm waters of the shore, for the flaring light of their torch laid bare the mysteries of the lake, as plainly as if the limpid sheet of the Otsego was but another atmosphere. Every instant she expected to see the impending spear of leather stocking darting into the thronging hosts that were rushing beneath her, where it would seem that a blow could not go amiss, and where, as her father had already said, the prize that would be obtained was worthy any epicure. But Natty had his peculiar habits, and it would seem his peculiar tastes also. His tall stature and his erect posture enabled him to see much farther than those who were seated in the bottom of the canoe, and he turned his head warily in every direction, frequently bending his body forward and straining his vision, as if desirous of penetrating the water that surrounded their boundary of light. At length his anxious scrutiny was rewarded with success, and waving his spear from the shore, he said in a cautious tone, "'Send her outside the bass, John. I see a laker there that has run out of the school.' It's seldom one finds such a creature in shallow water, where a spear can touch it." Mohegan gave a wave of assent with his hand, and in the next instant the canoe was without the run of the bass, and in water nearly twenty feet in depth. A few additional knots were laid on the grating, and the light penetrated to the bottom. Elizabeth then saw a fish of unusual size floating above small pieces of logs and sticks. The animal was only distinguishable, at that distance, by a slight but almost imperceptible motion of its fins and tail. The curiosity excited by this unusual exposure of the secrets of the lake seemed to be mutual between the heiress of the land and the lord of these waters, for the salmon-trout soon announced his interest by raising his head and body for a few degrees above a horizontal line, and then dropping them again into a horizontal position. 
Whist, whist, said Natty, in a low voice, on hearing a slight sound made by Elizabeth in bending over the side of the canoe in curiosity. Tis a skeery animal, and it's a far stroke for a spear. My handle is but fourteen foot, and the creature lies a good eighteen from the top of the water. But I'll try him, for he's a ten-pounder. While speaking, the leather stocking was poising and directing his weapon. Elizabeth saw the bright polished tines as they slowly and silently entered the water, where the refraction pointed them many degrees from the true direction of the fish, and she thought that the intended victim saw them also as he seemed to increase the play of his tail and fins, though without moving his station. At the next instant the tall body of Natty bent to the water's edge, and the handle of his spear disappeared in the lake. The long, dark streak of the gliding weapon and the little bubbling vortex which followed its rapid flight were easily to be seen. But it was not until the handle shot again into the air by its own reaction, and its master, catching it in his hand, threw its tines uppermost, that Elizabeth was acquainted with the success of the blow. A fish of great size was transfixed by the barbed steel, and was very soon shaken from its impaled situation into the bottom of the canoe. "'That will do, John,' said Natty, raising his prize by one of his fingers, and exhibiting it before the torch. "'I shall not strike another blow to-night.' The Indian again waved his hand, and replied with the simple and energetic monosyllable of, "'Good!' Elizabeth was awakened by the trance created by this scene, and by gazing in that unusual manner at the bottom of the lake, by the hoarse sounds of Benjamin's voice, and the dashing of oars, as the heavier boat of the seine-drawers approached the spot where the canoe lay, dragging after it the folds of the net. "'Haul off! Haul off, Master Bumpo!' cried Benjamin. "'Your top-light frightens the fish, who see the net and sheer off soundings. A fish knows as much as a horse, or for that matter more, seeing that it's brought up on the water. "'Haul off, Master Bumpo! Haul off, I say, and give a wide berth to the seine!' Mohegan guided their little canoe to a point where the movements of the fishermen could be observed, without interruption to the business, and then suffered it to lie quietly in the water, looking like an imaginary vessel floating in air. There appeared to be much ill-humor among the party in the bateau, for the directions of Benjamin were not only frequent, but issued in a voice that partook largely of dissatisfaction. "'Pull larboard oar, will you, Master Kirby?' cried the old seaman. "'Pull larboard best!' It would puzzle the oldest admiral in the British fleet to cast this here net fair with a wake like a corkscrew. Full starboard, boy. Pull starboard oar, with a will. Harkee, Mr. Pump, said Kirby, ceasing to row, and speaking with sonic spirit. I'm a man that likes civil language and decent treatment, such as is right twixt man and man. If you want us to go hoy, say so, and hoy I'll go, for the benefit of the company, but I'm not used to being ordered about like dumb cattle. "'Who's dumb cattle?' echoed Benjamin, fiercely, turning his forbidding face to the glare of light from the canoe, and exhibiting every feature teeming with the expression of disgust. "'If you want to come aft and run the boat round, come and be damned, and pretty steerage you'll make of it. There's but another heave of the net in the stern-sheets, and we're clear of the thing. Give way, will you? And shoot her ahead for a fathom or two, and if you catch me afloat again with such a horse marine as yourself, why, rate me a ship's jackass, that's all." Probably encouraged by the prospect of a speedy termination to his labor, the woodchopper resumed his oar, and under strong excitement gave a stroke that not only cleared the boat of the net, but of the steward at the same instant. Benjamin had stood on the little platform that held the seine, in the stern of the boat, and the violent whirl occasioned by the vigor of the woodchopper's arm completely destroyed his balance. The position of the lights rendered objects in the bateau distinguishable, both from the canoe and the shore, and the heavy fall on the water drew all eyes to the steward as he lay struggling for a moment in sight. A loud burst of merriment, to which the lungs of Kirby contributed no small part, broke out like a chorus of laughter, and ran along the eastern mountain in echoes, until it died away in distant, mocking mirth among the rocks and woods. The body of the steward was seen slowly to disappear, as was expected, but when the light waves which had been raised by his fall began to sink in calmness, and the water finally closed over his head, unbroken and still, 
A very different feeling pervaded the spectators. "'How fare you, Benjamin?' shouted Richard from the shore. "'The dumb devil can't swim a stroke!' exclaimed Kirby, rising and beginning to throw aside his clothes. "'Paddle up, Mohegan!' cried young Edwards. "'The light will show us where he lies, and I will die for the body.' "'Oh, save him! For God's sake, save him!' exclaimed Elizabeth, bowing her head on the side of the canoe in horror. A powerful and dexterous sweep of Mohegan's paddles sent the canoe directly over the spot where the steward had fallen, and a loud shout from the leather stocking announced that he saw the body. "'Steady the boat while I dive!' again cried Edwards. "'Gently, lad, gently,' said Natty. "'I'll spear the creature up in half the time, and no risk to anybody.' The form of Benjamin was lying about halfway to the bottom, grasping with both hands some broken rushes. The blood of Elizabeth curdled to her heart as she saw the figure of a fellow creature thus extended under an immense sheet of water, apparently in motion by the undulations of the dying waves, with its face and hands, viewed by that light, and through the medium of the fluid, already colored with hues like death. At the same instant she saw the shining tines of Natty's spear approaching the head of the sufferer and entwining themselves rapidly and dexterously in the hairs of his queue and the cape of his coat. The body was now raised slowly, looking ghastly and grim as its features turned upward to the light and approached the surface. The arrival of the nostrils of Benjamin into their own atmosphere was announced by a breathing that would have done credit to a porpoise. For a moment Natty held the steward suspended, with his head just above the water, while his eyes slowly opened and stared about him as if he thought that he had reached a new and unexplored country. As all the parties acted and spoke together, much less time was consumed in the occurrence of these events than in their narration. To bring the bateau to the end of the spear, and to raise the form of Benjamin into the boat, and for the whole party to regain the shore, required but a minute. Kirby, aided by Richard, whose anxiety induced him to run into the water to meet his favorite assistant, carried the motionless steward up the bank, and seated him before the fire, while the sheriff proceeded to order the most approved measures then in use for the resuscitation of the drowned. "'Run, Billy!' he cried, "'to the village, and bring up the rum hogshead that lies before the door, in which I am making vinegar. And be quick, boy! Don't stay to empty the vinegar, and stop at Mr. Lacroix's, and buy a paper of tobacco and half a dozen pipes.' and ask Remarkable for some salt and one of her flannel petticoats, and ask Dr. Todd to send his lancet, and to come himself, and— Ha! Duke, what are you about? Would you strangle a man who is full of water by giving him rum? Help me to open his hand, that I may pat it. All this time Benjamin sat with his muscles fixed, his mouth shut, and his hands clinching the rushes which he had seized in the confusion of the moment, and which— as he held fast, like a true seaman, had been the means of preventing his body from rising again to the surface. His eyes, however, were open, and stared wildly on the group about the fire, while his lungs were playing like a blacksmith's bellows, as if to compensate themselves for the minute of inaction to which they had been subjected. As he kept his lips compressed, with a most inveterate determination, the air was compelled to pass through his nostrils, and he rather snorted than breathed, and in such a manner that nothing but the excessive agitation of the sheriff could at all justify his precipitous orders. The bottle, applied to the steward's lips by Marmaduke, acted like a charm. His mouth opened instinctively. His hands dropped the rushes and seized the glass. His eyes raised from their horizontal stare to the heavens and the whole man was lost for a moment in a new sensation. Unhappily for the propensity of the steward, breath was as necessary after one of these draughts as after his submersion, and the time at length arrived when he was compelled to let go the bottle. "'Why, Benjamin!' roared the sheriff. "'You amaze me, for a man of your experience in drownings, to act so foolishly. Just now you are half full of water, and now you are full of grog.' interrupted the steward, his features settling down with amazing flexibility into their natural economy. "'But do you see, squire, I kept my hatches close, and it's but little water that ever gets into my scuttle-butt. Hark ye, Master Kirby, I've followed the salt water for the better part of a man's life, 
and have seen some navigation on the fresh, but this here matter I will say in your favor, and that is, that you're the awkwardest greenin that ever straddled a boat's thwart. Them that likes you for a shipmate may sail with you, and no thanks, but damn me if I even walk on the lake shore in your company. For why? You'd as lief drown a man as one of them there fish, not to throw a Christian creature so much as a rope's end when he was adrift, and no life-boy in sight. Natty Bumpo, give us your fist. There's them that says you're an Indian and a scalper, but you've served me a good turn, and you may set me down for a friend. Though it would have been more shipshape like to lower the bite of a rope or running bowline below me than to seize an old seaman by his head lanyard, but I suppose you are used to taking men by the hair, and seeing you did me good instead of harm thereby, why, it's the same thing, do you see? Marmaduke prevented any reply, and assuming the action of matters with a dignity and discretion that at once silenced all opposition from his cousin, Benjamin was dispatched to the village by land, and the net was hauled to shore in such a manner that the fish for once escaped its meshes with impunity. The division of the spoils was made in the ordinary manner, by placing one of the party with his back to the game, who named the owner of each pile. Bill Kirby stretched his large frame on the grass by the side of the fire, as sentinel until morning, over net and fish, and the remainder of the party embarked in the bateau to return to the village. The woodchopper was seen broiling his supper on the coals as they lost sight of the fire, and when the boat approached the shore, the torch of Mohegan's canoe was shining again under the gloom of the eastern mountain. Its motion ceased suddenly. A scattering of brands was in the air, and then all remained dark, as the conjunction of night, forest, and mountain could render the scene. The thoughts of Elizabeth wandered from the youth, who was holding a canopy of shawls over herself and Louisa, to the hunter and the Indian warrior, and she felt an awakening curiosity to visit a hut, where men of such different habits and temperament were drawn together as by common impulse. End of chapter 24 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 25 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 25 Cease all this parlance about hills and dales. None listen to thy scenes of boyish frolic. Fond dotard, with such tickled ears as thou dost come to thy tale. Duo Mr. Jones arose on the following morning with the sun, and, ordering his own and Marmaduke's steeds to be saddled, he proceeded with a countenance big with some business of unusual moment to the apartment of the judge. The door was unfastened, and Richard entered, with the freedom that characterized not only the intercourse between the cousins, but the ordinary manners of the sheriff. "'Well, Duke, to horse,' he cried, and I will explain to you my meaning in the allusions I made last night. David says in the Psalms, no, it was Solomon but it was all in the family. Solomon said there was a time for all things, and in my humble opinion a fishing party is not the moment for discussing important subjects. Ha! Why, what the devil ails you, Marmaduke? Ain't you well? Let me feel your pulse. My grandfather, you know—' "'Quite well in the body, Richard,' interrupted the judge, repulsing his cousin, who was about to assume the functions that rightly belonged to Dr. Todd, but ill at heart. I received letters by the post last night, after we returned from the point, and this among the number." The sheriff took the letter, but without turning his eyes on the writing, for he was examining the appearance of the other with astonishment. From the face of his cousin the gaze of Richard wandered to the table, which was covered with letters, packets, and newspapers, then to the apartment and all it contained. On the bed there was the impression that had been made by a human form, but the coverings were unmoved and everything indicated that the occupant of the room had passed a sleepless night. The candles had burned to the sockets, and had evidently extinguished themselves in their own fragments. Marmaduke had drawn his curtains, and opened both the shutters and the sashes, to admit the balmy air of a spring morning. But his pale cheek, his quivering lip, and his sunken eye 
presented altogether so very different an appearance from the usual calm, manly, and cheerful aspect of the judge, that the sheriff grew each moment more and more bewildered with astonishment. At length Richard found time to cast his eyes on the direction of the letter, which he still held unopened, crumpling it in his hand. "'What! A ship letter!' he exclaimed. "'And from England! Ha! Duke, there must be news of importance indeed!' "'Read it,' said Marmaduke, pacing the floor in excessive agitation. Richard, who commonly thought aloud, was unable to read a letter without suffering part of its contents to escape him in audible sounds. So much of the epistle as was divulged in that manner we shall lay before the reader, accompanied by the passing remarks of the sheriff. "'London, February twelfth, 1793. What a devil of a passage she had!' but the wind has been northwest for six weeks until within the last fortnight. Sir, your favors of August 10th, September 23rd, and of December 1st were received in due season, and the first answered by return of packet. Since the receipt of the last, I— Here a long passage was rendered indistinct by a kind of humming noise by the sheriff. I grieve to say that, hm, hm, bad enough to be sure— but trusts that a merciful providence has seen fit. Hm, 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 seems to be a good, pious sort of a man, Duke. Belongs to the established church, I dare say. Hm, hm, vessel sailed from Falmouth on or about the first September of last year, and hm, 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 if anything should transpire on this afflicting subject, shall not fail. Hmm, hmm, really a good-hearted man for a lawyer, but can communicate nothing further at present. Hmm, hmm, the National Convention, hmm, hmm, unfortunate Lewis, hmm, hmm, example of your Washington, a very sensible man, I declare, and none of your crazy Democrats. Hmm, hmm, our gallant Navy, hmm, hmm, under our most excellent monarch. I, a good man enough, that King George, but bad advisers. Mm, mm. I beg to conclude with assurances of my perfect respect. Mm, mm. Andrew Holt. Andrew Holt, a very sensible, feeling man, this Mr. Andrew Holt. But the writer of evil tidings. What will you do next, cousin Marmaduke? What can I do, Richard, but trust to time, and the will of heaven? Here is another letter from Connecticut, but it only repeats the substance of the last. There is but one consoling reflection to be gathered from the English news, which is that my last letter was received by him before the ship sailed. This is bad enough indeed, Duke, bad enough indeed. And away go all my plans of putting wings to the house, to the devil. I had made arrangements for a ride to introduce you to something of a very important nature. You know how much you think of mines. Talk not of mines, interrupted the judge. There is a sacred duty to be performed, and that without delay. I must devote this day to writing. And thou must be my assistant, Richard. It will not do to employ Oliver in a matter of such secrecy and interest. No, no, Duke, cried the sheriff, squeezing his hand. I am your man, just now. We are sisters' children and blood, after all, is the best cement to make friendship stick together. Well, well, there is no hurry about the silver mine just now. Another time will do as well. We shall want Dirky Van, I suppose. Marmaduke assented to this indirect question, and the sheriff relinquished all his intentions on the subject of the ride, and repairing to the breakfast parlor, he dispatched a messenger to require the immediate presence of Dirk van der School. The village of Templeton, at that time, supported but two lawyers, one of whom was introduced to our readers in the bar-room of the Bold Dragoon, and the other was the gentleman of whom Richard spoke by the friendly yet familiar appellation of Dirk, or Dirky Van. Great good nature, a very tolerable share of skill in his profession, and considering the circumstances no contemptible degree of honesty, were the principal ingredients in the character of this man who was known to the settlers as Squire Vanderschool, and sometimes by the flattering though anomalous title of the Dutch, or Honest Lawyer. We would not wish to mislead our readers in their conceptions of any of our characters. 
and we therefore feel it necessary to add that the adjective in the preceding agnomen of Mr. Van der School was used in direct reference to its substantive. Our orthodox friends need not be told that all the merit in this world is comparative, and once for all we desire to say that where anything which involves qualities or characters is asserted, we must be understood to mean under the circumstances. During the remainder of the day the judge was closeted with his cousin and his lawyer, and no one else was admitted to his apartment excepting his daughter. The deep distress that so evidently affected Marmaduke was in some measure communicated to Elizabeth also, for a look of dejection shaded her intelligent features, and the buoyancy of her animated spirits was sensibly softened. Once on that day young Edwards, who was a wondering and observant spectator of the sudden alteration produced in the heads of the family, detected a tear stealing over the cheek of Elizabeth, and suffusing her bright eyes with a softness that did not always belong to their expression. "'Have any evil tidings been received, Miss Temple?' he inquired, with an interest and voice that caused Louisa Grant to raise her head from her needlework with a quickness at which she instantly blushed herself. I would offer my services to your father if, as I suspect, he needs an agent in some distant place, and I thought it would give you relief." "'We have certainly heard bad news,' returned Elizabeth, and it may be necessary that my father should leave home for a short period, unless I can persuade him to trust my cousin Richard with the business, whose absence from the country just at this time, too, might be an expedient." The youth paused a moment, and the blood gathered slowly to his temples as he continued. If it be of a nature that I could execute, it is such as can only be confided to one we know, one of ourselves. Surely you know me, Miss Temple," he added, with a warmth that he seldom exhibited, but which did sometimes escape him in the moments of their frank communications. Have I lived five months under your roof to be a stranger?" Elizabeth was engaged with her needle also, and she bent her head to one side, affecting to arrange her muslin but her hand shook, her color heightened, and her eyes lost their moisture in an expression of ungovernable interest, as she said, "'How much do we know of you, Mr. Edwards?' "'How much?' echoed the youth, gazing from the speaker to the mild countenance of Louisa that was also illuminated with curiosity. "'How much have I been so long an inmate with you and not known?' The head of Elizabeth turned slowly from its affected position, and the look of confusion that had blended so strongly with an expression of interest changed to a smile. "'We know you, sir, indeed. You are called Mr. Oliver Edwards. I understand that you have informed my friend Miss Grant that you are a native—' "'Elizabeth!' exclaimed Louisa, blushing to the eyes, and trembling like an aspen. "'You misunderstood me, dear Miss Temple. I—I—it I, was only a conjecture.' Besides, if Mr. Edwards is related to the natives, why should we reproach him? In what are we better? At least I, who am the child of a poor and unsettled clergyman." Elizabeth shook her head doubtingly, and even laughed, but made no reply, until, observing the melancholy which pervaded the countenance of her companion, who was thinking of the poverty and labors of her father, she continued, "'Nay, Louisa, humility carries you too far. The daughter of a minister of the church can have no superiors. Neither I nor Mr. Edwards is quite your equal, unless, she added again, smiling, he is in secret a king. A faithful servant of the king of kings, Miss Temple, is inferior to none on earth, said Louisa. But his honors are his own. I am only the child of a poor and friendless man, and can claim no other distinction. Why, then, should I feel myself elevated above Mr. Edwards, because— because perhaps he is only very, very distantly related to John Mohegan. Glances of a very comprehensive meaning were exchanged between the heiress and the young man, as Louisa betrayed, while vindicating his lineage, the reluctance with which she admitted his alliance with the old warrior. But not even a smile at the simplicity of their companion was indulged in by either. On reflection I must acknowledge that my situation here is somewhat equivocal, said Edwards though I may be said to have purchased it with my blood." "'The blood, too, of one of the native lords of the soil,' cried Elizabeth, who evidently put little faith in his aboriginal descent. Do I bear the marks of my lineage so very plainly impressed on my appearance? I am dark, but not very red, not more so than common. Rather more so just now. 
"'I am sure, Miss Temple,' cried Louisa, "'you cannot have taken much notice of Mr. Edwards. His eyes are not so black as Mohegan's, or even your own, nor is his hair. Very possibly, then, I can lay claim to the same descent. It would be a great relief to my mind to think so, for I own that I grieve when I see old Mohegan walking about these lands like the ghost of one of their ancient possessors, and feel how small is my own right to possess them. "'Do you?' cried the youth, with a vehemence that startled the ladies. "'I do indeed,' returned Elizabeth, after suffering a moment to pass in surprise. "'But what can I do? What can my father do? Should we offer the old man a home and a maintenance? His habits would compel him to refuse us. Neither were we so silly as to wish such a thing, could we convert these clearings and farms again into hunting-grounds, as the leather-stocking would wish to see them.' "'You speak the truth, Miss Temple,' said Edwards. "'What can you do, indeed? But there is one thing that I am certain you can and will do when you become the mistress of these beautiful valleys. Use your wealth with indulgence to the poor, and charity to the needy. Indeed, you can do no more.' "'And that will be doing a good deal,' said Louisa, smiling in her turn. "'But there will, doubtless, be one to take the direction of such things from her hands.' I am not about to disclaim matrimony like a silly girl, who dreams of nothing else from morn till night. But I am a nun here, without the vow of celibacy. Where shall I find a husband in these forests?" "'There is none, Miss Temple,' said Edwards quickly. "'There is none who has a right to aspire to you, and I know that you will wait to be sought by your equal, or die as you live, loved, respected, and admired by all who know you. The young man seemed to think that he had said all that was required by gallantry, for he arose, and, taking his hat, hurried from the apartment. Perhaps Louisa thought that he had said more than was necessary, for she sighed with an aspiration so low that it was scarcely audible to herself, and bent her head over her work again. And it is possible that Miss Temple wished to hear more, for her eyes continued fixed for a minute on the door through which the young man had passed then glanced quickly toward her companion when the long silence that succeeded manifested how much zest may be given to the conversation of two maidens under eighteen by the presence of a youth of three and twenty the first person encountered by mr edwards as he rather rushed than walked from the house was the little square-built lawyer with a large bundle of papers under his arm a pair of green spectacles on his nose with glasses at the sides as if to multiply his power of detecting frauds by additional organs of vision. Mr. Van der School was a well-educated man, but of slow comprehension, who had imbibed a wariness in his speeches and actions, from having suffered by his collisions with his more mercurial and apt brethren, who had laid the foundations of their practice in the eastern courts, and who had sucked in shrewdness with their mother's milk. The caution of this gentleman was exhibited in his actions by the utmost method and punctuality tinctured with a good deal of timidity, and in his speeches by a parenthetical style that frequently left to his auditors a long search after his meaning. "'A good morning to you, Mr. Van der School,' said Edwards. "'It seems to be a busy day with us at the Mansion House.' "'Good morning, Mr. Edwards, if that is your name, for, being a stranger, we have no other evidence of the fact.' than your own testimony, as I understand you have given it to Judge Temple. "'Good morning, sir. It is apparently a busy day, but a man of your discretion need not be told, having doubtless discovered it of your own accord, that appearances are often deceitful. Up at the Mansion House. Have you papers of consequence that will require copying? Can I be of assistance in any way?' There are papers, as doubtless you see, for your eyes are young by the outsides, that require copying. Well, then, I will accompany you to your office and receive such as are most needed, and by night I shall have them done if there be much haste. I shall always be glad to see you, sir, at my office, as in duty bound, not that it is obligatory to receive any man within your dwelling, unless so inclined, which is a castle, according to the forms of politeness or at any other place. But the papers are most strictly confidential, and, as such cannot be read by any one, unless so directed by Judge Temple's solemn injunctions, and are invisible to all eyes, excepting those whose duties, I mean assumed duties, require it of them. 
Well, sir, as I perceive that I can be of no service, I wish you another good morning, but beg you will remember that I am quite idle just now, and I wish you would intimate as much to Judge Temple, and make him a tender of my services in any part of the world, unless, unless it be far from Templeton. I will make the communication, sir, in your name, with your own qualifications, as your agent. Good morning, sir. But state proceedings, Mr. Edwards, so called, for a moment. Do you wish me to state the offer of travelling as a final contract, for which consideration has been received at former dates by sums advanced, which would be binding, or as a tender of services for which compensation is to be paid, according to future agreement between the parties, on performance of the conditions? Any way, any way, said Edwards. He seems in distress, and I would assist him. The motive is good, sir, according to appearances, which are often deceitful, on first impressions, and does you honour. I will mention your wish, young gentleman, as you now seem, and will not fail to communicate the answer by five o'clock p.m. of this present day, God willing, if you give me an opportunity so to do. The ambiguous nature of the situation and character of Mr. Edwards had rendered him an object of peculiar suspicion to the lawyer, and the youth was consequently too much accustomed to similar equivocal and guarded speeches to feel any unusual disgust at the present dialogue. He saw at once that it was the intention of the practitioner to conceal the nature of his business, even from the private secretary of Judge Temple, and he knew too well the difficulty of comprehending the meaning of Mr. Vanderschool when the gentleman most wished to be luminous in his discourse, not to abandon all thoughts of a discovery, when he perceived that the attorney was endeavouring to avoid anything like an approach to a cross-examination. They parted at the gate the lawyer walking with an important and hurried air toward his office, keeping his right hand firmly clinched on the bundle of papers. It must have been obvious to all our readers that the youth entertained an unusual and deeply seated prejudice against the character of the judge. But owing to some counteracting cause, his sensations were now those of powerful interest in the state of his patron's present feelings, and in the cause of his secret uneasiness. He remained gazing after the lawyer until the door closed on both the bearer and the mysterious packet, when he returned slowly to the dwelling, and endeavoured to forget his curiosity in the usual avocations of his office. When the judge made his reappearance in the circles of his family, his cheerfulness was tempered by a shade of melancholy that lingered for many days around his manly brow, but the magical progression of the season aroused him from his temporary apathy and his smiles returned with the summer. The heats of the days, and the frequent occurrence of balmy showers, had completed in an incredibly short period the growth of plants which the lingering spring had so long retarded in the germ, and the woods presented every shade of green that the American forests know. The stumps in the cleared fields were already hidden beneath the wheat that was waving with every breath of the summer air, shining and changing its hues like velvet. During the continuance of his cousin's dejection, Mr. Jones forbore with much consideration to press on his attention a business that each hour was drawing nearer to the heart of the sheriff, and which, if any opinion could be formed by his frequent private conferences with the man who was introduced in these pages by the name of Jotham, at the barroom of the Bold Dragoon, was becoming also of great importance. At length the sheriff ventured to allude again to the subject. And one evening, in the beginning of July, Marmaduke made him a promise of devoting the following day to the desired excursion. End of chapter 25 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 26 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 26 Speak on, my dearest father. Thy words are like the breezes of the west. Milman It was a mild and soft morning when Marmaduke and Richard mounted their horses and proceeded on the expedition that had so long been uppermost in the thoughts of the latter and Elizabeth and Louisa appeared at the same instant in the hall, attired for an excursion on foot. 
The head of Miss Grant was covered by a neat little hat of green silk, and her modest eyes peered from under its shade with the soft languor that characterized her whole appearance. But Miss Temple trod her father's wide apartments with the step of their mistress, holding in her hands, dangling by one of its ribbons, the gypsy that was to conceal the glossy locks that curled around her polished forehead in rich profusion. "'What? Are you for a walk, Bess?' cried the judge, suspending his movements for a moment to smile, with a father's fondness, at the display of womanly grace and beauty that his child presented. "'Remember the heats of July, my daughter, nor venture further than thou canst retrace before the meridian. Where is thy parasol, girl? Thou wilt lose the polish of that brow under this sun and southern breeze, unless thou guard it with unusual care.' "'I shall then do more honour to my connections,' returned the smiling daughter. "'Cousin Richard has a bloom that any lady might envy. At present the resemblance between us is so trifling that no stranger would know us to be sister's children.' "'Grandchildren, you mean, Cousin Bess,' said the sheriff. "'But on, Judge Temple. Time and tide wait for no man. And if you take my counsel, sir, in twelve months from this day you may make an umbrella for your daughter, of her camel's hair shawl, and have its frame of solid silver. I ask nothing for myself, Duke. You have been a good friend to me already. Besides, all that I have will go to best there, one of these melancholy days, so it's as long as it's short, whether I or you leave it. But we have a day's ride before us, sir, so move forward, or dismount, and say you won't go at once." "'Patience, patience, Dickon,' returned the judge, checking his horse and turning again to his daughter. "'If thou art for the mountains, love, stray not too deep into the forest. I entreat thee, for though it is done often with impunity, there is sometimes danger." "'Not at this season, I believe, sir,' said Elizabeth, "'for I will confess it is the intention of Louisa and myself to stroll among the hills.' "'Less at this season than in the winter, dear, but still there may be danger in venturing too far. But though thou art resolute, Elizabeth, thou art too much like thy mother not to be prudent.' The eyes of the parent turned reluctantly from his child, and the judge and sheriff rode slowly through the gateway and disappeared among the buildings of the village. During this short dialogue young Edward stood, an attentive listener, holding in his hand a fishing-rod, the day in the season having tempted him also to desert the house for the pleasure of exercise in the air. As the equestrians turned through the gate he approached the young females, who were already moving toward the street, and was about to address them as Louisa paused and said quickly, "'Mr. Edwards would speak to us, Elizabeth.' The other stopped also, and turned to the youth, politely but with a slight coldness in her air, that sensibly checked the freedom with which he had approached them. "'Your father is not pleased that you should walk unattended in the hills, Miss Temple. If I might offer myself as a protector—' "'Does my father select Mr. Oliver Edwards as the organ of his displeasure?' interrupted the lady. "'Good heaven! You misunderstood my meaning. I should have said uneasy or not pleased. I am his servant, madam, and in consequence yours. I repeat that, with your consent, I will change my rod for a fowling-piece, and keep nigh you on the mountain. I thank you, Mr. Edwards. But where there is no danger, no protection is required. We are not yet reduced to wandering among these free hills, accompanied by a bodyguard. If such a one is necessary, there he is, however. Here, brave! Brave! My noble brave! The huge mastiff that has already been mentioned appeared from his kennel, gaping and stretching himself with pampered laziness. But as his mistress again called, Come, dear brave, once you have served your master well, let us see how you can do your duty by his daughter. The dog wagged his tail, as if he understood her language, walked with a stately gait to her side, where he seated himself, and looked up at her face, with an intelligence but little inferior to that which beamed in her own lovely countenance. She resumed her walk, but again paused after a few steps, and added in tones of conciliation, "'You can be serving us equally, and I presume more agreeably to yourself, Mr. Edwards, by bringing us a string of your favorite perch for the dinner-table." 
When they again began to walk, Miss Temple did not look back to see how the youth bore this repulse. But the head of Louisa was turned several times before they reached the gate on that considerate errand. "'I am afraid, Elizabeth,' she said, "'that we have mortified Oliver. He is still standing where we left him, leaning on his rod. Perhaps he thinks us proud.' "'He thinks justly,' exclaimed Miss Temple, as if awaking from a deep musing. "'He thinks justly, then. We are too proud to admit of such particular attentions from a young man in an equivocal situation. What, make him the companion of our most private walks? It is pride, Louisa, but it is the pride of a woman.' It was several minutes before Oliver aroused himself from the abstracted position in which he was standing when Louisa last saw him. But when he did he muttered something rapidly and incoherently, and throwing his rod over his shoulder he strode down the walk through the gate and along one of the streets of the village until he reached the lake shore with the air of an emperor. At this spot boats were kept for the use of Judge Temple and his family. The young man threw himself into a light skiff, and, seizing the oars, he sent it across the lake toward the hut of leather stocking, with a pair of vigorous arms. By the time he had rowed a quarter of a mile his reflections were less bitter, and when he saw the bushes that lined the shore in front of Natty's habitation gliding by him, as if they possessed the motion which proceeded from his own efforts, he was quite cooled in mind, though somewhat heated in body. It is quite possible that the very same reason which guided the conduct of Miss Temple suggested itself to a man of the breeding and education of the youth. And it is very certain that if such were the case, Elizabeth rose instead of falling in the estimation of Mr. Edwards. The oars were now raised from the water, and the boat shot close in to the land where it lay gently agitated by waves of its own creating while the young man, first casting a cautious and searching glance around him in every direction, put a small whistle to his mouth and blew a long, shrill note that rang among the echoing rocks behind the hut. At this alarm the hounds of Natty rushed out of their bark kennel, and commenced their long, piteous howls, leaping about as if half frantic, though restrained by the leashes of buckskin by which they were fastened. "'Quiet, Hector, quiet,' said Oliver, again applying his whistle to his mouth, and drawing out notes still more shrill than before. No reply was made, the dogs having returned to their kennel at the sound of his voice. Edwards pulled the bow of the boat on the shore, and landing ascended the beach and approached the door of the cabin. The fastenings were soon undone, and he entered, closing the door after him, when all was as silent in that retired spot as if the foot of man had never trod the wilderness. The sounds of the hammers that were in incessant motion in the village were faintly heard across the water, but the dogs had crouched into their lairs, satisfied that none but the privileged had approached the forbidden ground. A quarter of an hour elapsed before the youth reappeared when he fastened the door again and spoke kindly to the hounds. The dogs came out at the well-known tones, and the slut jumped upon his person whining and barking as if entreating Oliver to release her from prison. But old Hector raised his nose to the light current of air, and opened a long howl that might have been heard for a mile. "'Ha! What do you scent, old veteran of the woods?' cried Edwards. "'If a beast it is a bold one, and if a man an impudent.' He sprang through the top of a pine that had fallen near the side of the hut, and ascended a small hillock that sheltered the cabin to the south where he caught a glimpse of the formal figure of Hiram Doolittle, as it vanished, with unusual rapidity for the architect, amid the bushes. "'What can that fellow be wanting here?' muttered Oliver. "'He has no business in this quarter, unless it be curiosity, which is an endemic in these woods. But against that I will effectually guard, though the dog should take a liking to his ugly visage and let him pass.' The youth returned to the door, while giving vent to this soliloquy, and completed the fastenings by placing a small chain through a staple, and securing it there by a padlock. He is a pettifogger, and surely must know that there is such a thing as feloniously breaking into a man's house. Apparently well satisfied with this arrangement, the youth again spoke to the hounds, and, descending to the shore, he launched his boat, 
and taking up his oars, pulled off into the lake. There were several places in the Otsego that were celebrated fishing ground for perch. One was nearly opposite to the cabin, and another still more famous was near a point at the distance of a mile and a half above it, under the brow of the mountain, and on the same side of the lake with the hut. Oliver Edwards pulled his little skiff to the first, and sat for a minute undecided whether to continue there, with his eyes on the door of the cabin, or to change his ground with a view to get superior game. While gazing about him, he saw the light-colored bark canoe of his old companions riding on the water, at the point we have mentioned, and containing two figures, that he at once knew to be Mohegan and the leather stocking. This decided the matter, and the youth pulled, in a very few minutes, to the place where his friends were fishing, and fastened his boat to the light vessel of the Indian. The old men received Oliver with welcoming nods, but neither drew his line from the water nor in the least varied his occupation. When Edwards had secured his own boat, he baited his hook and threw it into the lake without speaking. "'Did you stop at the wigwam, lad, as you rode past?' asked Natty. "'Yes, and I found all safe. But that carpenter and justice of the peace, Mr., or as they call him, Squire Doolittle, was prowling through the woods. I made sure of the door before I left the hut, and I think he is too great a coward to approach the hounds. There's little to be said in favor of that man, said Natty, while he drew in a perch and baited his hook. He craves dreadfully to come into the cabin, and has as good as asked me as much to my face. But I put him off with uncertain answers, so that he is no wiser than Solomon. This comes of having so many laws that such a man may be called on to interpret them. I fear he is more knave than fool, cried Edwards. He makes a tool of that simple man, the sheriff, and I dread that his impertinent curiosity may yet give us much trouble. If he harbors too much about the cabin, lad, I'll shoot the creature, said Leatherstocking, quite simply. No, no, Natty, you must remember the law, said Edwards, or we shall have you in trouble. And that, old man, would be an evil day and sore tidings to us all. "'Would it, boy?' exclaimed the hunter, raising his eyes with a look of friendly interest toward the youth. "'You have the true blood in your veins, Mr. Oliver, and I'll support it to the face of Judge Temple, or in any court in the country. How is it, John? Do I speak the true word? Is the lad staunch, and of the right blood?' "'He is a Delaware,' said Mohegan, "'and my brother. The young eagle is brave, and he will be a chief. No harm can come.' "'Well, well,' cried the youth impatiently. "'Say no more about it, my good friends. If I am not all that your partiality would make me, I am yours through life, in prosperity as in poverty. We will talk of other matters.' The old hunters yielded to his wish, which seemed to be their law. For a short time a profound silence prevailed, during which each man was very busy with his hook and line. But Edwards, probably feeling that it remained with him to renew the discourse, soon observed, with the air of one who knew not what he said, "'How beautifully tranquil and glassy the lake is! Saw you it ever more calm and even than at this moment, Natty?' "'I have known the Otsego water for five and forty years,' said Leatherstocking, "'and I will say that for it, which is that a cleaner spring or better fishing is not to be found in the land. Yes, yes. I had the place to myself once, and a cheerful time I had of it. The game was plenty as heart could wish, and there was none to meddle with the ground unless there might have been a hunting-party of the Delawares crossing the hills, or maybe a rifling scout of them thieves, the Iroquois. There was one or two Frenchmen that squatted in the flats further west and married squaws, and some of the Scotch-Irishers from the Cherry Valley would come on to the lake and borrow my canoe to take a mess of parch or drop a line for salmon-trout but in the main it was a cheerful place, and I had but little to disturb me in it. John would come, and John knows, Mohegan turned his dark face at this appeal, and moving his hand forward with graceful motion of assent, he spoke, using the Delaware language. The land was owned by my people. We gave it to my brother in council, to the fire-eater, and what the Delawares give lasts as long as the waters run. Hawkeye smoked at that council, for we loved him. "'No, no, John,' said Natty, "'I was no chief, seeing that I knowed nothing of scholarship, and had a white skin, 
but it was a comfortable hunting ground then, lad, and would have been so this day, but for the money of Marmaduke Temple, and the twisty ways of the law. It must have been a sight of melancholy pleasure indeed, said Edwards, while his eye roved along the shores and over the hills where the clearings groaning with the golden corn were cheering the forest with the signs of life. To have roamed over these mountains and along this sheet of beautiful water, without a living soul to speak to, or to thwart your humour. "'Haven't I said it was cheerful?' said Leatherstocking. "'Yes, yes. When the trees began to be covered with leaves, and the ice was out of the lake, it was a second paradise. I have travelled the woods for fifty-three years, and have made them my home for more than forty, and I can say that I have met but one place that was more to my liking, and that was only to eyesight, and not for hunting or fishing.' "'And where was that?' asked Edwards. "'Where? Why, up on the Catskills. I used often to go up into the mountains after wolf-skins and bears. Once they paid me to get them a stuffed painter, and so I often went. There's a place in them hills that I used to climb to when I wanted to see the carryings on of the world that would well pay any man for a barked shin or a torn moccasin. You know the Catskills, lad for you must have seen them on your left as you followed the river up from York, looking as blue as a piece of clear sky, and holding the clouds on their tops as the smoke curls over the head of an Indian chief at the council fire. Well, there's the high peak and the round top, which lay back like a father and mother among their children, seeing they are far above all the other hills. But the place I mean is next to the river, where one of the ridges juts out a little from the rest, and where the rocks fall, for the best part of a thousand feet, so much up and down that a man standing on their edges is fool enough to think he can jump from top to bottom. "'What see you when you get there?' asked Edwards. "'Creation,' said Natty, dropping the end of his rod into the water, and sweeping one hand around him in a circle. "'All creation, lad. I was on that hill when Vaughn burned Sopus in the last war.' and I saw the vessels come out of the highlands as plain as I can see that lime-scow rowing into the Susquehanna, though one was twenty times farther from me than the other. The river was in sight for seventy miles, looking like a curled shaving under my feet, though it was eight long miles to its banks. I saw the hills in the Hampshire grants, the highlands of the river, and all that God had done, or man could do, far as I could reach. You know that the Indians named me for my sight, lad, and from the flat on the top of that mountain I have often found the place where Albany stands. And as for Sopus, the day the royal troops burnt the town, the smoke seemed so nigh that I thought I could hear the screeches of the women. It must have been worth the toil to meet with such a glorious view. If being the best part of a mile in the air and having men's farms and houses at your feet, with rivers looking like ribbons and mountains bigger than the vision seeming to be haystacks of green grass under you, gives any satisfaction to a man, I can recommend the spot. When I first came into the woods to live, I used to have weak spells when I felt lonesome, and then I would go into the Catskills and spend a few days on that hill to look at the ways of man. But it's now many a year since I felt any such longings and I am getting too old for rugged rocks. But there's a place, a short two miles back of that very hill, that in late times I relished better than the mountains, for it was more covered with the trees, and natural." "'And where was that?' inquired Edwards, whose curiosity was strongly excited by the simple description of the hunter. "'Why, there's a fall in the hills where the water of two little ponds that lie near each other breaks out of their bounds, and runs over the rocks into the valley. The stream is maybe such a one as would turn a mill, if so useless thing was wanted in the wilderness. But the hand that made that leap never made a mill. There the water comes crooking and winding among the rocks, first so slow that a trout could swim in it, and then starting and running like a creature that wanted to make a far spring, till it gets to where the mountain divides like the cleft hoof of a deer leaving a deep hollow for the brook to tumble into. The first pitch is nigh two hundred feet, and the water looks like flakes of driven snow afore it touches the bottom, and there the stream gathers itself together again for a new start, 
and maybe flutters over fifty feet of flat rock before it falls for another hundred, when it jumps about from shelf to shelf, first turning this away and then turning that away, striving to get out of the hollow, till it finally comes to the plain. I have never heard of this spot before. It is not mentioned in the books. I never read a book in my life, said Leatherstocking, and how should a man who has lived in towns and schools know anything about the wonders of the woods? No, no, lad. There has that little stream of water been playing among the hills since he made the world, and not a dozen white men have ever laid eyes on it. The rock sweeps like mason work in a half round, on both sides of the fall, and shelves over the bottom for fifty feet. So that when I've been sitting at the foot of the first pitch, and my hounds have run into the caverns behind the sheet of water, they've looked no bigger than so many rabbits. To my judgment, lad, it's the best piece of work that I've met in the woods, and none know how often the hand of God is seen in the wilderness, but them that rove it for a man's life. What becomes of the water? In which direction does it run? Is it a tributary of the Delaware? Anon, said Natty. Does the water run into the Delaware? No, no, it's a drop for the old Hudson, and a merry time it has till it gets down off the mountain. I've sat on the shelving rock many a long hour, boy, and watched the bubbles as they shot by me, and thought how long it would be before that very water, which seemed made for the wilderness, would be under the bottom of a vessel and tossing in the salt sea. It is a spot to make a man solemnize. You go right down into the valley that lies to the east of the high peak, where, in the fall of the year, thousands of acres of woods are before your eyes, in the deep hollow, and along the side of the mountain, painted like ten thousand rainbows, by no hand of man, though without the ordering of God's providence. "'You are eloquent, leather-stocking,' exclaimed the youth. "'Anon,' repeated Natty. "'The recollection of the sight has warmed your blood, old man. How many years is it since you saw the place?' The hunter made no reply, but bending his ear near the water he sat holding his breath, and listening attentively as if to some distant sound. At length he raised his head and said, "'If I hadn't fastened the hounds with my own hands, with a fresh leash of green buckskin, I'd take a Bible oath that I heard old Hector ringing his cry on the mountain.' "'It is impossible,' said Edwards. "'It is not an hour since I saw him in his kennel.' By this time the attention of Mohegan was attracted to the sounds, but, notwithstanding the youth was both silent and attentive, he could hear nothing but the lowing of some cattle from the western hills. He looked at the old men, Natty sitting with his hand to his ear, like a trumpet, and Mohegan bending forward with an arm raised to a level with his face, holding the forefinger elevated as a signal for attention, and laughed aloud at what he deemed to be imaginary sounds. "'Laugh if you will, boy,' said Leatherstocking. "'The hounds be out, and are hunting a deer. No man can deceive me in such a matter. I wouldn't have had the thing happen for a beaver's skin. Not that I care for the law, but the venison is lean now, and the dumb things run the flesh off their own bones for no good. Now do you hear the hounds?' Edward started, as a full cry broke on his ear, changing from the distant sounds that were caused by some intervening hill to confused echoes that rang among the rocks that the dogs were passing, and then directly to a deep and hollow baying that pealed under the forest under the lake shore. These variations in the tones of the hounds passed with amazing rapidity, and while his eyes were glancing along the margin of the water a tearing of the branches of the alder and dogwood caught his attention, at a spot near them, and at the next moment a noble buck sprang on the shore and buried himself in the lake. A full-mouthed cry followed, when Hector and the slut shot through the opening in the bushes and darted into the lake also, bearing their breasts gallantly against the water. End of chapter 26 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 27 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 27 
Oft in the full descending flood he tries to lose the scent, and lave his burning sides. Thompson I knowed it! I knowed it! cried Natty, when both deer and hounds were in full view. The buck has gone by them with the wind, and it has been too much for the poor rogues. But I must break them of these tricks, or they'll give me a deal of trouble. Here! Here! Shore with you, rascals! Shore with you! Will ye? Oh, off with you, old Hector, or I'll hackle your hide with my ramrod when I get ye! The dogs knew their master's voice and after swimming in a circle, as if reluctant to give over the chase, and yet afraid to persevere, they finally obeyed, and returned to the land, where they filled the air with their cries. In the meantime the deer, urged by his fears, had swum over half the distance between the shore and the boats, before his terror permitted him to see the new danger. But at the sounds of Natty's voice, he turned short in his course, and for a few moments seemed about to rush back again, and brave the dogs. His retreat in this direction was, however, effectually cut off, and turning a second time he urged his course obliquely for the center of the lake, with an intention of landing on the western shore. As the buck swam by the fisherman, raising his nose high into the air, curling the water before his slim neck like the beak of a galley, the leather stocking began to sit very uneasy in his canoe. "'Tis a noble creature!' he exclaimed. "'What a pair of horns! A man might hang up all his garments on the branches. Let me see. July is the last month, and the flesh must be getting good.' While he was talking, Natty had instinctively employed himself in fastening the inner end of the bark rope that served him for a cable to a paddle and rising suddenly on his legs he cast this buoy away, and cried, "'Strike out, John! Let her go! The creature's a fool to tempt a man in this way!' Mohegan threw the fastening of the youth's boat from the canoe, and with one stroke of his paddle sent the light bark over the water like a meteor. "'Hold!' exclaimed Edwards. "'Remember the law, my old friends. You are in plain sight of the village, and I know that Judge Temple is determined to prosecute all indiscriminately who killed deer out of season. The remonstrance came too late. The canoe was already far from the skiff, and the two hunters were too much engaged in the pursuit to listen to his voice. The buck was now within fifty yards of his pursuers, cutting the water gallantly, and snorting at each breath with terror and his exertions, while the canoe seemed to dance over the waves as it rose and fell with the undulations made by its own motion. Leatherstocking raised his rifle and freshened the priming, but stood in suspense whether to slay his victim or not. "'Shall I, John, or no?' he said. "'It seems but a poor advantage to take of the dumb thing, too. I won't. It is taken to the water on its own nature, which is the reason that God has given to a deer, and I'll give it the lake play. So, John, lay out your arm, and mind the turn of the buck. It's easy to catch them, but they'll turn like a snake.' The Indian laughed at the conceit of his friend, but continued to send the canoe forward with a velocity that proceeded much more from skill than his strength. Both of the old men now used the language of the Delawares when they spoke. "'Hugh!' exclaimed Mohegan. "'The deer turns his head. Hawkeye, lift your spear!' Natty never moved abroad without taking with him every implement that might by possibility be of service in his pursuits. From his rifle he never parted, and although intending to fish with the line, the canoe was invariably furnished with all of its utensils, even to its grate. This precaution grew out of the habits of the hunter, who was often led by his necessities or his sports far beyond the limits of his original destination. A few years earlier than the date of our tale, the leather stocking had left his hut on the shores of the Atsigo, with his rifle and his hounds, for a few days hunting in the hills. But before he returned he had seen the waters of Ontario. One, two, or even three hundred miles had once been nothing to his sinews, which were now a little stiffened by age. The hunter did as Mohegan advised, and prepared to strike a blow with the barbed weapon into the neck of the buck. "'Lay her more to the left, John,' he cried, 
Lay her more to the left. Another stroke of the paddle, and I have him. While speaking, he raised the spear and darted it from him like an arrow. At that instant the buck turned, the long pole glanced by him, the iron striking against his horn, and buried itself harmlessly in the lake. "'Back water!' cried Natty, as the canoe glided over the place where the spear had fallen. "'Hold water, John!' The pole soon reappeared, shooting up from the lake, and as the hunter seized it in his hand, the Indian whirled the light canoe round and renewed the chase. But this evolution gave the buck a great advantage and it also allowed time for Edwards to approach the scene of action. "'Hold your hand, Natty,' cried the youth. "'Hold your hand. Remember it is out of season.' This remonstrance was made as the bateau arrived close to the place where the deer was struggling with the water, his back now rising to the surface, now sinking beneath it, as the waves curled from his neck, the animal still sustaining itself nobly against the odds. "'Hurrah!' shouted Edwards, inflamed beyond prudence at the sight. "'Mind him as he doubles! Mind him as he doubles! Sheer more to the right! Mohegan, more to the right! And I'll have him by the horns! I'll throw the rope over his antlers!' The dark eye of the old warrior was dancing in his head with a wild animation, and the sluggish repose in which his aged frame had been resting in the canoe was now changed to all the rapid inflections of practiced agility. The canoe whirled with each cunning evolution of the chase, like a bubble floating in a whirlpool. And when the direction of the pursuit admitted of a straight course, the little bark skimmed the lake with a velocity that urged the deer to seek its safety in some new turn. It was the frequency of these circuitous movements that, by confining the action to so small a compass, enabled the youth to keep near his companions. More than twenty times both the pursued and the pursuer glided by him just without the reach of his oars, until he thought the best way to view the sport was to remain stationary, and, by watching a favorable opportunity, assist as much as he could in taking the victim. He was not required to wait long, for no sooner had he adopted this resolution, and risen in the boat, than he saw the deer coming bravely toward him, with an apparent intention of pushing for a point of land at some distance from the hounds, who were still barking and howling on the shore. Edwards caught the painter of his skiff, and making a noose cast it from him with all his force, and luckily succeeded in drawing its knot close around one of the antlers of the buck. For one instant the skiff was drawn through the water, but in the next the canoe glided before it, and Natty, bending low, passed his knife across the throat of the animal, whose blood followed the wound, dyeing the waters. The short time that was passed in the last struggles of the animal was spent by the hunters in bringing their boats together and securing them in that position, when Leather Stocking drew the deer from the water and laid its lifeless form in the bottom of the canoe. He placed his hands on the ribs, and on different parts of the body of his prize, and then, raising his head, he laughed in his peculiar manner. "'So much for Marmaduke Temple's law,' he said. "'This warms a body's blood, old John.' I haven't killed a buck in the lake afore this sin many a year. I call that good venison, lad, and I know them that will relish the creature's steaks for all the betterments in the land." The Indian had long been drooping with his years, and perhaps under the calamities of his race, but this invigorating and exciting sport caused a gleam of sunshine to cross his swarthy face that had long been absent from his features. It was evident the old man enjoyed the chase more as a memorial of his youthful sports and deeds than with any expectation of profiting by the success. He felt the deer, however lightly, his hand already trembling with the reaction of his unusual exertions, and smiled with a nod of approbation, as he said in the emphatic and sententious manner of his people, Good. "'I am afraid, Natty,' said Edwards, when the heat of the moment had passed, and his blood began to cool, that we have all been equally transgressors of the law. But keep your own counsel, and there are none here to betray us. Yet how came those dogs at large? I left them securely fastened, I know, for I felt the thongs and examined the knots when I was at the hut. "'It has been too much for the poor things,' said Natty, to have such a buck take the wind of them. See, lad, the pieces of the buckskin are hanging from their necks yet. Let us paddle up, John, and I will call them in, and 
look a little into the matter. When the old hunter landed and examined the thongs that were yet fast to the hounds, his countenance sensibly changed, and he shook his head doubtingly. "'Here has been a knife at work,' he said. "'This skin was never torn, nor is this the mark of a hound's tooth. No, no, Hector is not in fault, as I feared.' "'Has the leather been cut?' cried Edwards. "'No, no, I didn't say it had been cut, lad. But this is a mark that was never made by a jump or a bite. Could that rascally carpenter have dared?' "'Aye. He durst do anything when there is no danger,' said Natty. "'He is a curious body, and loves to be helping other people on with their concerns. But he had best not harbour so much near the wigwam.' In the meantime, Mohegan had been examining with an Indian sagacity the place where the leather thong had been separated. After scrutinizing it closely, he said in Delaware, It was cut with a knife, a sharp blade, and a long handle. The man was afraid of the dogs. How is this, Mohegan? exclaimed Edwards. You saw it not. How can you know these facts? Listen, son, said the warrior. The knife was sharp, for the cut was smooth. The handle was long, for a man's arm would not reach from this gash to the cut that did not go through the skin. He was a coward, or he would have cut the thongs around the necks of the hounds. "'On my life,' cried Natty, "'John is on the scent. It was the carpenter, and he has got on the rock back of the kennel and let the dogs loose by fastening his knife to a stick. It would be an easy matter to do it where a man is so minded.' "'And why should he do so?' asked Edwards. Who has done him wrong, that he should trouble two old men like you? It's a hard matter, lad, to know men's ways, I find, since the settlers have brought in their new fashions. But is there nothing to be found out in the place? And maybe he is troubled with his longings after other people's business, as he often is. Your suspicions are just. Give me the canoe. I am young and strong, and will get down there yet, perhaps in time to interrupt his plans. Heaven forbid that we should be at the mercy of such a man." His proposal was accepted, the deer being placed in the skiff in order to lighten the canoe, and in less than five minutes the little vessel of bark was gliding over the glassy lake, and was soon hid by the points of land as it shot close along the shore. Mohegan followed slowly with the skiff, while Natty, called his hounds to him, bade them keep close, and shouldering his rifle, he ascended the mountain with an intention of going to the hut by land. End of chapter 27 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 28 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. CHAPTER Twenty-Eight. Ask me not what the maiden feels, left in that dreadful hour alone. Perchance her reason stoops, or real. Perchance a courage not her own braces her mind to desperate tone. SCOTT while the chase was occurring on the lake, Miss Temple and her companion pursued their walk on the mountain. Male attendants on such excursions were thought to be altogether unnecessary, for none were even known to offer insult to a female who respected herself. After the embarrassment created by the parting discourse with Edwards had dissipated, the girls maintained a conversation that was as innocent and cheerful as themselves. The path they took led them but a short distance above the hut of leather stocking, and there was a point in the road which commanded a bird's-eye view of the sequestered spot. From a feeling that might have been natural, and must have been powerful, neither of the friends, in their frequent and confidential dialogues, had ever trusted herself to utter one syllable concerning the equivocal situation in which the young man who was now so intimately associated with them had been found. If Judge Temple had deemed it prudent to make any inquiries on the subject, he had also thought it proper to keep the answers to himself. Though it was so common an occurrence to find the well-educated youth of the eastern states in every stage of their career to wealth, that the simple circumstance of his intelligence, connected with his poverty, would not, at that day and in that country, have excited any very powerful curiosity. 
With his breeding it might have been different, but the youth himself had so effectually guarded against surprise on this subject, by his cold and even in some cases rude deportment, that when his manners seemed to soften by time, the judge, if he thought about it at all, would have been most likely to imagine that the improvement was the result of his late association. But women are always more alive to such subjects than men, and what the abstraction of the father had overlooked, the observation of the daughter had easily detected. In the thousand little courtesies of polished life she had early discovered that Edwards was not wanting, though his gentleness was so often crossed by marks of what she conceived to be fierce and uncontrollable passions. It may perhaps be unnecessary to tell the reader that Louisa Grant never reasoned so much after the fashions of the world. The gentle girl, however, had her own thoughts on the subject, and, like others, she drew her own conclusions. "'I would give all my other secrets,' Louisa exclaimed Miss Temple, laughing, and shaking back her dark locks with a look of childish simplicity that her intelligent face seldom expressed to be mistress of all that those rude logs have heard and witnessed. They were both looking at the secluded hut at the instant, and Miss Grant raised her mild eyes as she answered, I am sure they would tell nothing to the disadvantage of Mr. Edwards. Perhaps not, but they might at least tell who he is. Why, dear Miss Temple, we know all that already. I have heard it all very rationally explained by your cousin, the executive chief. He can explain anything. His ingenuity will one day discover the Philosopher's Stone. But what did he say?" "'Say,' echoed Louisa, with a look of surprise, "'why, everything that seemed to me to be satisfactory, and I now believed it to be true. He said that Natty Bumpo had lived most of his life in the woods and among the Indians, by which means he had formed an acquaintance with old John, the Delaware chief. Indeed. That was quite a matter-of-fact tale for Cousin Dickon. What came next? I believe he accounted for their close intimacy by some story about the leather stocking saving the life of John in a battle. Nothing more likely, said Elizabeth, a little impatiently. But what is all this to the purpose? Nay, Elizabeth, you must bear with my ignorance, and I will repeat all that I remember to have overheard, for the dialogue was between my father and the sheriff so lately as the last time they met. He then added that the kings of England used to keep gentlemen as agents among the different tribes of Indians, and sometimes officers in the army, who frequently passed half their lives on the edge of the wilderness. Told with wonderful historical accuracy! And did he end there? Oh, no! Then he said that these agents seldom married, and—and—they must have been wicked men, Elizabeth, but I assure you he said so. "'Never mind,' said Miss Temple, blushing and smiling, though so slightly that both were unheeded by her companion. "'Skip all that.' "'Well, then, he said that they often took great pride in the education of their children, whom they frequently sent to England, and even to the colleges, and this is the way that he accounts for the liberal manner in which Mr. Edwards has been taught, for he acknowledges that he knows almost as much as your father, or mine, or even himself.' "'Quite a climax in learning!' and so he made Mohegan the granduncle or grandfather of Oliver Edwards. "'You have heard him yourself, then?' said Louisa. "'Often. But not on this subject. Mr. Richard Jones, you know, dear, has a theory for everything. But has he one which will explain the reason why that hut is the only habitation within fifty miles of us, whose door is not open to every person who may choose to lift its latch? I have never heard him say anything on this subject.' returned the clergyman's daughter. But I suppose that, as they are poor, they very naturally are anxious to keep the little that they honestly own. It is sometimes dangerous to be rich, Miss Temple, but you cannot know how hard it is to be very, very poor. Nor you, I trust, Louisa. At least I should hope that, in this land of abundance, no minister of the Church could be left in absolute suffering. There cannot be actual misery, returned the other, in a low and humble tone where there is a dependence on our Maker. But there may be such suffering as will cause the heart to ache." "'But not you! Not you!' said the impetuous Elizabeth. "'Not you, dear girl! You have never known the misery that is connected with poverty.' "'Ah, Miss Temple, you little understand the troubles of this life, I believe. 
My father has spent many years as a missionary in the new countries, where his people were poor, and frequently we have been without bread, unable to buy, and ashamed to beg, because we would not disgrace his sacred calling. But how often have I seen him leave his home, where the sick and the hungry felt when he left them that they had lost their only earthly friend, to ride on a duty which could not be neglected for domestic evils. Oh, how hard it must be to preach consolation to others when your own heart is bursting with anguish! But it is all over now. Your father's income must now be equal to his wants. It must be. It shall be. It is, replied Louisa, dropping her head on her bosom to conceal the tears which flowed in spite of her gentle Christianity, for there are none left to be supplied but me. The turn the conversation had taken drove from the minds of the young maidens all other thoughts but those of holy charity, and Elizabeth folded her friend in her arms when the latter gave vent to her momentary grief in audible sobs. When this burst of emotion had subsided, Louisa raised her mild countenance, and they continued their walk in silence. By this time they had gained the summit of the mountain, where they left the highway, and pursued their course under the shade of the stately trees that crowned the eminence. The day was becoming warm, and the girls plunged more deeply into the forest, as they found its invigorating coolness agreeably contrasted to the excessive heat they had experienced in the ascent. The conversation, as if by mutual consent, was entirely changed to the little incidents and scenes of their walk, and every tall pine and every shrub or flower called forth some simple expression of admiration. In this manner they proceeded along the margin of the precipice, catching occasional glimpses of the placid Otsego, or pausing to listen to the rattling of wheels and the sounds of hammers that rose from the valley, to mingle the signs of men with the scenes of nature, when Elizabeth suddenly started, and exclaimed, "'Listen! There are the cries of a child on this mountain. Is there a clearing near us, or can some little one have strayed from its parents?' "'Such things frequently happen,' returned Louisa. "'Let us follow the sounds. It may be a wanderer starving on the hill.' Urged by this consideration, the females pursued the low, mournful sounds that proceeded from the forest, with quick and impatient steps. More than once the ardent Elizabeth was on the point of announcing that she saw the sufferer, when Louisa caught her by the arm, and pointing behind them, cried, "'Look at the dog!' Brave had been their companion from the time the voice of his young mistress lured him from his kennel to the present moment. His advanced age had long before deprived him of his activity, and when his companions stopped to view the scenery, or to add to their bouquets, the mastiff would lay his huge frame on the ground and await their movements, with his eyes closed, and a listlessness in his air that ill accorded with the character of a protector. But when, aroused by this cry from Louisa, Miss Temple turned, she saw the dog with his eyes keenly set on some distant object, his head bent near the ground, and his hair actually rising on his body, through fright or anger. It was most probably the latter, for he was growling in a low key, and occasionally showing his teeth in a manner that would have terrified his mistress, had she not so well known his good qualities. "'Brave,' she said. "'Be quiet, brave. What do you see, fellow?' At the sounds of her voice the rage of the mastiff, instead of being at all diminished, was very sensibly increased. He stalked in front of the ladies, and seated himself at the feet of his mistress, growling louder than before, and occasionally giving vent to his ire by a short, surly barking. "'What does he see?' said Elizabeth. "'There must be some animal in sight.' Hearing no answer from her companion, Miss Temple turned her head and beheld Louisa, standing with her face whitened to the color of death and her finger pointing upward with a sort of flickering, convulsed motion. The quick eye of Elizabeth glanced in the direction indicated by her friend, where she saw the fierce front and glaring eyes of a female panther, fixed on them in horrid malignity, and threatening to leap. "'Let us fly!' exclaimed Elizabeth, grasping the arm of Louisa, whose form yielded like melting snow. There was not a single feeling in the temperament of Elizabeth Temple that could prompt her to desert a companion in such an extremity. She fell on her knees by the side of the inanimate Louisa, tearing from the person of her friend with instinctive readiness such parts of her dress as might obstruct her respiration, and encouraging their only safeguard, the dog, at the same time, by the sounds of her voice. "'Courage, brave!' she cried, her own tones beginning to tremble. "'Courage! Courage, good brave!' 
A quarter-grown cub that had hitherto been unseen now appeared, dropping from the branches of a sapling that grew under the shade of the beech which held its dam. This ignorant but vicious creature approached the dog, imitating the actions and sounds of its parent, but exhibiting a strange mixture of the playfulness of a kitten with the ferocity of its race. Standing on its hind legs, it would rend the bark of a tree with its forepaws, and play the antics of a cat, and then, by lashing itself with its tail, growling, and scratching the earth, it would attempt the manifestations of anger that rendered its parents so terrific. All this time Brave stood firm and undaunted, his short tail erect, his body drawn backward on its haunches, and his eyes following the movements of both dam and cub. At every gamble played by the latter, it approached nigher to the dog, the growling of the three becoming more horrid at each moment, until the younger beast, overleaping its intended bound, fell directly before the mastiff. There was a moment of fearful cries and struggles, but they ended almost as soon as commenced, by the cub appearing in the air, hurled from the jaws of Brave, with a violence that sent it against a tree so forcibly as to render it completely senseless. Elizabeth witnessed the short struggle, and her blood was warming with the triumph of the dog when she saw the form of the old panther in the air, springing twenty feet from the branch of the beech to the back of the mastiff. No words of ours can describe the fury of the conflict that followed. It was a confused struggle on the dry leaves, accompanied by loud and terrific cries. Miss Temple continued on her knees, bending over the form of Louisa, her eyes fixed on the animals with an interest so horrid, and yet so intense, that she almost forgot her own stake in the result. So rapid and vigorous were the bounds of the inhabitant of the forest, that its active frame seemed constantly in the air while the dog nobly faced his foe at each successive leap. When the panther lighted on the shoulders of the mastiff, which was its constant aim, old Brave, though torn with her talons and stained with his own blood that already flowed from a dozen wounds, would shake off his furious foe like a feather, and rearing on his hind legs, rush to the fray again with jaws distended and a dauntless eye. But age and his pampered life greatly disqualified the noble mastiff for such a struggle. In everything but courage he was only the vestige of what he had once been. A higher bound than ever raised the wary and furious beast far beyond the reach of the dog, who was making a desperate but fruitless dash at her, from which she alighted in a favorable position on the back of her aged foe. For a single moment only could the panther remain there, the great strength of the dog returning with a convulsive effort. But Elizabeth saw, as Brave fastened his teeth in the side of his enemy, that the collar of brass around his neck, which had been glittering throughout the fray, was of the color of blood, and directly that his frame was sinking to the earth, where it soon lay prostrate and helpless. Several mighty efforts of the wild cat to extricate herself from the jaws of the dog followed, but they were fruitless, until the mastiff turned on his back, his lips collapsed, and his teeth loosened, when the short convulsions and stillness that succeeded announced the death of poor Brave. Elizabeth now lay wholly at the mercy of the beast. There is said to be something in the front of the image of the Maker that daunts the hearts of the inferior beings of His creation. And it would seem that some such power in the present instance suspended the threatened blow. The eyes of the monster and the kneeling maiden met for an instant, when the former stooped to examine her fallen foe, next to send her luckless cub. From the latter examination it turned, however, with its eyes apparently emitting flashes of fire, its tail lashing its sides furiously, and its claws projecting inches from her broad feet. Miss Temple did not or could not move. Her hands were clasped in the attitude of prayer, but her eyes were still drawn to her terrible enemy. Her cheeks were blanched to the whiteness of marble, and her lips were slightly separated with horror. The moment seemed now to have arrived for the fatal termination, and the beautiful figure of Elizabeth was bowing meekly to the stroke, when a rustling of leaves behind seemed rather to mock the organs than to meet her ears. "'Hist! Hist!' said a low voice. "'Stoop lower, gal. Your bonnet hides the creature's head.' It was rather the yielding of nature than a compliance with this unexpected order that caused the head of our heroine to sink on her bosom. 
when she heard the report of the rifle, the whizzing of the bullet, and the enraged cries of the beast, who was rolling over on the earth, biting its own flesh, and tearing the twigs and branches within its reach. At the next instant the form of the leather stocking rushed by her, and he called aloud, "'Come in, Hector! Come in, old fool! Tis a hard-lived animal, and may jump again!' Natty fearlessly maintained his position in front of the females. Notwithstanding the violent bounds and threatening aspect of the wounded panther, which gave several indications of returning strength and ferocity, until his rifle was again loaded, when he stepped up to the enraged animal, and placing the muzzle close to its head, every spark of life was extinguished by the discharge. The death of her terrible enemy appeared to Elizabeth like a resurrection from her own grave. There was an elasticity in the mind of our heroine that rose to meet the pressure of instant danger, and the more direct it had been, the more her nature had struggled to overcome them. But still she was a woman. Had she been left to herself in her late extremity, she would probably have used her faculties to the utmost, and with discretion, in protecting her person. But encumbered with her inanimate friend, retreat was a thing not to be attempted. Notwithstanding the fearful aspect of her foe, the eye of Elizabeth had never shrunk from its gaze, and long after the event her thoughts would recur to her passing sensations, and the sweetness of her midnight sleep would be disturbed, as her active fancy conjured in dreams the most trifling movements of savage fury that the beast had exhibited in its moment of power. We shall leave the reader to imagine the restoration of Louise's senses and the expressions of gratitude which fell from the young women. The former was effected by a little water that was brought from one of the thousand springs of those mountains in the cap of the leather stocking, and the latter were uttered with the warmth that might be expected from the character of Elizabeth. Natty received her vehement protestations of gratitude with a simple expression of good will, and with indulgence for her present excitement but with a carelessness that showed how little he thought of the service he had rendered. "'Well, well,' he said. "'Be it so, gal, be it so, if you wish it. We'll talk the thing over another time. Come, come, let us get into the road, for you've had terror enough to make you wish yourself in your father's house again.' This was uttered as they were proceeding at a pace that was adapted to the weakness of Louisa toward the highway on reaching which the ladies separated from their guide, declaring themselves equal to the remainder of the walk without his assistance, and feeling encouraged by the sight of the village which lay beneath their feet like a picture, with its limpid lake in front, the winding stream along its margin, and its hundred chimneys of whitened bricks. The reader need not be told the nature of the emotions which two youthful, ingenuous, and well-educated girls would experience at their escape from a death so horrid as the one which had impended over them, while they pursued their way in silence along the track on the side of the mountain. Nor how deep were their mental thanks to that power which had given them their existence, and which had not deserted them in their extremity. Neither how often they pressed each other's arms, as the assurance of their present safety came, like a healing balm, athwart their troubled spirits, when their thoughts were recurring to the recent moments of horror. Leatherstocking remained on the hill, gazing after their retiring figures until they were hidden by a bend in the road, when he whistled in his dogs, and shouldering his rifle he returned into the forest. "'Well, it was a scary thing to the young creatures,' said Natty, while he retrod the path toward the plain. "'It might frighten an older woman to see a she-painter so near her, with a dead cub by its side.' I wonder if I had aimed at the varmint's eye if I shouldn't have touched the life sooner than in the forehead. But they are hard-lived animals, and it was a good shot, considering that I could see nothing but the head and the peak of its tail. Ha! Who goes there? How goes it, Natty? said Mr. Doolittle, stepping out of the bushes, with a motion that was a good deal accelerated by the sight of the rifle, that was already lowered in his direction. What? Shooting this warm day? Mind, old man, the law don't get hold on you. The law, squire. I have shook hands with the law these forty year, returned Natty. For what has a man who lives in the wilderness to do with the ways of the law? Not much, maybe, said Hiram. But you sometimes trade in venison. 
I suppose you know, Leather Stocking, that there is an act passed to lay a fine of five pounds currency, or twelve dollars and fifty cents, by decimals, on every man who kills a deer betwixt January and August. The judge had a great hand in getting the law through. I can believe it, returned the old hunter. I can believe that or anything of a man who carries on as he does in the country. Yes, the law is quite positive, and the judge is bent on putting it in force. Five pounds penalty. I thought I heard your hounds out on the scent of something this morning. I didn't know but they might get you in difficulty. They know their manners too well, said Natty, carelessly, and how much goes to the state's evidence, squire? How much? repeated Hiram, quailing under the honest but sharp look of the hunter. The informer gets half, I, I believe, yes, I guess it's half. But there's blood on your sleeve, man. You haven't been shooting anything this morning. I have, though, said the hunter, nodding his head significantly to the other, and a good shot I made of it. Hmm, <clears throat> ejaculated the magistrate, and where is the game? I suppose it's of a good nature, for your dogs won't hunt anything that isn't choice. They'll hunt anything I tell them to, squire, cried Natty, favoring the other with his laugh. They'll hunt you, if I say so. Here, here, Hector. Here, slut. Come this away, pups. Come this away. Come hither. Oh, I have always heard a good character of the dogs, returned Mr. Doolittle, quickening his pace by raising each leg in rapid succession as the hounds scented around his person. And where is the game, Leather Stocking? During this dialogue the speakers had been walking at a very fast gait, and Natty swung the end of his rifle round, pointing through the bushes, and replied, There lies one. How do you like such meat? This! exclaimed Hiram. Why, this is Judge Temple's dog Brave. Take care, Leather Stocking, and don't make an enemy of the judge. I hope you haven't harmed the animal. Look for yourself, Mr. Doolittle, said Natty, drawing his knife from his girdle, and wiping it in a knowing manner, once or twice across his garment of buckskin. Does his throat look as if I had cut it with this knife? It is dreadfully torn. It's an awful wound. No knife ever did this deed. Who could have done it? The painter's behind you, squire. Painters! echoed Hiram, whirling on his heel with an agility that would have done credit to a dancing master. Be easy, man, said Natty. There's two of the venomous things, but the dog finished one, and I have fastened the other's jaws for her. So don't be frightened, squire. They won't hurt you. And where's the deer? cried Hiram, staring about him with a bewildered air. Anon? Deer, repeated Natty. Sartin. Ain't there venison here, or didn't you kill a buck? What, when the law forbids the thing, squire? said the old hunter. I hope there's no law agin killing the painters. No, there's a bounty on the scalps, but will your dogs hunt painters, Natty? Anything. Didn't I tell you they would hunt a man? Here, here, pups. Yes, yes, I remember. Well, they are strange dogs, I must say. I am quite in a wonderment. Natty had seated himself on the ground, and having laid the grim head of his late ferocious enemy in his lap, was drawing his knife with a practiced hand around the ears, which he tore from the head of the beast in such a manner as to preserve their connection, when he answered, "'What at, squire? Did you never see a painter's scalp before? Come, you are a magistrate. I wish you'd make me out an order for the bounty.' "'The bounty,' repeated Hiram, holding the ears on the end of his finger for a moment, as if uncertain how to proceed. Well, let us go down to your hut, where you can take the oath, and I will write out the order. I suppose you have a Bible? All the law wants is the four evangelists and the Lord's Prayer. I keep no books, said Natty, a little coldly. Not such a Bible as the law needs. Oh, there's but one sort of Bible that's good in law, returned the magistrate. And yourn will do as well as another's. Come, the carcasses are worth nothing, man. Let us go down and take the oath. Softly, softly, squire, said the hunter, lifting his trophies very deliberately from the ground, and shouldering his rifle. Why do you want an oath at all, for a thing that your own eyes has seen? Won't you believe yourself that another man must swear to a fact that you know to be true? You have seen me scalp the creatures, and if I must swear to it, it shall be before Judge Temple, who needs an oath. 
But we have no pen or paper here, Leather Stocking. We must go to the hut for them. Or how can I write the order? Natty turned his simple features on the cunning magistrate with another of his laughs, as he said, And what should I be doing with scholar's tools? I want no pens or paper, not knowing the use of either. And I keep none. No, no, I'll bring the scalps into the village, squire, and you can make out the order on one of your law-books, and it will be all the better for it. The deuce take this leather on the neck of the dog. It will strangle the old fool. Can you lend me a knife, squire? Hiram, who seemed particularly anxious to be on good terms with his companion, unhesitatingly complied. Natty cut the thong from the neck of the hound, and as he returned the knife to its owner, carelessly remarked, "'Tis a good bit of steel, and has cut such leather as this very same, before now, I dare say." "'Do you mean to charge me with letting your hounds loose?' exclaimed Hiram, with a consciousness that disarmed his caution. "'Loose!' repeated the hunter. "'I let them loose myself. I always let them loose before I leave the hut.' The ungovernable amazement with which Mr. Doolittle listened to this falsehood would have betrayed his agency in the liberation of the dogs had Natty wanted any further confirmation, and the coolness and management of the old man now disappeared in open indignation. "'Look you here, Mr. Doolittle,' he said, striking the breech of his rifle violently on the ground. "'What there is in the wigwam of a poor man like me, that one like you can crave, I don't know. But this I tell you to your face, that you never shall put foot under the roof of my cabin with my consent, and that if you harbor round the spot, as you have done lately, you may meet with treatment that you will little relish. And let me tell you, Mr. Bumpo, said Hiram, retreating, however, with a quick step, that I know you've broke the law, and that I'm a magistrate, and will make you feel it too before you are a day older. "'That for you and your law, too,' cried Natty, snapping his fingers at the justice of the peace. "'Away with you, you varmint, before the devil tempts me to give you your deserts. "'Take care, if I ever catch your prowling face in the woods again, that I don't shoot it for an owl.' There is something at all times commanding an honest indignation, and Hiram did not stay to provoke the wrath of the old hunter to extremities. When the intruder was out of sight, Natty proceeded to the hut, where he found all quiet as the grave. He fastened his dogs, and tapping at the door, which was opened by Edwards, asked, "'Is all safe, lad?' "'Everything,' returned the youth. Someone attempted the lock, but it was too strong for him. "'I know the creature,' said Natty, "'but he'll not trust himself within the reach of my rifle very soon.' What more was uttered by the leather stocking in his vexation was rendered inaudible by the closing of the door of the cabin. End of chapter 28 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 29 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. CHAPTER Twenty-Nine. It is noised he hath a mass of treasure. Timon of Athens When Marmaduke Temple and his cousin rode through the gate of the former, the heart of the father had been too recently touched with the best feelings of our nature, to leave inclination for immediate discourse. There was an importance in the air of Richard which would not have admitted of the ordinary informal conversation of the sheriff, without violating all the rules of consistency. And the equestrians pursued their way with great diligence for more than a mile in profound silence. At length the soft expression of parental affection was slowly chased from the handsome features of the judge, and was gradually supplanted by the cast of humor and benevolence that was usually seated on his brow. "'Well, Dickon,' he said, "'since I have yielded myself so far implicitly to your guidance, I think the moment has arrived when I am entitled to further confidence. Why and wherefore are we journeying together in this solemn gate?' The sheriff gave a loud hem that rang far in the forest, 
and keeping his eyes fixed on objects before him like a man who is looking deep into futurity. "'There has always been one point of difference between us, Judge Temple, I may say, since our nativity,' he replied. "'Not that I would insinuate that you are at all answerable for the acts of nature. For a man is no more to be condemned for the misfortunes of his birth than he is to be commended for the natural advantages he may possess. But on one point we may be said to have differed from our births, and they, you know, occurred within two days of each other. I really marvel, Richard, what this one point can be, for to my eyes we seem to differ so materially, and so often— Mere consequences, sir, interrupted the sheriff. All our minor differences proceed from one cause, and that is, our opinions of the universal attainments of genius. In what, Dickon? I speak plain English, I believe, Judge Temple. At least I ought, for my father who taught me could speak Greek and Latin, interrupted Marmaduke. I well know the qualifications of your family in tongues, Dickon. But proceed to the point. Why are we traveling over this mountain today? To do justice to any subject, sir, the narrator must be suffered to proceed in his own way, continued the sheriff. You are of opinion, Judge Temple, that a man is to be qualified by nature and education to do only one thing well, whereas I know that genius will supply the place of learning, and that a certain sort of man can do anything and everything. Like yourself, I suppose, said Marmaduke, smiling. I scorn personalities, sir. I say nothing of myself. But there are three men on your patent, of the kind that I should term talented by nature for her general purposes though acting under the influence of different situations. We are better off, then, than I had supposed. Who are these triumviri? Why, sir, one is Hiram Doolittle, a carpenter by trade, as you know, and I need only point to the village to exhibit his merits. Then he is a magistrate, and might shame many a man in his distribution of justice who has had better opportunities. Well, he is one, said Marmaduke with the air of a man that was determined not to dispute the point. Jotham Riddell is another. Who? Jotham Riddell. What? That dissatisfied, shiftless, lazy, speculating fellow? He who changes his county every three years, his farm every six months, and his occupation every season? An agriculturalist yesterday, a shoemaker today, and a schoolmaster tomorrow? That epitome of all the unsteady and profitless propensities of the settlers, without one of their good qualities to counterbalance the evil? Nay, Richard, this is too bad for even— <laughs> But the third— As the third is not used to hearing such comments on his character, Judge Temple, I shall not name him. The amount of all this, then, Dickon— is that the trio, of which you are one, and the principal, have made some important discovery. I have not said that I am one, Judge Temple. As I told you before, say nothing egotistical. But a discovery has been made, and you are deeply interested in it. Proceed. I am all ears. No, no, Duke, you are bad enough, I own, but not so bad as that, either. Your ears are not quite full-grown. The sheriff laughed heartily at his own wit, and put himself in good humor thereby, when he gratified his patient cousin with the following explanation. You know, Duke, there is a man living on your estate that goes by the name of Natty Bumpo. Here has this man lived, by what I can learn, for more than forty years, by himself until lately, and now with strange companions. Part very true, and all very probable, said the judge. All true, sir, all true. Well, within these last few months have appeared as his companions an old Indian chief, the last, or one of the last of his tribe that is to be found in this part of the country, and a young man who is said to be the son of some Indian agent by a squaw. "'Who says that?' cried Marmaduke, with an interest that he had not manifested before. "'Who? Why, common sense, common report, the hue and cry. But listen till you know all. This youth has very pretty talents, yes, what I call very pretty talents, and has been well educated has seen very tolerable company, and knows how to behave himself when he has a mind to. Now, Judge Temple, 
Can you tell me what has brought the three such men as Indian John, Natty Bumpo, and Oliver Edwards together? Marmaduke turned his countenance in evident surprise to his cousin, and replied quickly, Thou hast unexpectedly hit on a subject, Richard, that has often occupied my mind. But knowest thou anything of this mystery, or are they only the crude conjectures of— Crude nothing, Duke! Crude nothing! But facts! Stubborn facts! You know there are mines in these mountains. I have often heard you say that you believed in their existence. Reasoning from analogy, Richard, but not with any certainty of the fact. You have heard them mentioned, and have seen specimens of the ore, sir. You will not deny that. And reasoning from analogy, as you say, if there be mines in South America, ought there not to be mines in North America, too? Nay, nay, I deny nothing, my cousin. I certainly have heard many rumors of the existence of mines in these hills, and I do believe that I have seen specimens of the precious metals that have been found here. It would occasion me no surprise to learn that tin and silver, or what I consider of more consequence, good coal— "'Damn your coal!' cried the sheriff. "'Who wants to find coal in these forests? No, no. Silver, Duke. Silver is the one thing needful, and silver is to be found.' But listen, you are not to be told that the natives have long known the use of gold and silver. Now who so likely to be acquainted where they are to be found as the ancient inhabitants of a country? I have the best reasons for believing that both Mohegan and the Leatherstocking have been privy to the existence of a mine in this very mountain for many years. The sheriff had now touched his cousin in a sensitive spot and Marmaduke lent a more attentive ear to the speaker, who, after waiting a moment to see the effect of this extraordinary development, proceeded. "'Yes, sir, I have my reasons, and at a proper time you shall know them. No time is so good as the present.' "'Well, well, be attentive,' continued Richard, looking cautiously about him, to make sure that no eavesdropper was hid in the forest, though they were in constant motion." I have seen Mohegan and the leather stocking with my own eyes, and my eyes are as good as anybody's eyes. I have seen them, I say, both going up the mountain and coming down it, with spades and picks, and others have seen them carrying things into their hut, in a secret and mysterious manner, after dark. Do you call this a fact of importance?" The judge did not reply, but his brow had contracted with a thoughtfulness that he always wore when much interested and his eyes rested on his cousin in expectation of hearing more. Richard continued. It was Orr. Now, sir, I ask if you can tell me who this Mr. Oliver Edwards is, that has made a part of your household since Christmas. Marmaduke again raised his eyes, but continued silence, shaking his head in the negative. That he is a half-breed we know, for Mohegan does not scruple to call him openly his kinsman. That he is well educated, we know. But as to his business here, do you remember that about a month before this young man made his appearance among us, Natty was absent from home several days? You do, for you inquired for him, as you wanted some venison to take to your friends when you went for Bess. Well, he was not to be found. Old John was left in the hut alone, and when Natty did appear, although he came on in the night, he was seen drawing one of those jumpers that they carry their grain to mill in, and to take out something with great care that he had covered up under his bearskins. Now let me ask you, Judge Temple, what motive could induce a man like the leather stocking to make a sled and toil with a load over these mountains if he had nothing but his rifle or his ammunition to carry? They frequently make these jumpers to convey their game home, and you say he had been absent many days. How did he kill it? His rifle was in the village to be mended. No, no. That he was gone to some unusual place is certain. That he brought back some secret utensils is more certain. And that he has not allowed a soul to approach his hut since is most certain of all. He was never fond of intruders. I know it, interrupted Richard. But did he drive them from his cabin morosely? Within a fortnight of his return this Mr. Edwards appears. They spend whole days in the mountains pretending to be shooting, but in reality exploring. The frosts prevent their digging at that time, and he avails himself of a lucky accident to get into good quarters. 
but even now he is quite half of his time in that hut. Many hours every night. They are smelting. Duke, they are smelting. And as they grow rich, you grow poor. How much of this is thine own, Richard, and how much comes from others? I would sift the wheat from the chaff. Part is my own, for I saw the jumper, though it was broken up and burnt in a day or two. I have told you that I saw the old man with his spades and picks. Hiram met Natty, as he was crossing the mountain, the night of his arrival with the sled, and very good-naturedly offered—Hiram is good-natured—to carry up part of his load, for the old man had a heavy pull up the back of the mountain, but he wouldn't listen to the thing and repulsed the offer in such a manner that the squire said he had half a mind to swear the peace against him. Since the snow has been off, more especially after the frosts got out of the ground, we have kept a watchful eye on the gentleman, in which we have found Jotham useful. Marmaduke did not much like the associates of Richard in this business. Still he knew them to be cunning and ready expedients and as there was certainly something mysterious not only in the connection between the old hunters and Edwards, but in what his cousin had just related, he began to revolve the subject in his own mind with more care. On reflection he remembered various circumstances that tended to corroborate these suspicions, and as the whole business favored one of his infirmities, he yielded the more readily to their impression. The mind of Judge Temple, at all times comprehensive, had received from his peculiar occupations a bias to look far into futurity. In his speculations on the improvements that posterity were to make in his lands, to his eye, where others saw nothing but a wilderness, towns, manufactories, bridges, canals, mines, and all the other resources of an old country were constantly presenting themselves, though his good sense suppressed, in some degree, the exhibition of these expectations. As the sheriff allowed his cousin full time to reflect on what he had heard, the probability of some pecuniary adventure being the connecting link in the chain that brought Oliver Edwards into the cabin of leather stocking appeared to him each moment to be stronger. But Marmaduke was too much in the habit of examining both sides of a subject not to perceive the objections, and he reasoned with himself aloud. It cannot be so or the youth would not be driven so near the verge of poverty. "'What's so likely to make a man dig for money as being poor?' cried the sheriff. "'Besides, there is an elevation of character about Oliver that proceeds from education, which would forbid so clandestine a proceeding.' "'Could an ignorant fellow smelt?' continued Richard. Bess hints that he was reduced even to his last shilling when we took him into our dwelling. He had been buying tools, and would he spend his last sixpence for a shot at a turkey had he not known where to get more? Can I have possibly been so long a dupe? His manner has been rude to me at times, but I attributed it to his conceiving himself injured, and to his mistaking the forms of the world. Haven't you been a dupe all your life, Duke? And ain't what you call ignorance of forms deep cunning, to conceal his real character? If he were bent on deception, he would have concealed his knowledge, and passed with us for an inferior man. He cannot. I could no more pass for a fool myself than I could fly. Knowledge is not to be concealed like a candle under a bushel. Richard, said the judge, turning to his cousin, there are many reasons against the truth of thy conjectures, but thou hast awakened suspicions which must be satisfied. But why are we travelling here? Jotham, who has been much in the mountain latterly, being kept there by me and Hiram, has made a discovery, which he will not explain, he says, for he is bound by an oath. But the amount is that he knows where the ore lies, and he has this day begun to dig. I would not consent to the thing, Duke, without your knowledge, for the land is yours, and now you know the reason of our ride. I call this a countermine, ha! And where is the desirable spot? asked the judge, with an air half comical, half serious. At hand, and when we have visited that, I will show you one of the places that we have found within a week, 
where our hunters have been amusing themselves for six months past. The gentlemen continued to discuss the matter, while their horses picked their way under the branches of the trees and over the uneven ground of the mountain. They soon arrived at the end of their journey, where, in truth, they found Jotham already buried to his neck in a hole that he had been digging. Marmaduke questioned the miner very closely as to his reasons for believing in the existence of the precious metals near that particular spot. But the fellow maintained an obstinate mystery in his answers. He asserted that he had the best of reasons for what he did, and inquired of the judge what portion of the profits would fall to his own share, in the event of success, with an earnestness that proved his faith. After spending an hour near the place, examining the stones, and searching for the usual indications of the proximity of ore, the judge remounted and suffered his cousin to lead the way to the place where the mysterious trio had been making their excavation. The spot chosen by Jotham was on the back of the mountain that overhung the hut of leather stocking, and the place selected by Natty and his companions was on the other side of the same hill, but above the road and, of course, in an opposite direction to the route taken by the ladies in their walk. "'We shall be safe in approaching the place now,' said Richard, while they dismounted and fastened their horses, for I took a look with the glass, and saw John and Leatherstocking in their canoe fishing before we left home, and Oliver's in the same pursuit. But these may be nothing but shams to blind our eye, so we will be expeditious, for it would not be pleasant to be caught here by them.' "'Not on my own land?' said Marmaduke sternly. "'If it be as you suspect, I will know their reasons for making this excavation.' "'Mum,' said Richard, laying a finger on his lip, and leading the way down a very difficult descent to a sort of natural cavern, which was found in the face of the rock, and was not unlike a fireplace in shape. In front of this place lay a pile of earth, which had evidently been taken from the recess, and part of which was yet fresh.' An examination of the exterior of the cavern left the judge in doubt whether it was one of nature's frolics that had thrown it into that shape, or whether it had been wrought by the hands of man at some earlier period. But there could be no doubt that the whole of the interior was of recent formation, and the marks of the pick were still visible where the soft, lead-colored rock had opposed itself to the progress of the miners. The hole formed an excavation of about twenty feet in width and nearly twice that distance in depth. The height was much greater than was required for the ordinary purposes of experiment, but this was evidently the effect of chance, as the roof of the cavern was a natural stratum of rock that projected many feet beyond the base of the pile. Immediately in front of the recess, or cave, was a little terrace partly formed by nature and partly by the earth that had been carelessly thrown aside by the laborers. The mountain fell off precipitously in front of the terrace, and the approach by its sides, under the ridge of the rocks, was difficult and a little dangerous. The hole was wild, rude, and apparently incomplete, for while looking among the bushes the sheriff found the very implements that had been used in the work. When the sheriff thought that his cousin had examined the spot sufficiently, he asked solemnly, "'Judge Temple, are you satisfied?' perfectly that there is something mysterious and perplexing in this business. It is a secret spot, and cunningly devised, Richard. Yet I see no symptoms of ore. Do you expect, sir, to find gold and silver lying like pebbles on the surface of the earth, dollars and dimes ready coined to your hands? No, no, the treasure must be sought after to be won, but let them mine. I shall countermine." The judge took an accurate survey of the place, and noted in his memorandum book such marks as were necessary to find it again in the event of Richard's absence, when the cousins returned to their horses. On reaching the highway they separated, the sheriff to summon twenty-four good men and true, to attend as the inquest of the county, on the succeeding Monday, when Marmaduke held his stated court of common pleas and general sessions of the peace and the judge to return, musing deeply on what he had seen and heard in the course of the morning. When the horse of the latter reached the spot where the highway fell toward the valley, 
The eye of Marmaduke rested, it is true, on the same scene that had, ten minutes before, been so soothing to the feelings of his daughter and her friend, as they emerged from the forest. But it rested in vacancy. He threw the reins to his sure-footed beast, and suffered the animal to travel at his own gait, while he soliloquized as follows. There may be more in this than I at first supposed. I have suffered my feelings to blind my reason, in admitting an unknown youth in this manner to my dwelling. Yet this is not the land of suspicion. I will have leather stocking before me, and by a few direct questions extract the truth from the simple old man." At that instant the judge caught a glimpse of the figures of Elizabeth and Louisa, who were slowly descending the mountain, short distance before him. He put spurs to his horse, and riding up to them dismounted, and drove his steed along the narrow path. While the agitated parent was listening to the vivid description that his daughter gave of her recent danger, and her unexpected escape, all thoughts of minds, vested rights, and examinations were absorbed in emotion. And when the image of Natty again crossed his recollection, it was not as a lawless and depredating squatter, but as the preserver of his child. End of chapter 29 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 30 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 30 the court awards it, and the law doth give it. Merchant of Venice Remarkable Pettibone, who had forgotten the wound received by her pride, in contemplation of the ease and comforts of her situation, and who still retained her station in the family of Judge Temple, was dispatched to the humble dwelling which Richard already styled the rectory, in attendance on Louisa, who was soon consigned to the arms of her father. In the meantime, Marmaduke and his daughter were closeted for more than an hour, nor shall we invade the sanctuary of parental love by relating the conversation. When the curtain rises on the reader, the judge is seen walking up and down the apartment, with a tender melancholy in his air, and his child reclining on a settee with a flushed cheek, and her dark eyes seeming to float in crystals. It was a timely rescue! "'It was indeed a timely rescue, my child,' cried the judge. "'Then thou didst not desert thy friend, my noble Bess.' "'I believe I may as well take the credit of fortitude,' said Elizabeth, "'though I much doubt if flight would have availed me anything, "'had I even courage to execute such an intention. "'But I thought not of the expedient.' "'Of what didst thou think, love?' Where did thy thoughts dwell most, at that fearful moment?" "'The beast! the beast!' cried Elizabeth, veiling her face with her hand. "'Oh, I saw nothing, I thought of nothing but the beast. I tried to think of better things. But the horror was too glaring, the danger too much before my eyes.' "'Well, well, thou art safe, and we will converse no more on the unpleasant subject. I did not think such an animal yet remained in our forests but they will stray far from their haunts when pressed by hunger, and a loud knocking at the door of the apartment interrupted what he was about to utter, and he bid the applicant enter. The door was opened by Benjamin, who came in with a discontented air, as if he felt that he had a communication to make that would be out of season. "'Here is Squire Doolittle below, sir,' commenced the major-domo. He has been standing off and on in the dooryard for the matter of a glass, and he has summit on his mind that he wants to heave up, do you see? But I tells him, says I, man, would you be coming aboard with your complaints, said I, when the judge has gotten his own child, as it were, out of the jaws of a lion? But damn the bit of manners has the fellow, any more than if he was one of them guineas down in the kitchen there. And so, as he was shearing nearer, every stretch he made toward the house, I could do no better than to let your honor know that the chap was in the offing. "'He must have business of importance,' said Marmaduke. 
something in relation to his office, most probably, as the court sits so shortly. "'Aye, aye, you have it, sir,' cried Benjamin. "'It's summat about a complaint that he has to make of the old leather-stocking, who, to my judgment, is the better man of the two. It's a very good sort of man, is this Master Bumpo. And he has a way with a spear, all the same as if he was brought up at the bow-oar of the captain's barge, or was born with a boat-hook in his hand.' "'Against the leather-stocking,' cried Elizabeth, rising from her reclining posture. "'Rest easy, my child. Some trifle, I pledge you. I believe I am already acquainted with its import. Trust me, Bess, your champion shall be safe in my care. Show Mr. Doolittle in, Benjamin.' Miss Temple appeared satisfied with this assurance, but fastened her dark eyes on the person of the architect, who profited by the permission, and instantly made his appearance. All the impatience of Hiram seemed to vanish the instant he entered the apartment. After saluting the judge and his daughter, he took the chair to which Marmaduke pointed, and sat for a minute, composing his straight black hair, with a gravity of demeanor that was intended to do honor to his official station. At length, he said, "'It's likely, from what I hear, that Miss Temple had a narrow chance with the painters on the mountain.' Marmaduke made a gentle inclination of his head, by way of assent, but continued silent. "'I suppose the law gives a bounty on the scalps,' continued Hiram, "'in which case the leather stocking will make a good job on it.' "'It shall be my care to see that he is rewarded,' returned the judge. "'Yes, yes, I rather guess that nobody hereabouts doubts the judge's generosity. "'Does he know whether the sheriff has fairly made up his mind "'to have a reading-desk or a deacon's pew under the pulpit?' "'I have not heard my cousin speak on that subject lately,' replied Marmaduke. "'I think it's likely that we will have a pretty dull court on it, from what I can gather. "'I hear that Jotham Riddell and the man who bought his betterments "'have agreed to leave their difference to men.' and I don't think there'll be more than two civil cases in the calendar. "'I am glad of it,' said the judge. "'Nothing gives me more pain than to see my settlers wasting their time and substance in the unprofitable struggles of the law. I hope it may prove true, sir.' "'I rather guess we'll be left out to men,' added Hiram, with an air equally balanced between doubt and assurance, but which Judge Temple understood to mean certainty. I some think that I am appointed a referee in the case myself. Jotham as much as told me that he should take me. The defendant, I guess, means to take Captain Hollister, and we two have partly agreed on Squire Jones for the third man. "'Are there any criminals to be tried?' asked Marmaduke. "'There's the counterfeiters,' returned the magistrate. "'As they were caught in the act, I think it likely that they'll be indicted, in which case it's probable they'll be tried.' "'Certainly, sir. I had forgotten those men. There are no more, I hope. Why, there is a threaten to come forward with an assault that happened at the last Independence Day, but I'm not certain that the law'll take hold on it. There was plaguy hard words passed, but whether they struck or not I haven't heard. There's some folks talk of a deer or two being killed out of season, over on the west side of the patent, by some of the squatters on the fractions.' "'Let a complaint be made, by all means,' said the judge. "'I am determined to see the law executed to the letter, on all such depredators.' "'Why, yes, I thought the judge was of that mind. I came partly on such a business myself.' "'You!' exclaimed Marmaduke, comprehending in an instant how completely he had been caught by the other's cunning. "'And what have you to say, sir?' I some think that Natty Bumpo has the carcass of a deer in his hut at this moment, and a considerable part of my business was to get a search warrant to examine. You think, sir, do you know that the law exacts an oath before I can issue such a precept? The habitation of a citizen is not to be idly invaded on light suspicion. I rather think I can swear to it myself, returned the immovable Hiram, and Jotham is in the street, and as good as ready to come in and make oath to the same thing. Then issue the warrant thyself. Thou art a magistrate, Mr. Doolittle. Why trouble me with the matter? Why, seeing it's the first complaint under the law, and knowing the judge set his heart on the thing, I thought it best that the authority to search should come from himself. Besides, 
as I'm much in the woods among the timber, I don't altogether like making an enemy of the leather stocking. Now the judge has a weight in the county that puts him above fear." Miss Temple turned her face to the callous architect, as she said, and what has any honest person to dread from so kind a man as Bumpo? Why, it's as easy, miss, to pull a rifle trigger on a magistrate as on a painter. But if the judge don't conclude to issue the warrant, I must go home and make it out myself. I have not refused your application, sir, said Marmaduke, perceiving at once that his reputation for impartiality was at stake. Go into my office, Mr. Doolittle, where I will join you and sign the warrant. Judge Temple stopped the remonstrances which Elizabeth was about to utter, after Hiram had withdrawn, by laying his hand on her mouth and saying, "'It is more terrible in sound than frightful in reality, my child. I suppose that the leather stocking has shot a deer, for the season is nearly over, and you say that he was hunting with his dogs when he came so timely to your assistance. But it will be only to examine his cabin and find the animal when you can pay the penalty out of your own pocket, Bess.' Nothing short of the twelve dollars and a half will satisfy this harpy, I perceive, and surely my reputation as judge is worth that trifle." Elizabeth was a good deal pacified with this assurance, and suffered her father to leave her to fulfill his promise to Hiram. When Marmaduke left his office after executing his disagreeable duty, he met Oliver Edwards walking up the graveled walk in front of the mansion house with great strides, and with a face agitated by feeling. On seeing Judge Temple, the youth turned aside, and with a warmth in his manner that was not often exhibited to Marmaduke, he cried, "'I congratulate you, sir. From the bottom of my soul I congratulate you, Judge Temple.' "'Oh, it would have been too horrid to have recollected for a moment. I have just left the hut, where, after showing me his scalps, old Natty told me of the escape of the ladies, as the thing to be mentioned last. Indeed. Indeed, sir, no words of mine can express half of what I have felt." The youth paused a moment, as if suddenly recollecting that he was overstepping prescribed limits, and concluded with a good deal of embarrassment, "'What I have felt at this danger to Miss Grant, and your daughter, sir.' But the heart of Marmaduke was too much softened to admit his cavilling at trifles, and without regarding the confusion of the other, he replied, "'I thank thee, thank thee, Oliver. As thou sayest, it is almost too horrid to be remembered. But come, let us hasten to Bess, for Louisa has already gone to the rectory." The young man sprang forward, and throwing open a door, barely permitted the judge to precede him, when he was in the presence of Elizabeth in a moment. The cold distance that often crossed the demeanour of the heiress, in her intercourse with Edwards, was now entirely banished, and two hours were passed by the party in the free, unembarrassed, and confiding manner of old and esteemed friends. Judge Temple had forgotten the suspicions engendered during his morning's ride, and the youth and maiden conversed, laughed, and were sad by turns, as impulse directed. At length Edwards, after repeating his intention to do so for the third time, left the mansion-house to go to the rectory on a similar errand of friendship. During this short period, a scene was passing at the hut that completely frustrated the benevolent intentions of Judge Temple in favor of the leather stocking, and at once destroyed the short-lived harmony between the youth and Marmaduke. When Hiram Doolittle had obtained his search warrant, his first business was to procure a proper officer to see it executed. The sheriff was absent, summoning in person the grand inquest for the county. The deputy who resided in the village was riding on the same errand, in a different part of the settlement, and the regular constable of the township had been selected for his station from motives of charity, being lame of a leg. Hiram intended to accompany the officer as a spectator, but he felt no very strong desire to bear the brunt of the battle. It was, however, Saturday, and the sun was already turning the shadows of the pines toward the east. On the morrow, the conscientious magistrate could not engage in such an expedition at the peril of his soul, and long before Monday the venison and all vestiges of the death of the deer might be secreted or destroyed. Happily the lounging form of Billy Kirby met his eye, and Hiram, at all time fruitful in similar expedients, saw his way clear at once. 
Jotham, who was associated in the whole business, and who had left the mountain in consequence of a summons from his coadjutor, but who failed, equally with Hiram, in the unfortunate particular of nerve, was directed to summon the woodchopper to the dwelling of the magistrate. When Billy appeared, he was very kindly invited to take the chair in which he had already seated himself, and was treated in all respects as if he were an equal. "'Judge Temple has set his heart on putting the deer law in force,' said Hiram, after the preliminary civilities were over, and a complaint has been laid before him that a deer has been killed. He has issued a search warrant, and sent for me to get somebody to execute it. Kirby, who had no idea of being excluded from the deliberative part of any affair in which he was engaged, drew up his bushy head in a reflecting attitude, and after musing a moment replied by asking a few questions. The sheriff has gone out of the way? Not to be found. And his deputy, too? Both gone on the skirts of the patent. But I saw the constable hobbling about town an hour ago. Yes, yes, said Hiram, with a coaxing smile and knowing nod. But this business wants a man, not a cripple. Why, said Billy, laughing, will the chap make a fight? He's a little quarrelsome at times, and thinks he's the best man in the country at rough and tumble. I heard him brag once, said Jotham, that there wasn't a man twixt the Mohawk Flats and the Pennsylvania line that was his match at a close hug. Did you? exclaimed Kirby, raising his huge frame in his seat, like a lion stretching in his lair. I rather guess he never felt a Vermonter's knuckles on his backbone. But who is the chap? Why, said Jotham, it's— It's again law to tell, interrupted Hiram, unless you'll qualify to sarve. You'll be the very man to take him, Bill, and I'll make out a special deputation in a minute when you will get the fees. "'What's the fees?' said Kirby, laying his large hand on the leaves of a statute book that Hiram had opened in order to give dignity to his office, which he turned over in his rough manner, as if he were reflecting on a subject about which he had, in truth, already decided. "'Will they pay a man for a broken head?' "'There'll be something handsome,' said Hiram. "'Damn the fees,' said Billy, again laughing. "'Does the fellow think he's the best wrestler in the county, though? "'What's his inches?' "'He's taller than you be,' said Jotham, "'and one of the biggest talkers,' he was about to add. "'But the impatience of Kirby interrupted him. "'The woodchopper had nothing fierce or even brutal in his appearance. "'The character of his expression was that of good-natured vanity.' It was evident he prided himself on the powers of the physical man, like all who have nothing better to boast of, and stretching out his broad hand, with the palm downward, he said, keeping his eyes fastened on his own bones and sinews, "'Come, give us a touch of the book. I'll swear, and you'll see that I'm a man to keep my oath.' Hiram did not give the woodchopper time to change his mind, but the oath was administered without unnecessary delay. So soon as this preliminary was completed, the three worthies left the house and proceeded by the nearest road toward the hut. They had reached the bank of the lake, and were diverging from the route of the highway, before Kirby recollected that he was now entitled to the privilege of the initiated, and repeated his question as to the name of the offender. "'Which way, which way, squire?' exclaimed the hardy woodchopper. "'I thought it was to search a house that you wanted me, not the woods.' There is nobody lives on this side of the lake for six miles, unless you count the leather stocking and old John for settlers. Come, tell me the chap's name, and I warrant me that I lead you to his clearing by a straighter path than this, for I know every sapling that grows within two miles of Templeton. This is the way, said Hiram, pointing forward and quickening his step, as if apprehensive that Kirby would desert. And Bumpo is the man. Kirby stopped short, and looked from one of his companions to the other in astonishment. He then burst into a loud laugh, and cried, "'Who? Leatherstocking? He may brag of his aim and his rifle, for he has the best of both, as I will own myself, for sin he shot the pigeon I knock under to him. But for a wrestle, why, I would take the creature between my finger and thumb, and tie him in a bow-knot around my neck for a Barcelona. The man is seventy and was never anything particular for strength. 
"'He's a deceiving man,' said Hiram, "'like all the hunters. He is stronger than he seems. Besides, he has his rifle.' "'That for his rifle!' cried Billy. "'He'd no more hurt me with his rifle than he'd fly. He's a harmless creature, and I must say that I think he has as good a right to kill deer as any man on the patent. It's his main support. And this is a free country, where a man is privileged to follow any calling he likes.' "'According to that doctrine,' said Jotham, "'anybody may shoot a deer.' "'This is the man's calling, I tell you,' returned Kirby, "'and the law was never made for such as he.' "'The law was made for all,' observed Hiram, who began to think that the danger was likely to fall to his own share, notwithstanding his management. "'And the law is particular in noticing perjury.' "'See here, Squire Doolittle,' said the reckless woodchopper, I don't care the valley of a beetlering for you and your parjury, too. But as I have come so far, I'll go down and have a talk with the old man, and maybe we'll fry a steak of the deer together." "'Well, if you can get in peaceably, so much the better,' said the magistrate. "'To my notion, strife is very unpopular. I prefer, at all times, clever conduct to an ugly temper.' As the whole party moved at a great pace, they soon reached the hut where Hiram thought it prudent to halt on the outside of the top of the fallen pine, which formed a chevaux de frise to defend the approach to the fortress on the side next the village. The delay was little relished by Kirby, who clapped his hands to his mouth and gave a loud halloo that brought the dogs out of their kennel, and almost at the same instant the scantily covered head of Natty from the door. "'Lie down, old fool!' cried the hunter. "'Do you think there's more painters about you?' Ha. Leather stocking. I've an errand with you, cried Kirby. Here's the good people of the state have been writing you a small letter, and they've hired me to ride post. What would you have with me, Billy Kirby? said Natty, stepping across the threshold, and raising his hand over his eyes to screen them from the rays of the setting sun, while he took a survey of his visitor. I've no land to clear, and heaven knows I would set out six trees afore I would cut down one. Down, Hector, I say, into your kennel with you. "'Would you, old boy?' roared Billy. "'Then so much the better for me. But I must do my errand. Here's a letter for you, Leather Stocking. If you can read it, it's all well. And if you can't, here's Squire Doolittle at hand, to let you know what it means. It seems you mistook the 20th of July for the 1st of August, that's all.' By this time Natty had discovered the lank person of Hiram, drawn up under the cover of a high stump and all that was complacent in his manner instantly gave way to marked distrust and dissatisfaction. He placed his head within the door of his hut, and said a few words in an undertone, when he again appeared and continued. "'I've nothing for you. So away, afore the evil one tempts me to do you harm. I owe you no spite, Billy Kirby. And what for should you trouble an old man who has done you no harm?' Kirby advanced through the top of the pine, to within a few feet of the hunter, where he seated himself on the end of a log, with great composure, and began to examine the nose of Hector, with whom he was familiar from their frequently meeting in the woods, where he sometimes fed the dog from his own basket of provisions. "'You've outshot me, and I'm not ashamed to say it,' said the woodchopper. "'But I don't owe you a grudge for that, Natty, though it seems you've shot once too often, for the story goes that you killed a buck.' I've fired but twice to-day, and both times at the painter's, returned the leather stocking. See, here are the scalps. I was just going in with them to the judges to ask the bounty. While Natty was speaking, he tossed the ears to Kirby, who continued playing with them with a careless air, holding them to the dogs, and laughing at their movements when they scented the unusual game. But Hiram, emboldened by the advance of the deputed constable, now ventured to approach also, and took up the discourse with the air of authority that became his commission. His first measure was to read the warrant aloud, taking care to give due emphasis to the most material parts, and concluding with the name of the judge in very audible and distinct tones. "'Did Marmaduke Temple put his name to that bit of paper?' said Natty, shaking his head. Well, well, that man loves the new ways, and his betterments, and his lands, afore his own flesh and blood. But I won't mistrust the gal. She has an eye like a full-grown buck. Poor thing, she didn't choose her father, and can't help it. I know but little of the law, Mr. Doolittle. What is to be done, now you've read your commission? 
"'Oh, it's nothing but form, Natty,' said Hiram, endeavouring to assume a friendly aspect. "'Let's go in and talk the thing over in reason. I dare to say that the money can be easily found, and I partly conclude from what passed that Judge Temple will pay it himself.' The old hunter had kept a keen eye on the movements of his three visitors from the beginning, and had maintained his position just without the threshold of the cabin, with a determined manner, that showed he was not to be easily driven from his post. When Hiram drew nigher, as if expecting his proposition would be accepted, Natty lifted his hand and motioned for him to retreat. "'Haven't I told you more than once not to tempt me?' he said. "'I trouble no man. Why can't the law lead me to myself? Go back. Go back, and tell your judge that he may keep his bounty. But I won't have his wasty ways brought into my hut.' This offer, however, instead of appeasing the curiosity of Hiram, seemed to inflame it more while Kirby cried, "'Well, that's fair, squire. He forgives the county his demand, and the county should forgive him the fine. It's what I call an even trade, and should be concluded on the spot. I like quick dealings, and what's fair twixt man and man.' "'I demand entrance into this house,' said Hiram, summoning all the dignity he could muster to his assistance. "'In the name of the people, and by virtue of this warrant, and of my office, and with this peace officer. "'Stand back, stand back, squire, and don't tempt me,' said the leather stocking, motioning him to retire with great earnestness. "'Stop us at your peril,' continued Hiram. "'Billy, Jotham, close up. I want testimony.' Hiram had mistaken the mild but determined air of Natty for submission, and had already put his foot on the threshold to enter, when he was seized unexpectedly by his shoulders and hurled over the little bank toward the lake to the distance of twenty feet. The suddenness of the movement, and the unexpected display of strength on the part of Natty, created a momentary astonishment in his invaders, that silenced all noises. But at the next instant Billy Kirby gave vent to his mirth in peals of laughter that he seemed to heave up from his very soul. <laughs> "'Well done, old Stubb!' he shouted. The squire knowed you better than I did. Come, come, here's a green spot. Take it out like men, while Jotham and I see fair play. William Kirby, I order you to do your duty, cried Hiram, from under the bank. Seize that man. I order you to seize him in the name of the people. But the leather stocking now assumed a more threatening attitude. His rifle was in his hand, and its muzzle was directed toward the woodchopper. "'Stand off, I bid you,' said Natty. "'You know my aim, Billy Kirby. "'I don't crave your blood. "'But mine and yourn both shall turn this green grass red "'afore you put foot into the hut.' "'While the affair appeared trifling, "'the woodchopper seemed disposed to take sides with the weaker party. "'But when the firearms were introduced, "'his manner very sensibly changed. "'He raised his large frame from the log, "'and facing the hunter with an open front, he replied, I didn't come here as your enemy, leather stocking, but I don't value the hollow piece of iron in your hand so much as a broken axe helve. So, squire, say the word and keep within the law, and we'll soon see who's the best man of the two. But no magistrate was to be seen. The instant the rifle was produced, Hiram and Jotham vanished. And when the woodchopper bent his eyes about him in surprise at receiving no answer, he discovered their retreating figures moving toward the village at a rate that sufficiently indicated that they had not only calculated the velocity of a rifle bullet, but also its probable range. "'You've scared the creatures off,' said Kirby, with great contempt expressed on his broad features. "'But you are not going to scare me. So, Mr. Bumpo, down with your gun, or there'll be trouble twixt us.' Natty dropped his rifle, and replied, I wish you no harm, Billy Kirby, but I leave it to yourself whether an old man's hut is to be run down by such varmint. I won't deny the buck to you, Billy, and you may take the skin in, if you please, and show it as testimony. The bounty will pay the fine, and that ought to satisfy any man. Twill, old boy, twill, cried Kirby, every shade of displeasure vanishing from his open brow at the peace offering. Throw out the hide, and that shall satisfy the law. Natty entered the hut, and soon reappeared, bringing with him the desired testimonial, and the woodchopper departed as thoroughly reconciled to the hunter as if nothing had happened. 
As he paced along the margin of the lake he would burst into frequent fits of laughter, while he recollected the Somerset of Hiram, and on the whole he thought the affair a very capital joke. Long before Billy reached the village, however, the news of his danger, and of Natty's disrespect of the law, and of Hiram's discomfiture, were in circulation. A good deal was said about sending for the sheriff. Some hints were given about calling out the posse comitatus to avenge the insulted laws, and many of the citizens were collected, deliberating how to proceed. The arrival of Billy with the skin, by removing all grounds for a search, changed the complexion of things materially. Nothing now remained but to collect the fine, and assert the dignity of the people, all of which, it was unanimously agreed, could be done as well on the succeeding Monday as on Saturday night a time kept sacred by large portion of the settlers. Accordingly, all further proceedings were suspended for six and thirty hours. End of chapter 30 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 31 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 31 And darest thou, then, to beard the lion in his den, the Douglas in his hall? Marmion The commotion was just subsiding, and the inhabitants of the village had begun to disperse from the little groups that had formed, each retiring to his own home, and closing his door after him, with the grave air of a man who consulted public feeling in his exterior deportment, when Oliver Edwards, on his return from the dwelling of Mr. Grant, encountered the young lawyer, who is known to the reader as Mr. Lippet. There was very little similarity in the manners or opinions of the two, but as they both belonged to the more intelligent class of a very small community, they were, of course, known to each other and as their meeting was at a point where silence would have been rudeness, the following conversation was the result of their interview. A fine evening, Mr. Edwards, commenced the lawyer, whose disinclination to the dialogue was, to say the least, very doubtful. We want rain, sadly. That's the worst of this climate of ours. It's either a drought or a deluge. It's likely you've been used to a more equal temperature? I am a native of this state, returned Edwards coldly. Well, I've often heard that point disputed, but it's so easy to get a man naturalized that it's of little consequence where he was born. I wonder what course the judge means to take in this business of Natty Bumpo. Of Natty Bumpo? echoed Edwards. To what do you allude, sir? Haven't you heard? exclaimed the other, with a look of surprise, so naturally assumed as completely to deceive his auditor. It may turn out an ugly business. It seems that the old man has been out in the hills, and has shot a buck this morning. And that, you know, is a criminal matter in the eyes of Judge Temple." "'Oh, he has, has he?' said Edwards, averting his face to conceal the color that collected in his sunburnt cheek. "'Well, if that be all, he must even pay the fine.' "'It's five-pound currency,' said the lawyer. Could Natty muster so much money at once?' "'Could he?' cried the youth. "'I am not rich, Mr. Lippet. Far from it. I am poor, and I have been hoarding my salary for a purpose that lies near my heart. But before that old man should lie one hour in a jail I would spend the last cent to prevent it. Besides, he has killed two panthers, and the bounty will discharge the fine many times over.' "'Yes, yes,' said the lawyer, rubbing his hands together with an expression of pleasure that had no artifice about it. We shall make it out. I see plainly we shall make it out. Make what out, sir? I must beg an explanation. Why, killing the buck is but a small matter compared to what took place this afternoon, continued Mr. Lippet, with a confidential and friendly air that won upon the youth, little as he liked the man. It seems that a complaint was made of the fact, and a suspicion that there was venison in the hut was sworn to all which is provided for in the statute, when Judge Temple granted the search warrant. 
"'A search warrant!' echoed Edwards in a voice of horror, and with a face that should have been again averted to conceal its paleness. "'And how much did they discover? What did they see?' "'They saw old Bumpo's rifle, and that is a sight which will quiet most men's curiosity in the woods.' "'Did they? Did they?' shouted Edwards, bursting into a convulsive laugh. "'So the old hero beat them back, beat them back, did he?' The lawyer fastened his eyes in astonishment on the youth, but, as his wonder gave way to the thoughts that were commonly uppermost in his mind, he replied, "'It is no laughing matter, let me tell you, sir. The forty dollars of bounty and your six months of salary will be much reduced before you can get the matter fairly settled. Assaulting a magistrate in the execution of his duty, and menacing a constable with firearms at the same time, is a pretty serious affair.' and is punishable with both fine and imprisonment. Imprisonment? repeated Oliver. Imprison the leather stocking? No, no, sir. It would bring the old man to his grave. They shall never imprison the leather stocking. Well, Mr. Edwards, said Lippet, dropping all reserve from his manner, you are called a curious man, but if you can tell me how a jury is to be prevented from finding a verdict of guilty— if this case comes fairly before them, and the proof is clear, I shall acknowledge that you know more law than I do, who have had a license in my pocket for three years." By this time the reason of Edwards was getting the ascendancy of his feelings, and, as he began to see the real difficulties of the case, he listened more readily to the conversation of the lawyer. The ungovernable emotion that escaped the youth in the first moments of his surprise entirely passed away and although it was still evident that he continued to be much agitated by what he had heard, he succeeded in yielding forced attention to the advice which the other uttered. Notwithstanding the confused state of his mind, Oliver soon discovered that most of the expedients of the lawyer were grounded in cunning, and plans that required a time to execute them that neither suited his disposition nor his necessities. After, however, giving Mr. Lippet to understand that he retained him in the event of a trial, an assurance that at once satisfied the lawyer, they parted, one taking his course with a deliberate tread in the direction of the little building that had a wooden sign over its door, with Chester Lippet, attorney at law, painted on it, and the other pacing over the ground with enormous strides toward the mansion-house. We shall take leave of the attorney for the present, and direct the attention of the reader to the client. When Edwards entered the hall, whose enormous doors were opened to the passage of the air of a mild evening, he found Benjamin engaged in some of his domestic avocations, and in a hurried voice inquired where Judge Temple was to be found. "'Why, the judge has stepped into his office, with that master carpenter, Mr. Doolittle. But Miss Lizzie is in that there parlor. I say, Master Oliver, we'd like to have had a bad job of that panther, or painter's work, some calls it one and some calls it the other but I know little of the beast, seeing that it is not a British growth. I said as much as that when I was in the hills the last winter, for I heard it moaning on the lake shore one evening in the fall, when I was pulling down from the fishing point in the skiff. Had the animal come into open water, where a man could see where and how to work his vessel, I would have engaged the thing myself. But looking aloft among the trees is all the same to me as standing on the deck of one ship and looking at another vessel's tops. I never can tell one rope from another." "'Well, well,' interrupted Edwards, "'I must see Miss Temple.' "'And you shall see her, sir,' said the steward. "'She's in this here room. Lord, Master Edwards, what a loss she'd have been to the judge! Damn me if I know where he would have gotten such another daughter, that is full grown, do you see? I say, sir, this Master Bumpo is a worthy man, and seems to have a handy way with him, with firearms and boat-hooks. I'm his friend, Master Oliver, and he and you may both set me down as the same." "'We may want your friendship, my worthy fellow,' cried Edward, squeezing his hand convulsively. "'We may want your friendship, in which case you shall know it.' Without waiting to hear the earnest reply that Benjamin meditated, the youth extricated himself from the vigorous grasp of the steward, and entered the parlour. Elizabeth was alone, and still reclining on the sofa where we last left her. A hand which exceeded all that the ingenuity of art could model, in shape and color, 
veiled her eyes, and the maiden was sitting as if in deep communion with herself. Struck by the attitude and loveliness of the form that met his eye, the young man checked his impatience, and approached her with respect and caution. "'Miss Temple! Miss Temple!' he said. "'I hope I do not intrude. But I am anxious for an interview, if it be only for a moment.' Elizabeth raised her face, and exhibited her dark eyes swimming in moisture. "'Is it you, Edwards?' she said, with a sweetness in her voice and a softness in her air, that she often used to her father, but which, from its novelty to himself, thrilled on every nerve of the youth. "'How left you our poor Louisa?' "'She is with her father, happy and grateful,' said Oliver. I never witnessed more feeling than she manifested when I ventured to express my pleasure at her escape. Miss Temple, when I first heard of your horrid situation, my feelings were too powerful for utterance, and I did not properly find my tongue until the walk to Mr. Grant's had given me time to collect myself. I believe, I do believe, I acquitted myself better there, for Miss Grant even wept at my silly speeches. For a moment Elizabeth did not reply but again veiled her eyes with her hand. The feeling that caused the action, however, soon passed away, and raising her face again to his gaze, she continued with a smile. "'Your friend, the leather-stocking, has now become my friend, Edwards. I have been thinking how I can best serve him. Perhaps you, who know his habits and his wants so well, can tell me—' "'I can!' cried the youth, with an impetuosity that startled his companion. I can, and may heaven reward you for the wish. Natty has been so imprudent as to forget the law, and has this day killed a deer. Nay, I believe I must share in the crime and the penalty, for I was an accomplice throughout. A complaint has been made to your father, and he has granted a search. I know it all, interrupted Elizabeth. I know it all. The forms of the law must be complied with, however. The search must be made, the deer found, and the penalty paid. But I must retort your own question. Have you lived so long in our family not to know us? Look at me, Oliver Edwards. Do I appear like one who would permit the man that has just saved her life to linger in a jail for so small a sum as this fine? No, no, sir. My father is a judge, but he is a man and a Christian. It is all understood, and no harm shall follow. What a load of apprehension do your declarations remove! exclaimed Edwards. He shall not be disturbed again. Your father will protect him. I have assurance, Miss Temple, that he will, and I must believe it. You may have his own, Mr. Edwards, returned Elizabeth, for here he comes to make it. But the appearance of Marmaduke, who entered the apartment, contradicted the flattering anticipations of his daughter. His brow was contracted, and his manner disturbed. Neither Elizabeth nor the youth spoke, but the judge was allowed to pace once or twice across the room without interruption, when he cried, Our plans are defeated, girl! The obstinacy of the leather-stocking has brought down the indignation of the law on his head, and it is now out of my power to avert it. How? In what manner? cried Elizabeth. The fine is nothing, surely. I did not, I could not anticipate that an old, a friendless man like him, would dare to oppose the officers of justice, interrupted the judge. I supposed that he would submit to the search, when the fine could have been paid, and the law would have been appeased but now he will have to meet its rigor. "'And what must the punishment be, sir?' asked Edwards, struggling to speak with firmness. Marmaduke turned quickly to the spot where the youth had withdrawn, and exclaimed, "'You here! I did not observe you. I know not what it will be, sir. It is not usual for a judge to decide until he has heard the testimony, and the jury have convicted. Of one thing, however, you may be assured, Mr. Edwards, it shall be whatever the law demands, notwithstanding any momentary weakness I may have exhibited, because the luckless man has been of such eminent service to my daughter. No one, I believe, doubts the sense of justice which Judge Temple entertains, returned Edwards bitterly. But let us converse calmly, sir. Will not the years, the habits, nay, the ignorance of my old friend avail him anything against this charge? Ought they? They may extenuate, but can they acquit? Would any society be tolerable, young man, where the ministers of justice are to be opposed by men armed with rifles? 
Is it for this that I have tamed the wilderness? Had you tamed the beasts that so lately threatened the life of Miss Temple, sir, your arguments would apply better. Edwards! exclaimed Elizabeth. Peace, my child, interrupted the father. The youth is unjust, but I have not given him cause. I overlook thy remark, Oliver, for I know thee to be the friend of Natty, and zeal in his behalf has overcome thy discretion. Yes, he is my friend, cried Edwards, and I glory in the title. He is simple, unlettered, even ignorant, prejudiced perhaps, though I feel that his opinion of the world is too true. But he has a heart, Judge Temple, that would atone for a thousand faults. He knows his friends, and never deserts them, even if it be his dog. This is a good character, Mr. Edwards, returned Marmaduke mildly, but I have never been so fortunate as to secure his esteem, for to me he has been uniformly repulsive. Yet I have endured it, as an old man's whim. However, when he appears before me as his judge, he shall find that his former conduct shall not aggravate, any more than his recent services shall extenuate, his crime. Crime! echoed Edwards. Is it a crime to drive a prying miscreant from his door? Crime! Oh, no, sir. If there be a criminal involved in this affair, it is not he. And who may it be, sir? asked Judge Temple, facing the agitated youth, his features settled to their usual composure. This appeal was more than the young man could bear. Hitherto he had been deeply agitated by his emotions, but now the volcano burst its boundaries. Who? And this to me, he cried. Ask your own conscience, Judge Temple. Walk to that door, sir, and look out upon the valley, that placid lake, and those dusky mountains, and say to your own heart, if heart you have, whence came these riches, this vale, those hills, and why am I their owner? I should think, sir, that the appearance of Mohegan and the leather stocking, stalking through the country, impoverished and forlorn, would wither your sight. Marmaduke heard this burst of passion, at first, with deep amazement, but when the youth had ended he beckoned to his impatient daughter for silence, and replied, "'Oliver Edwards, thou forgettest in whose presence thou standest. I have heard, young man, that thou claimest descent from the native owners of the soil, but surely thy education has been given thee to no effect, if it has not taught thee the validity of the claims that have transferred the title to the whites.' These lands are mine by the very grants of thy ancestry, if thou art so descended. And I appeal to heaven for a testimony of the uses I have put them to. After this language we must separate. I have too long sheltered thee in my dwelling, but the time has arrived when thou must quit it. Come to my office, and I will discharge the debt I owe thee. Neither shall thy present intemperate language mar thy future fortunes, if thou wilt hearken to the advice of one who is by many years thy senior." The ungovernable feeling that caused the violence of the youth had passed away, and he stood gazing after the retiring figure of Marmaduke, with a vacancy in his eye that denoted the absence of his mind. At length he recollected himself, and turning his head slowly around the apartment, he beheld Elizabeth, still seated on the sofa but with her head dropped on her bosom, and her face again concealed by her hands. "'Miss Temple,' he said, all violence had left his manner. "'Miss Temple, I have forgotten myself, forgotten you. You have heard what your father has decreed, and this night I leave here. With you, at least, I would part in amity.' Elizabeth slowly raised her face, across which a momentary expression of sadness stole. But as she left her seat, her dark eyes lighted with their usual fire, her cheek flushed to burning, and her whole air seemed to belong to another nature. "'I forgive you, Edwards, and my father will forgive you,' she said, when she reached the door. "'You do not know us, but the time may come when your opinions shall change.' "'Of you? Never,' interrupted the youth. "'I—I I would speak, sir, and not listen. There is something in this affair that I do not comprehend. But tell the leather-stocking he has friends as well as judges in us. Do not let the old man experience unnecessary uneasiness at this rupture. It is impossible that you could increase his claims here. Neither shall they be diminished by anything you have said. Mr. Edwards, I wish you happiness and warmer friends. 
The youth would have spoken, but she vanished from the door so rapidly that when he reached the hall her form was nowhere to be seen. He paused a moment in stupor, and then rushing from the house, instead of following Marmaduke in his office, he took his way directly for the cabin of the hunters. End of chapter 31 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 32 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 32 Who measured earth, described the starry spheres, and traced the long records of lunar years. Pope Richard did not return from the exercise of his official duties until late in the evening of the following day. It had been one portion of his business to superintend the arrest of part of a gang of counterfeiters, that had, even at that early period, buried themselves in the woods to manufacture their base coin, which they afterward circulated from one end of the Union to the other. The expedition had been completely successful, and about midnight the sheriff entered the village at the head of a posse of deputies and constables, in the center of whom rode pinioned four of the malefactors. At the gate of the mansion-house they separated, Mr. Jones directing his assistants to proceed with their charge to the county jail, while he pursued his own way up the gravel walk, with the kind of self-satisfaction that a man of his organization would feel, who had really for once done a very clever thing. Hola. "'Aggie!' shouted the sheriff, when he reached the door. "'Where are you, you black dog? Will you keep me here in the dark all night? Hola! Aggie! Brave! Brave! Hoy! Hoy! Where have you got to, Brave? Off his watch. Everybody is asleep but myself. Poor I must keep my eyes open that others may sleep in safety. Brave! Brave! Well, I will say this for the dog, lazy as he's grown, that it is the first time I ever knew him to let any one come to the door after dark without having a smell to know whether it was an honest man or not. He could tell by his nose, almost as well as I could myself, by looking at them. Hola! You! Agamemnon! Where are you? Oh! Here comes the dog at last! By this time the sheriff had dismounted, and observed a form which he supposed to be that of Brave slowly creeping out of the kennel, when, to his astonishment, it reared itself on two legs instead of four, and he was able to distinguish by the starlight the curly head and dark visage of the negro. "'Ha! Huh. What the devil are you doing there, you black rascal?' he cried. Is it not hot enough for your guinea blood in the house this warm night, but you must drive out the poor dog and sleep in his straw?" By this time the boy was quite awake, and with a blubbering whine he attempted to reply to his master. "'Oh, Massa Richard! Massa Richard! Such a ting! Such a ting! I never tink it could happen! Never tink he die! Oh, Laura Gar! Ain't bury! Keep him till Massa Richard get back! Got a grave dug! Here the feelings of the negro completely got the mastery, and instead of making any intelligible explanation of the causes of his grief, he blubbered aloud. "'Eh! What? Buried! Grave! Dead!' exclaimed Richard, with a tremor in his voice. "'Nothing serious! Nothing has happened to Benjamin, I hope!' "'I know he has been bilious, but I gave him—' "'Oh, worser and dat! Worser and dat!' sobbed the negro. "'Oh, Delore! Miss Lizzie and Miss Grant walk mountain poor bravey kill a lady painter oh lor lor natty bumpo tear he throat open come a see massa richard here he be here he be as all this was perfectly inexplicable to the sheriff he was very glad to wait patiently until the black brought a lantern from the kitchen when he followed aggie to the kennel where he beheld poor brave, indeed, lying in his blood, stiff and cold, but decently covered with the great coat of the negro. He was on the point of demanding an explanation, but the grief of the black, who had fallen asleep on his voluntary watch, having burst out afresh on his waking, utterly disqualified the lad from giving one. Luckily, 
At this moment the principal door of the house opened, and the coarse features of Benjamin were thrust over the threshold, with a candle elevated above them, shedding its dim rays around in such a manner as to exhibit the lights and shadows of his countenance. Richard threw his bridle to the black, and bidding him look to the horse, he entered the hall. "'What is the meaning of the dead dog?' he cried. "'Where is Miss Temple?' Benjamin made one of his square gestures, with the thumb of his left hand pointing over his right shoulder, as he answered, "'Turned in.' "'Judge Temple, where is he?' "'In his berth.' "'But explain. Why is Brave dead? And what is the cause of Aggie's grief?' "'Why, it's all down, squire,' said Benjamin, pointing to a slate that lay on the table by the side of a mug of toddy, a short pipe in which the tobacco was yet burning, and a prayer-book. Among the other pursuits of Richard, he had a passion to keep a register of all passing events, and his diary, which was written in the manner of a journal or log-book, embraced not only such circumstances as affected himself, but observations on the weather, and all the occurrences of the family, and frequently of the village. Since his appointment to the office of sheriff, and his consequent absences from home, he had employed Benjamin to make memoranda on a slate, of whatever might be thought worth remembering, which on his return were regularly transferred to the journal with proper notations of the time, manner, and other little particulars. There was, to be sure, one material objection to the clerkship of Benjamin, which the ingenuity of no one but Richard could have overcome. The steward read nothing but his prayer-book, and that only in particular parts, and by the aid of a good deal of spelling, and some misnomers. But he could not form a single letter with a pen. This would have been an insuperable bar to journalizing with most men. But Richard invented a kind of hieroglyphical character which was intended to note all the ordinary occurrences of a day, such as how the wind blew, whether the sun shone, or whether it rained, the hours, etc. And for the extraordinary, after giving certain elementary lectures on the subject, the sheriff was obliged to trust to the ingenuity of the major-domo. The reader will at once perceive that it was to this chronicle that Benjamin pointed, instead of directly answering the sheriff's interrogatory. When Mr. Jones had drunk a glass of toddy, he brought forth from its secret place his proper journal, and, seating himself by the table, he prepared to transfer the contents of the slate to the paper, at the same time that he appeased his curiosity. Benjamin laid one hand on the back of the sheriff's chair, in a familiar manner, while he kept the other at liberty to make use of a forefinger, that was bent like some of his own characters, as an index to point out his meaning. The first thing referred to by the sheriff was a diagram of a compass cut in one corner of the slate for permanent use. The cardinal points were plainly marked on it, and all the usual divisions were indicated in such a manner that no man who had ever steered a ship could mistake them. "'Oh,' said the sheriff, seating himself down comfortably in his chair, "'you'd the wind southeast, I see. All last night I thought it would have blown up rain.' "'Devil the drop, sir,' said Benjamin. "'I believe that the scuttle-butt up aloft is emptied, for there hasn't so much water fell in the country for the last three weeks as would float Indian John's canoe, and that draws just one inch nothing, light. "'Well, but didn't the wind change here this morning? There was a change where I was.' "'To be sure it did, squire. And haven't I logged it as a shift of wind?' "'I don't see where, Benjamin, don't see,' interrupted the steward, a little crustily. "'Ain't there a mark again east and by north, half north, with summit like a rising sun at the end of it, to show twas in the morning watch?' "'Yes, yes, that is very legible. But where is the change noted?' "'Where? Why doesn't it see this here tea-kettle, with a mark run from the spout straight, or mayhap a little crooked or so, into west and by south half south?' Now I call this a shift of wind, squire. Well, do you see this here boar's head that you made for me alongside of the compass? Ay, ay, Boreas, I see. Why, you've drawn lines from its mouth, extending from one of your marks to the other. It's no fault of mine, squire Dickens. Tis your damned climate. The wind has been at all them there marks this very day, 
and that's all round the compass, except a little matter of an Irishman's hurricane at Meridium, which you'll find marked right up and down. Now, I've known a sou'wester blow for three weeks in the channel, with a clean drizzle, in which you might wash your face and hands without the trouble of hauling in water from alongside. "'Very well, Benjamin,' said the sheriff, writing in his journal. "'I believe I have caught the idea. Oh, here's a cloud over the rising sun, so you had it hazy in the morning.' "'Aye, aye, sir,' said Benjamin. "'Ah, it's Sunday, and here are the marks for the length of the sermon. One, two, three, four. What? Did Mr. Grant preach forty minutes?' "'Aye, some it like it.' It was a good half-hour by my own glass, and then there was the time lost in turning it, and some little allowance for leeway and not being over-smart about it. Benjamin, this is as long as a Presbyterian. You never could have been ten minutes in turning the glass. Why, do you see, Squire, the parson was very solemn, and I just closed my eyes in order to think the better with myself, just the same as you'd put in the deadlights to make all snug and when I opened them again I found the congregation were getting under way for home, so I calculated the ten minutes would cover the leeway after the glass was out. It was only some such matter as a cat's nap. Oh, ho! Master Benjamin, you were asleep, were you? But I'll set down no such slander against an orthodox divine. Richard wrote twenty-nine minutes in his journal, and continued, Why, what's this you've got opposite ten o'clock a.m.? A full moon! Had you a moon visible by day? I have heard of such portents before now, but— eh, What's this alongside of it? An hourglass? That, said Benjamin, looking coolly over the sheriff's shoulder, and rolling the tobacco about in his mouth with a jocular air, why, that's a small matter of my own. It's no moon, squire, but only Betty Hollister's face. For do you see, sir, hearing all the same as if she had got up a new cargo of Jamaica from the river, I called in as I was going to the church this morning. Ten a.m. was it, just the time, and tried a glass. And so I logged it, to put me in mind of calling to pay her like an honest man. That was it, was it, said the sheriff, with some displeasure at this innovation on his memoranda. And could you not make a better glass than this? It looks like a death's head and an hourglass. Why, as I liked the stuff, squire, returned the steward, I turned in, homeward bound, and took the other glass, which I set down at the bottom of the first, and that gives the thing the shape it has. But as I was there again to-night, and paid for the three at once, your honour may as well run the sponge over the whole business." "'I will buy you a slate for your own affairs, Benjamin,' said the sheriff. I don't like to have the journal marked over in this manner." "'You needn't. You needn't, squire. For seeing that I was likely to trade often with the woman while this barrel lasted, I've opened a fair account with Betty, and she keeps her marks on the back of her bar door, and I keeps the tally on this here bit of a stick." As Benjamin concluded, he produced a piece of wood on which five very large honest notches were apparent. The sheriff cast his eyes on this new ledger for a moment, and continued. "'What have we here? Saturday, 2 p.m. Why, here's a whole family piece, two wine-glasses upside down. That's two women. The one this away is Miss Lizzie, and the other is the parson's young'un." "'Cousin Bess and Miss Grant!' exclaimed the sheriff in amazement. "'What have they to do with my journal? They'd enough to do to get out of the jaws of that there painter or panther,' said the immovable steward. "'This here thingamy, squire, that maybe looks summat like a rat, is the beast, do you see?' And this here to other thing, keel uppermost, is poor old Brave, who died nobly, all the same as an admiral, fighting for his king and country. And that there— Scarecrow, interrupted Richard. Ay, mayhap it do look a little wild or so, continued the steward. But to my judgment, squire, it's the best image I've made, seeing it's most like the man himself. Well, that's Natty Bumpo, who shot this here painter, that killed that there dog, who would have eaten or done worse to them there— young ladies. "'And what the devil does all this mean?' cried Richard impatiently. "'Mean!' echoed Benjamin. "'It is as true as the Bodishi's log-book.' He was interrupted by the sheriff, who put a few direct questions to him that obtained more intelligible answers. 
by which means he became possessed of a tolerably correct idea of the truth. When the wonder, and we must do Richard the justice to say, the feelings also, that were created by this narrative, had in some degree subsided, the sheriff turned his eyes again on his journal, where more inexplicable hieroglyphics met his view. "'What have we here?' he cried. Two men boxing. Has there been a breach of the peace? Ah, that's the way, the moment my back is turned. That's the judge, and young Master Edwards, interrupted the steward, very cavalierly. How? Duke fighting with Oliver? What the devil has got into you all? More things have happened within the last thirty-six hours than in the preceding six months. Yes, it's so indeed, squire, returned the steward. I've known a smart chase, and a fight at the tail of it, where less has been logged than I've got on that there slate. Howsomever, they didn't come to facers, only passed a little jaw fore and aft. "'Explain, explain,' cried Richard. "'It was about the mines. Ha! Ay, ay, I see it, I see it. Here is a man with a pick on his shoulder. So you heard it all, Benjamin.' "'Why, yes, it was about their minds, I believe, squire,' returned the steward, "'and by what I can learn they spoke them pretty plainly to one another. "'Indeed, I may say that I overheard a small matter of it myself, "'seeing that the windows was open, and I hard by. "'But this here is no pick, but an anchor on a man's shoulder. "'And here's the other fluke down his back, maybe a little too close, "'which signifies that the lad has got under way and left his moorings.' "'Has Edwards left the house?' "'He has.' Richard pursued this advantage, and after a long and close examination he succeeded in getting out of Benjamin all that he knew, not only concerning the misunderstanding, but of the attempt to search the hut, and Hiram's discomfiture. The sheriff was no sooner possessed of these facts, which Benjamin related with all possible tenderness to the leather stocking, then, snatching up his hat, and bidding the astonished steward secure the doors and go to his bed, he left the house. For at least five minutes, after Richard disappeared, Benjamin stood with his arms akimbo, and his eyes fastened on the door, when, having collected his astonished faculties, he prepared to execute the orders he had received. It has been already said that the Court of Common Pleas and General Sessions of the Peace— or as it is commonly called the county court, over which Judge Temple presided, held one of its stated sessions on the following morning. The attendants of Richard were officers who had come to the village as much to discharge their usual duties at this court as to escort the prisoners, and the sheriff knew their habits too well not to feel confident that he should find most, if not all of them, in the public room of the jail, discussing the qualities of the keeper's liquors. Accordingly, he held his way through the silent streets of the village, directly to the small and insecure building that contained all the unfortunate debtors and some of the criminals of the county, and where justice was administered to such unwary applicants as were so silly as to throw away two dollars in order to obtain one from their neighbors. The arrival of four malefactors in the custody of a dozen officers was an event at that day in Templeton, and when the sheriff reached the jail, he found every indication that his subordinates intended to make a night of it. The nod of the sheriff brought two of his deputies to the door, who, in their turn, drew off six or seven of the constables. With this force, Richard led the way through the village, toward the bank of the lake, undisturbed by any noise except the barking of one or two curs, who were alarmed by the measured tread of the party, and by the low murmurs that ran through their own numbers as a few cautious questions and answers were exchanged relative to the object of their expedition. When they had crossed the little bridge of hewn logs that was thrown over the Susquehanna, they left the highway, and struck into that field which had been the scene of the victory over the pigeons. From this they followed their leader into the low bushes of pines and chestnuts which had sprung up along the shores of the lake, where the plough had not succeeded the fall of the trees, and soon entered the forest itself. Here Richard paused and collected his troop around him. "'I have required your assistance, my friends,' he cried in a low voice, in order to arrest Nathaniel Bumpo, commonly called the Leather Stocking. He has assaulted a magistrate, and resisted the execution of a search warrant by threatening the life of a constable with his rifle. In short, my friends, he has set an example of rebellion to the laws, 
and has become a kind of outlaw. He is suspected of other misdemeanors and offenses against private rights, and I have this night taken on myself, by the virtue of my office as sheriff, to arrest the said Bumpo, and bring him to the county jail, that he may be present and forthcoming to answer to these heavy charges before the court to-morrow morning. In executing this duty, friends and fellow-citizens, you are to use courage and discretion. Courage, that you may not be daunted by any lawless attempt that this man may make with his rifle and his dogs to oppose you, and discretion, which here means caution and prudence, that he may not escape from this sudden attack, and for other good reasons that I need not mention. You will form yourselves in a complete circle around his hut, and at the word advance, called aloud by me, you will rush forward, and, without giving the criminal time for deliberation, enter his dwelling by force, and make him your prisoner. Spread yourselves for this purpose, while I shall descend to the shore with a deputy, to take charge of that point, and all communications must be made directly to me under the bank in front of the hut, where I shall station myself and remain, in order to receive them. This speech, which Richard had been studying during his walk, had the effect that all similar performances produce, of bringing the dangers of the expedition immediately before the eyes of his forces. The men divided, some plunging deeper into the forest in order to gain their stations without giving an alarm, and others continuing to advance at a gate that would allow the whole party to go in order, but all devising the best plan to repulse the attack of a dog, or to escape a rifle bullet. It was a moment of dread expectation and interest. When the sheriff thought time enough had elapsed for the different divisions of his force to arrive at their stations, he raised his voice in the silence of the forest, and shouted the watchword. The sounds played among the arched branches of the trees in hollow cadences, but when the last sinking tone was lost on the ear, in place of the expected howls of the dogs no other noises were returned but the crackling of torn branches and dried sticks, as they yielded before the advancing steps of the officers. Even this soon ceased, as if by a common consent, when the curiosity and impatience of the sheriff getting the complete ascendancy over discretion, he rushed up the bank, and in a moment stood on the little piece of cleared ground in front of the spot where Natty had so long lived. To his amazement, in place of the hut, he saw only its smoldering ruins. The party gradually drew together about the heap of ashes and the ends of smoking logs, while a dim flame in the center of the ruin, which still found fuel to feed its lingering life, threw its pale light, flickering with the passing currents of the air around the circle, now showing a face with eyes fixed in astonishment, and then glancing to another countenance, leaving the former shaded in the obscurity of night. Not a voice was raised in inquiry nor an exclamation made in astonishment. The transition from excitement to disappointment was too powerful for speech, and even Richard lost the use of an organ that was seldom known to fail him. The whole group were yet in the fullness of their surprise, when a tall form stalked from the gloom into the circle, treading down the hot ashes and dying embers with callous feet, and standing over the light, lifted his cap, and exposed the bare head and weather-beaten features of the leather-stocking. For a moment he gazed at the dusky figures who surrounded him, more in sorrow than in anger, before he spoke. "'What would ye with an old and helpless man?' he said. "'You've driven God's creatures from the wilderness, where his providence had put them for his own pleasure. And you've brought in the troubles and diviltries of the law, where no man was ever known to disturb another. You have driven me, that have lived forty long years of my appointed time in this very spot, from my home and the shelter of my head, lest you should put your wicked feet and wasty ways in my cabin. You've driven me to burn these logs, under which I've eaten and drunk, the first of heaven's gifts and the other of the pure springs, for the half of a hundred years, and to mourn the ashes under my feet, as a man would weep and mourn for the children of his body. You've rankled the heart of an old man, that has never harmed you or yourn, with bitter feelings toward his kind at a time when his thoughts should be on a better world. And you've driven him to wish that the beasts of the forest, who never feast on the blood of their own families, was his kindred and race. 
and now, when he has come to see the last brand of his hut before it is incited into ashes, you follow him up, at midnight, like hungry hounds on the track of a worn-out and dying deer. What more would you have? For I am here, one too many. I come to mourn, not to fight, and, if it is God's pleasure, work your will on me." When the old man ended, he stood, with the light glimmering around his thinly covered head, looking earnestly at the group which receded from the pile with an involuntary movement, without the reach of the quivering rays, leaving a free passage for his retreat into the bushes, where pursuit in the dark would have been fruitless. Natty seemed not to regard this advantage, but stood facing each individual in the circle in succession, as if to see who would be the first to arrest him. After a pause of a few moments Richard began to rally his confused faculties, and, advancing, apologized for his duty, and made him his prisoner. The party flow collected, and preceded by the sheriff, with Natty in their centre, they took their way toward the village. During the walk, Diverse questions were put to the prisoner concerning his reasons for burning the hut, and whither Mohegan had retreated. But to all of them he observed a profound silence, until, fatigued with their previous duties and the lateness of the hour, the sheriff and his followers reached the village, and dispersed to their several places of rest, after turning the key of a jail on the aged and apparently friendless leather-stocking. End of chapter 32 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 33 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 33 Fetch here the stocks, ho! You stubborn ancient knave, you reverend braggart, we'll teach you. Lear The long days and early sun of July allowed time for a gathering of the interested, before the little bell of the academy announced that the appointed hour had arrived for administering right to the wronged, and punishment to the guilty. Ever since the dawn of day, the highways and wood-paths that, issuing from the forests and winding among the sides of the mountains centered in Templeton, had been thronged with equestrians and footmen, bound to the haven of justice. There was to be seen a well-clad yeoman, mounted on a sleek, switch-tailed steed, rambling along the highway, with his red face elevated in a manner that said, I have paid for my land, and fear no man while his bosom was swelling with the pride of being one of the grand inquest for the county. At his side rode a companion, his equal in independence of feeling, perhaps, but his inferior in thrift, as in property and consideration. This was a professed dealer in lawsuits, a man whose name appeared in every calendar, whose substance, gained in the multifarious expedients of a settler's changeable habits, was wasted in feeding the harpies of the courts. He was endeavouring to impress the mind of the grand juror with the merits of a cause now at issue. Along with these was a pedestrian, who, having thrown a rifle-frock over his shirt, and placed his best wool hat above his sunburnt visage, had issued from his retreat in the woods by a footpath, and was striving to keep company with the others on his way to hear and to decide the disputes of his neighbors, as a petty juror. Fifty similar little knots of countrymen might have been seen, on that morning, journeying toward the Shire town on the same errand. By ten o'clock the streets of the village were filled with busy faces, some talking of their private concerns, some listening to a popular expounder of political creeds, and others gaping in at the open stores, admiring the finery, or examining scythes, axes, and such other manufactures as attracted their curiosity or excited their admiration. A few women were in the crowd, mostly carrying infants, and followed at a lounging, listless gait by their rustic lords and masters. There was one young couple in whom connubial love was yet fresh, walking at a respectful distance from each other while the swain directed the timid steps of his bride by a gallant offering of a thumb. At the first stroke of the bell Richard issued from the door of the bold dragoon, 
flourishing a sheathed sword that he was fond of saying his ancestors had carried in one of Cromwell's victories, and crying in an authoritative tone to clear the way for the court. The order was obeyed promptly, though not servilely, the members of the crowd nodding familiarly to the members of the procession as it passed. A party of constables, with their staves, followed the sheriff, preceding Marmaduke and four plain, grave-looking yeomen, who were his associates on the bench. There was nothing to distinguish these subordinate judges from the better part of the spectators, except gravity, which they affected a little more than common, and that one of their number was attired in an old-fashioned military coat, with skirts that reached no lower than the middle of his thighs, and bearing two little silver epaulets, not half so big as a modern pair of shoulder-knots. This gentleman was a colonel of the militia, in attendance on a court-martial, who found leisure to steal a moment from his military to attend to his civil jurisdiction. But this incongruity excited neither notice nor comment. Three or four clean-shaved lawyers followed, as meek as if they were lambs going to the slaughter. One or two of their number had contrived to obtain an air of scholastic gravity by wearing spectacles. The rear was brought up by another posse of constables, and the mob followed the whole into the room where the court held its sitting. The edifice was composed of a basement of squared logs, perforated here and there with small grated windows, through which a few wistful faces were gazing at the crowd without. Among the captives were the guilty, downcast countenances of the counterfeiters, and the simple but honest features of the leather stocking. The dungeons were to be distinguished externally from the debtors' apartments only by the size of the apertures, the thickness of the grates, and by the heads of the spikes that were driven into the logs as a protection against the illegal use of edge-tools. The upper story was of framework, regularly covered with boards, and contained one room decently fitted up for the purpose of justice. A bench, raised on a narrow platform to the height of a man above the floor, and protected in front by a light railing, ran along one of its sides. In the center was a seat furnished with rude arms, that was always filled by the presiding judge. In front, on a level with the floor of the room, was a large table covered with green bays, and surrounded by benches, and at either of its ends were rows of seats, rising one over the other for jury boxes. Each of these divisions was surrounded by a railing. The remainder of the room was an open square, appropriated to the spectators. When the judges were seated, the lawyers had taken possession of the table, and the noise of moving feet had ceased in the area, the proclamations were made in the usual form, the jurors were sworn, the charge was given, and the court proceeded to hear the business before them. We shall not detain the reader with a description of the captious discussions that occupied the court for the first two hours. Judge Temple had impressed on the jury, in his charge, the necessity for dispatch on their part recommending to their notice from motives of humanity the prisoners in the jail as the first objects of their attention accordingly after the period we have mentioned had elapsed the cry of the officer to clear the way for the grand jury announced the entrance of that body the usual forms were observed when the foreman handed up to the bench two bills on both of which the judge observed at the first glance of his eye the name of nathaniel bumpo it was a leisure moment with the court. Some low whispering passed between the bench and the sheriff, who gave a signal to his officers, and in a very few minutes the silence that prevailed was interrupted by a general movement in the outer crowd, when presently the leather stocking made his appearance, ushered into the criminal's bar under the custody of two constables. The hum ceased, the people closed into the open space again, and the silence soon became so deep that the hard breathing of the prisoner was audible. Natty was dressed in his buckskin garments, without his coat, in place of which he wore only a shirt of coarse linen cheek, fastened at his throat by the sinew of a deer, leaving his red neck and weather-beaten face exposed and bare. It was the first time that he had ever crossed the threshold of a court of justice, and curiosity seemed to be strongly blended with his personal feelings. He raised his eyes to the bench, thence to the jury-boxes, the bar, and the crowd without, meeting everywhere looks fastened on himself. After surveying his own person as searching the cause of this unusual attraction, 
he once more turned his face around the assemblage, and opened his mouth in one of his silent and remarkable laughs. "'Prisoner, remove your cap,' said Judge Temple. The order was either unheard or unheeded. "'Nathaniel Bumpo, be uncovered,' repeated the judge. Natty started at the sound of his name, and raising his face earnestly toward the bench, he said, Anon. Mr. Lippet arose from his seat at the table, and whispered in the ear of the prisoner, when Natty gave him a nod of assent, and took the deerskin covering from his head. Mr. District Attorney, said the judge, the prisoner is ready. We wait for the indictment. The duties of public prosecutor were discharged by Dirk van der School, who adjusted his spectacles, cast a cautious look around him at his brethren of the bar, which he ended by throwing his head aside so as to catch one glance over the glasses, when he proceeded to read the bill aloud. It was the usual charge for an assault and battery on the person of Hiram Doolittle, and was couched in the ancient language of such instruments, a special care having been taken by the scribe not to omit the name of a single offensive weapon known to the law. When he had done, Mr. Van der School removed his spectacles, which he closed and placed in his pocket, seemingly for the pleasure of again opening and replacing them on his nose. After this evolution was repeated once or twice, he handed the bill over to Mr. Lippet, with a cavalier air, that said as much as, "'Pick a hole in that if you can.'" Natty listened to the charge with great attention, leaning forward toward the reader with an earnestness that denoted his interest and when it was ended he raised his tall body to the utmost, and drew a long sigh. All eyes were turned to the prisoner, whose voice was vainly expected to break the stillness of the room. "'You have heard the presentment that the grand jury have made, Nathaniel Bumpo,' said the judge. "'What do you plead to the charge?' The old man drooped his head for a moment, in a reflecting attitude, and then raising it he laughed before he answered, that I handled the man a little rough or so is not to be denied, but that there was occasion to make use of all the things that the gentleman has spoken of is downright untrue. I am not much of a wrestler, seeing that I am getting old, but I was out among the Scotch-Irishers, let me see, it must have been as long ago as the first year of the old war—' "'Mr. Lippet, if you are retained for the prisoner,' interrupted Judge Temple, instruct your client how to plead. If not, the court will assign him counsel. Aroused from studying the indictment by this appeal, the attorney got up, and after a short dialogue with the hunter in a low voice, he informed the court that they were ready to proceed. "'Do you plead guilty or not guilty?' said the judge. "'I may say not guilty with a clean conscience,' returned Natty, "'for there's no guilt in doing what's right, and I'd rather die down the spot than had him put foot in the hut at that moment." Richard started at this declaration, and bent his eyes significantly on Hiram, who returned the look with a slight movement of his eyebrows. "'Proceed to open the cause, Mr. District Attorney,' continued the judge. "'Mr. Clerk, enter the plea of not guilty.' After a short opening address from Mr. Van der School, Hiram was summoned to the bar to give his testimony. It was delivered to the letter, perhaps, but with all that moral coloring which can be conveyed under such expressions as, thinking no harm, feeling it my bounden duty as a magistrate, and seeing that the constable was backward in the business. When he had done, and the district attorney declined putting any further interrogatories, Mr. Lippet arose with an air of keen investigation, and asked the following questions. "'Are you a constable of this county, sir?' "'No, sir,' said Hiram. "'I'm only a justice peace.' "'I ask you, Mr. Doolittle, in the face of this court, putting it to your conscience and your knowledge of the law, whether you had any right to enter that man's dwelling.' "'Hm,' said Hiram, undergoing a violent struggle between his desire for vengeance and his love of legal fame. "'I do suppose that in—that is, strict law—' that supposing maybe I hadn't a real lawful right, but as the case was, and Billy was so backward, I thought I might come forward in the business. 
"'I ask you again, sir,' continued the lawyer, following up his success, "'whether this old, this friendless old man, did or did not repeatedly forbid your entrance.' "'Why, I must say,' said Hiram, "'that he was considerable cross-grained. Not what I call clever, seeing that it was only one neighbor wanting to go into the house of another. Oh, then you own it was only meant for a neighborly visit on your part and without the sanction of law. Remember, gentlemen, the words of the witness, one neighbor wanting to enter the house of another. Now, sir, I ask you if Nathaniel Bumpo did not again and again order you not to enter. There was some words passed between us, said Hiram, but I read the warrant to him aloud. I repeat my question. Did he tell you not to enter his habitation? There was a good deal passed betwixt us, but I've the warrant in my pocket. Maybe the court would wish to see it? Witness, said Judge Temple, answer the question directly. Did or did not the prisoner forbid your entering his hut? "'Why, I some think answer without equivocation,' continued the judge sternly. "'He did. "'And did you attempt to enter after his order?' "'I did. "'But the warrant was in my hand. "'Proceed, Mr. Lippet, with your examination.' "'But the attorney saw that the impression was in favor of his client, "'and waving his hand with a supercilious manner, as if unwilling to insult the understanding of the jury with any further defense, he replied, "'No, sir. I leave it for your honor to charge. I rest my case here.' "'Mr. District Attorney,' said the judge, "'have you anything to say?' Mr. Vanderschool removed his spectacles, folded them, and, replacing them once more on his nose, eyed the other bill which he held in his hand and then said, looking at the bar over the top of his glasses, I shall rest the prosecution here, if the court please. Judge Temple arose and began the charge. Gentlemen of the jury, he said, you have heard the testimony, and I shall detain you but a moment. If an officer meet with resistance in the execution of a process, he has an undoubted right to call any citizen to his assistance, and the acts of such assistant come within the protection of the law. I shall leave you to judge, gentlemen, from the testimony, how far the witness in this prosecution can be so considered, feeling less reluctance to submit the case thus informally to your decision, because there is yet another indictment to be tried, which involves heavier charges against the unfortunate prisoner. The tone of Marmaduke was mild and insinuating and, as his sentiments were given with such apparent impartiality, they did not fail of carrying due weight with the jury. The grave-looking yeomen who composed this tribunal laid their heads together for a few minutes, without leaving the box. When the foreman arose, and after the forms of the court were duly observed, he pronounced the prisoner to be not guilty. "'You are acquitted of this charge, Nathaniel Bumpo,' said the judge. "'Anon,' said Natty you are found not guilty of striking and assaulting Mr. Doolittle. "'No, no, I'll not deny but that I took him a little roughly by the shoulders,' said Natty, looking about him with great simplicity, and that I—' "'You are acquitted,' interrupted the judge, and there is nothing further to be said or done in the matter." A look of joy lighted up the features of the old man, who now comprehended the case, and, placing his cap eagerly on his head again, he threw up the bar of his little prison, and said feelingly, I must say this for you, Judge Temple, that the law has not been so hard on me as I dreaded. I hope God will bless you for the kind things you've done to me this day." But the staff of the constable was opposed to his egress, and Mr. Lippet whispered a few words in his ear, when the aged hunter sank back into his place and, removing his cap, stroked down the remnants of his gray and sandy locks, with an air of mortification mingled with submission. Mr. District Attorney, said Judge Temple, affecting to busy himself with his minutes, proceed with the second indictment. Mr. Vanderschool took great care that no part of the presentment, which he now read, should be lost on his auditors. It accused the prisoner of resisting the execution of a search warrant, by force of arms, and particularized in the vague language of the law, among a variety of other weapons, the use of the rifle. This was indeed a more serious charge than an ordinary assault and battery, 
and a corresponding degree of interest was manifested by the spectators in its result. The prisoner was duly arraigned, and his plea again demanded. Mr. Lippet had anticipated the answers of Natty, and in a whisper advised him how to plead. But the feelings of the old hunter were awakened by some of the expressions in the indictment, and forgetful of his caution, he exclaimed, "'Tis a wicked untruth. I crave no man's blood. Them thieves, the Iroquois, won't say it to any face that I ever thirsted after man's blood. I have fought as soldier that feared his maker and his officer, but I never pulled trigger on any but a warrior that was up and awake. No man can say that I ever struck even a mingo in his blanket. I believe there's some who thinks there's no God in a wilderness. Attend to your plea, Bumpo," said the judge. You hear that you are accused of using your rifle against an officer of justice? Are you guilty or not guilty? By this time the irritated feelings of Natty had found vent, and he rested on the bar for a moment, in a musing posture, when he lifted his face with his silent laugh, and pointing to where the woodchopper stood, he said, "'Would Billy Kirby be standing there, do you think, if I had used the rifle?' "'Then you deny it,' said Mr. Lippet. "'You plead not guilty.' "'Sartin,' said Natty. "'Billy knows that I never fired at all. "'Billy, do you remember the turkey last winter? "'Ah, me! "'That was better than common firing. "'But I can't shoot as I used to could.' "'Enter the plea of not guilty,' said Judge Temple, "'strongly affected by the simplicity of the prisoner. "'Hiram was again sworn, "'and his testimony given on the second charge. He had discovered his former error, and proceeded more cautiously than before. He related very distinctly, and for the man with amazing terseness, the suspicion against the hunter, the complaint, the issuing of the warrant, and the swearing-in of Kirby, all of which he affirmed were done in due form of law. He then added the manner in which the constable had been received, and stated distinctly that Natty had pointed the rifle at Kirby and threatened his life if he attempted to execute his duty. All this was confirmed by Jotham, who was observed to adhere closely to the story of the magistrate. Mr. Lippet conducted an artful cross-examination of these two witnesses, but after consuming much time was compelled to relinquish the attempt to obtain any advantage in despair. At length the district attorney called the woodchopper to the bar. Billy gave an extremely confused account of the whole affair although he evidently aimed at the truth, until Mr. Vanderschool aided him by asking some direct questions. "'It appears from examining the papers that you demanded admission into the hut legally. So you were put in bodily fear by his rifle and threats?' "'I didn't mind them that, man,' said Billy, snapping his fingers. "'I should be a poor stick to mind old leather stocking.' But I understood you to say, referring to your previous words, as delivered here in court, in the commencement of your testimony, that you thought he meant to shoot you. To be sure I did, and so would you too, squire, if you had seen a chap dropping a muzzle that never misses, and cocking an eye that has a natural squint by long practice, I thought there would be dust on it, and my back was up at once. But leather stocking gan up the skin, and so the matter ended." "'Ah, Billy,' said Natty, shaking his head, "'twas a lucky thought in me to throw out the hide, or there might have been blood spilt. And I'm sure, if it had been yourn, I should have mourned it sorely the little while I have to stay.' "'Well, Leather Stocking,' returned Billy, facing the prisoner with a freedom and familiarity that utterly disregarded the presence of the court, "'as you are on the subject it may be that you've no—' "'Go on with your examination, Mr. District Attorney.' That gentleman eyed the familiarity between his witness and the prisoner with manifest disgust, and indicated to the court that he was done. "'Then you didn't feel frightened, Mr. Kirby?' said the counsel for the prisoner. "'Me? No,' said Billy, casting his eyes over his own huge frame with evident self-satisfaction. "'I'm not to be scared so easy. You look like a hardy man. Where were you born, sir? Vermont State. "'Tis a mountainous place, but there's a stiff soil, and it's pretty much wooded with beech and maple." "'I have always heard so,' said Mr. Lippet soothingly. "'You have been used to the rifle yourself in that country.' 
I pull the second best trigger in this county. I knock under to Natty Bumpo. There sin he shot the pigeon. Leatherstocking raised his head and laughed again, when he abruptly thrust out a wrinkled hand and said, You're young yet, Billy, and haven't seen the matches that I have. But here's my hand. I bear no malice to you. I don't. Mr. Lippet allowed this conciliatory offering to be accepted, and judiciously paused, while the spirit of peace was exercising its influence over the two. But the judge interposed his authority. "'This is an improper place for such dialogues,' he said. "'Proceed with your examination of this witness, Mr. Lippet, or I shall order the next.' The attorney started, as if unconscious of any impropriety, and continued. "'So you settled the matter with Natty amicably on the spot, did you?' He gin me the skin, and I didn't want to quarrel with an old man. For my part, I see no such mighty matter in shooting a buck. And you parted friends? And you would never have thought of bringing the business up before a court, hadn't you been subpoenaed? I don't think I should. He gin the skin, and I didn't feel a hard thought, though Squire Doolittle got some affronted. I have done, sir, said Mr. Lippet, probably relying on the charge of the judge, as he again seated himself, with the air of a man who felt that his success was certain. When Mr. Vanderschool arose to address the jury, he commenced by saying, Gentlemen of the jury, I should have interrupted the leading questions put by the prisoner's counsel. By leading questions I mean telling him what to say. Did I not feel confident that the law of the land was superior to any advantages, I mean legal advantages, which he might obtain by his art? The counsel for the prisoner, gentlemen, has endeavored to persuade you, in opposition to your own good sense, to believe that pointing a rifle at a constable, elected or deputed, is a very innocent affair, and that society, I mean the commonwealth, gentlemen, shall not be endangered thereby. But let me claim your attention while we look over the particulars of this heinous offence. Here Mr. Vanderschool favoured the jury with an abridgment of the testimony, recounted in such a manner as utterly to confuse the faculties of his worthy listeners. After this exhibition he closed as follows. And now, gentlemen, having thus made plain to your senses the crime of which this unfortunate man has been guilty, unfortunate both on account of his ignorance and his guilt, I shall leave you to your own consciences, not in the least doubting that you will see the importance, notwithstanding the prisoner's counsel, doubtless relying on your former verdict, wishes to appear so confident of success, of punishing the offender, and asserting the dignity of the laws. It was now the duty of the judge to deliver his charge. It consisted of a short comprehensive summary of the testimony, laying bare the artifice of the prisoner's counsel and placing the facts in so obvious a light that they could not well be misunderstood. "'Living as we do, gentlemen,' he concluded, "'on the skirts of society, it becomes doubly necessary to protect the ministers of the law. If you believe the witnesses in their construction of the acts of the prisoner, it is your duty to convict him. But if you believe that the old man who this day appears before you meant not to harm the constable, but was acting more under the influence of habit, than by the instigations of malice, it will be your duty to judge him, but to do it with lenity. As before, the jury did not leave their box, but after a consultation of some little time, their foreman arose and pronounced the prisoner guilty. There was but little surprise manifested in the courtroom at this verdict, as the testimony, the greater part of which we have omitted, was too clear and direct to be passed over. The judges seemed to have anticipated this sentiment, for a consultation was passing among them also, during the deliberation of the jury, and the preparatory movements of the bench announced the coming sentence. Nathaniel Bumpo, commenced the judge, making the customary pause. The old hunter, who had been musing again with his head on the bar, raised himself and cried with a prompt military tone, Here! The judge waved his hand for silence and proceeded. In forming their sentence, the court have been governed as much by the consideration of your ignorance of the laws as by a strict sense of the importance of punishing such outrages as this of which you have been found guilty. They have therefore passed over the obvious punishment of whipping on the bare back, 
in mercy to your years. But as the dignity of the law requires an open exhibition of the consequences of your crime, it is ordered that you be conveyed from this room to the public stocks, where you are to be confined for one hour, that you pay a fine to the state of one hundred dollars, and that you be imprisoned in the jail of this county for one calendar month, and furthermore, that your imprisonment do not cease until the said fine shall be paid. I feel it my duty, Nathaniel Bumpo. And where should I get the money? interrupted the leather stocking eagerly. Where should I get the money? You'll take away the bounty on the painters, because I cut the throat of a deer. And how is an old man to find so much gold or silver in the woods? No, no, judge. Think better of it, and don't talk of shutting me up in a jail for the little time I have to stay. If you have anything to urge against the passing of the sentence, the court will yet hear you," said the judge mildly. "'I have enough to say again it,' cried Natty, grasping the bar on which his fingers were working with a convulsed motion. "'Where am I to get the money? Let me out into the woods and hills, where I've been used to breathe the clear air. And though I'm threescore and ten, if you've left game enough in the country, I'll travel night and day, but I'll make you up the sum afore the season is over. Yes, yes, you see the reason of the thing, and the wickedness of shutting up an old man, that has spent his days, as one may say, where he could always look into the windows of heaven. I must be governed by the law. Talk not to me of law, Marmaduke Temple, interrupted the hunter. Did the beast of the forest mind your laws? when it was thirsty and hungering for the blood of your own child? She was kneeling to her God for a greater favor than I ask, and he heard her. And if you now say no to my prayers, do you think he will be deaf? My private feelings must not enter into— Hear me, Marmaduke Temple, interrupted the old man with melancholy earnestness, and hear reason. I've traveled these mountains when you was no judge but an infant in your mother's arms and I feel as if I had a right and a privilege to travel them again afore I die. Have you forgot the time that you come on to the lake shore, when there wasn't even a jail to lodge in? And didn't I give you my own bearskin to sleep on, and the fat of a noble buck to satisfy the cravings of your hunger? Yes, yes, you thought it no sin then to kill a deer. And this I did, though I had no reason to love you for you had never done anything but harm to them that loved and sheltered me. And now will you shut me up in your dungeons to pay me for my kindness? A hundred dollars! Where should I get the money? No, no. There's them that says hard things of you, Marmaduke Temple, but you ain't so bad as to wish to see an old man die in a prison, because he stood up for the right. Come, friend, let me pass. It's long since I've been used to such crowds, and I crave to be in the woods again. Don't fear me, Judge. I bid you not to fear me. For if there's beaver enough left on the streams, or the buckskins will sell for a shilling apiece, you shall have the last penny of the fine. Where are you, pups? Come away, dogs, come away. We have a grievous toil to do for our years, but it shall be done. Yes, yes, I promised it, and it shall be done. It is unnecessary to say that the movement of the leather stocking was again intercepted by the constable, but before he had time to speak, a bustling in the crowd and a loud hem drew all eyes to another part of the room. Benjamin had succeeded in edging his way through the people, and was now seen balancing his short body, with one foot in a window and the other on a railing of the jury-box. To the amazement of the whole court, the steward was evidently preparing to speak. After a good deal of difficulty, he succeeded in drawing from his pocket a small bag, and then found utterance. "'If so be,' he said, "'that your honour is agreeable to trust the poor fellow out on a, another cruise among the beasts. Here's a small matter that will help to bring down the risk, seeing that there's just thirty-five of your Spaniards in it. And I wish from the bottom of my heart that they was real British guineas.' for the sake of the old boy. But tis as it is, and if Squire Dickens will just be so good as to overhaul this small bit of an account, and take enough from the bag to settle the same, he's welcome to hold on upon the rest 
until such a time as the leather stocking can grapple with them said beaver or for that matter forever and no thanks asked as benjamin concluded he thrust out the wooden register of his arrears to the bold dragoon with one hand while he offered his bag of dollars with the other astonishment at this singular interruption produced a profound stillness in the room which was only interrupted by the sheriff who struck his sword on the table and cried silence there must be an end to this said the judge struggling to overcome his feelings constable lead the prisoner to the stocks mr clerk what stands next on the calendar natty seemed to yield to his destiny for he sank his head on his chest and followed the officer from the court-room in silence the crowd moved back for the passage of the prisoner and when his tall form was seen descending from the outer door a rush of the people to the scene of his disgrace followed end of chapter 33 recording by bill borst Chapter 34 of the Pioneers or the Sources of the Susquehanna a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper This is a LibriVox recording all LibriVox recordings are in the public domain For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Chapter 34 ha ha look he wears cruel garters Lear the punishments of the common law were still known at the time of our tale to the people of new york and the whipping post and its companion the stocks were not yet supplanted by the more merciful expedients of the public prison immediately in front of the jail those relics of the older times were situated as a lesson of precautionary justice to the evil doers of the settlement natty followed the constables to this spot bowing his head in submission to a power that he was unable to oppose, and surrounded by the crowd that formed a circle about his person, exhibiting in their countenances strong curiosity. A constable raised the upper part of the stocks, and pointed with his finger to the holes where the old man was to place his feet. Without making the least objection to the punishment, the leather stocking quietly seated himself on the ground, and suffered his limbs to be laid in the openings, without even a murmur, though he cast one glance about him, in quest of that sympathy that human nature always seems to require under suffering, but he met no direct manifestations of pity. Neither did he see any unfeeling exultation, or hear a single reproachful epithet. The character of the mob, if it could be called by such a name, was that of attentive subordination. The constable was in the act of lowering the upper plank, when Benjamin, who had pressed close to the side of the prisoner, said in his hoarse tone, as if seeking for some cause to create a quarrel, "'Where away, Master Constable, is the use of clapping a man in them there bilbos? It neither stops his grog nor hurts his back. What for is it that you do the thing?' "'Tis the sentence of the court, Mr. Penguilliam, and there's law for it, I suppose.' Ay, ay, I know that there's law for the thing. But where away do you find the use, I say? It does no harm, and it only keeps a man by the heels for the small matter of two glasses. Is it no harm, Benny Pump? said Natty, raising his eyes with a piteous look in the face of the steward. Is it no harm to show off a man in his seventy-first year like a tame bear for the settlers to look on? Is it no harm to put an old soldier that has served through the war of fifty-six and seen the enemy in the seventy-six business into a place like this, where the boys can point at him and say, I have known the time when he was a spectacle for the county? Is it no harm to bring down the pride of an honest man to the equal of the beasts of the forest? Benjamin stared about him fiercely, and could he have found a single face that expressed contumely, he would have been prompt to quarrel with its owner but meeting everywhere with looks of sobriety and occasionally of commiseration, he very deliberately seated himself by the side of the hunter, and, placing his legs in the two vacant holes of the stocks, he said, "'Now lower away, Master Constable, lower away, I tell you. If so be there's such a thing hereabouts as a man that wants to see a bear, let him look and be damned, and he shall find two of them. 
and mayhap one of the same that can bite as well as growl. "'But I have no orders to put you in the stocks, Mr. Pump,' cried the constable. "'You must get up and let me do my duty.' "'You've my orders, and what do you need better to meddle with my own feet? So lower away, will ye? And let me see the man that chooses to open his mouth with a grin on it.' "'There can't be any harm in locking up a creature that will enter the pound,' said the constable, laughing and closing the stocks on them both. It was fortunate that this act was executed with decision, for the whole of the spectators, when they saw Benjamin assume the position he took, felt an inclination for merriment, which few thought it worth while to suppress. The steward struggled violently for his liberty again with an evident intention of making battle on those who stood nearest to him, but the key was already turned and all his efforts were vain. "'Hark ye, Master Constable,' he cried, "'just clear away your bilbos for the small matter of a log-glass, will ye? And let me show some of them there chaps who it is they are so merry about.' "'No, no, you would go in, and you can't come out,' returned the officer, "'until the time has expired that the judge directed for the keeping of the prisoner.' Benjamin, finding that his threats and his struggles were useless, had good sense enough to learn patience from the resigned manner of his companion, and soon settled himself down by the side of Natty, with a contemptuousness expressed in his hard features, that showed he had substituted disgust for rage. When the violence of the steward's feelings had in some measure subsided, he turned to his fellow-sufferer, and with a motive that might have vindicated a worse effusion, he attempted the charitable office of consolation. "'Taking it by and large, Master Bumpo, it's but a small matter after all,' he said. "'Now, I've known very good sort of men aboard of the Bodiche, laid by the heels, for nothing, mayhap, but forgetting that they drunk their allowance already, when a glass of grog has come in their way. This is nothing more than riding with two anchors ahead, waiting for a turn in the tide, or a shift of wind, do you see, with a soft bottom and plenty of room for the sweep of your hawse. Now I've seen many a man for overshooting his reckoning, as I told you moored head and starn, where he couldn't so much as heave his broadside round, and mayhap a stopper clapped on his tongue too, in the shape of a pump-bolt lashed athwartship his jaws, all the same as an outrigger along the side of a taffrail rail. The hunter appeared to appreciate the kind intentions of the other, though he could not understand his eloquence, and raising his humbled countenance he attempted a smile, as he said, Anon. "'Tis nothing, I say, but a small matter of a squall that will soon blow over,' continued Benjamin. "'To you that has such a length of keel it must be all the same as nothing. Though seeing that I am little short in my lower timbers, they've triced my heels up in such a way as to give me a bit of a cant. But what cares I, Master Bumpo, if the ship strains a little at her anchor? It's only for a dog-watch.' and damn me, but she'll sail with you then on that cruise after them said beaver. I'm not much used to small arms, seeing that I was stationed at the ammunition boxes, being somewhat too low-rigged to see over the hammock cloths. But I can carry the game, do you see, and mayhap make out to lend a hand with the traps. And if so be you're any way so handy with them as you be with your boat-hook, twill be but a short cruise after all. I've squared the yards with Squire Dickens this morning, and I shall send him word that he needn't bear my name on the books again till such time as the cruise is over. "'You're used to dwell with men, Benny,' said Leatherstocking mournfully, "'and the ways of the woods would be hard on you if—' "'Not a bit! Not a bit!' cried the steward. "'I'm none of your fair-weather chaps, Master Bumpo, as sails only in smooth water. When I find a friend, I sticks by him, do you see?' Now there's no better man a-going than Squire Dickens, and I love him about the same as I loves Mistress Hollister's new keg of Jamaica. The steward paused, and turning his uncouth visage on the hunter, he surveyed him with a roguish leer of his eye, and gradually suffered the muscles of his hard features to relax, until his face was illuminated by the display of his white teeth. When he dropped his voice and added, "'I say, Master Leatherstocking,' "'Tis fresher and livelier than any Hollands you'll get in Garnsey. "'But we'll send a hand over and ask the woman for a taste. "'For I'm so jammed in these here bilbos "'that I begin to want summit to lighten my upper works.' 
Natty sighed and gazed about him on the crowd that already began to disperse, and which had now diminished greatly as its members scattered in their various pursuits. He looked wistfully at Benjamin, but did not reply. A deeply seated anxiety seeming to absorb every other sensation, and to throw a melancholy gloom over his wrinkled features, which were working with the movements of his mind. The steward was about to act on the old principle that silence gives consent, when Hiram Doolittle, attended by Jotham, stalked out of the crowd across the open space and approached the stocks. The magistrate passed by the end where Benjamin was seated and posted himself at a safe distance from the steward, in front of the leather stocking. Hiram stood for a moment, cowering before the keen looks that Natty fastened on him, and suffering under an embarrassment that was quite new. When having in some degree recovered himself, he looked at the heavens, and then at the smoky atmosphere, as if it were only an ordinary meeting with a friend, and said in his formal, hesitating way, Quite a scarcity of rain lately. I some think we shall have a long drought on it." Benjamin was occupied in untying his bag of dollars, and did not observe the approach of the magistrate, while Natty turned his face, in which every muscle was working, away from him in disgust, without answering. Rather encouraged than daunted by this exhibition of dislike, Hiram, after a short pause, continued, "'The clouds look as if they'd no water in them, and the earth is dreadfully parched. To my judgment there'll be short crops this season, if the rain doesn't fall quite speedily." The air with which Mr. Doolittle delivered this prophetical opinion was peculiar to his species. It was a Jesuitical, cold, unfeeling, and selfish manner that seemed to say, I have kept within the law, to the man he had so cruelly injured. It quite overcame the restraint that the old hunter had been laboring to impose on himself, and he burst out in a warm glow of indignation. "'Why should the rain fall from the clouds?' he cried, when you force the tears from the eyes of the old, the sick, and the poor. Away with you! Away with you! You may be formed in the image of the Maker, but Satan dwells in your heart. Away with you, I say. I am mournful, and the sight of you brings bitter thoughts." Benjamin ceased thumbing his money, and raised his head at the instant that Hiram, who was thrown off his guard by the invectives of the hunter, unluckily trusted his person within reach of the steward, who grasped one of his legs with a hand that had the grip of a vice, and whirled the magistrate from his feet, before he had either time to collect his senses, or to exercise the strength he did really possess. Benjamin wanted neither proportions nor manhood in his head, shoulders, and arms, though all the rest of his frame appeared to be originally intended for a very different sort of a man. He exerted his physical powers on the present occasion, with much discretion, and, as he had taken his antagonist at a great disadvantage, the struggle resulted very soon in Benjamin getting the magistrate fixed in a posture somewhat similar to his own, and manfully placed face to face. "'You're a ship's cousin, I tell you, Master Do but little,' roared the steward. "'Some such matter as a ship's cousin, sir. I know you, I do with your fair-weather speeches to Squire Dickens to his face, and then you go and sarve out your grumbling to all the old women in the town, do you? Ain't it enough for any Christian, let him harbor never so much malice, to get an honest old fellow laid by the heels in this fashion, without carrying sail so hard on the poor dog, as if you would run him down as he lay at his anchors? But I've logged many a hard thing against your name, master. And now the time's come to foot up the day's work, do you see? So square yourself, you lubber, square yourself, and we'll soon know who's the better man." "'Jotham!' cried the frightened magistrate. "'Jotham, call in the constables. Mr. Penguilliam, I command the peace. I order you to keep the peace.' "'There's been more peace than love atwixt us, master,' cried the steward, making some very unequivocal demonstrations toward hostility. So mind yourself, square yourself, I say. Do you smell this here bit of a sledge-hammer?" "'Lay hands on me if you dare!' exclaimed Hiram, as well as he could, under the grasp which the steward held on his throttle. "'Lay hands on me if you dare!' "'If you call this laying, master, you are welcome to the eggs,' roared the steward. It becomes our disagreeable duty to record here that the acts of Benjamin now became violent. 
for he darted his sledge-hammer violently on the amble of Mr. Doolittle's countenance, and the place became in an instant a scene of tumult and confusion. The crowd rushed in a dense circle around the spot, while some ran to the court-room to give the alarm, and one or two of the more juvenile part of the multitude had a desperate trial of speed to see who should be the happy man to communicate the critical situation of the magistrate to his wife. Benjamin worked away, with great industry and a good deal of skill at his occupation, using one hand to raise up his antagonist, while he knocked him over with the other. For he would have been disgraced in his own estimation had he struck a blow on a fallen adversary. By this considerate arrangement he had found means to hammer the visage of Hiram out of all shape, by the time Richard succeeded in forcing his way through the throng to the point of combat. The sheriff afterward declared that, independently of his mortification as preserver of the peace of the county, at this interruption to its harmony, he was never so grieved in his life as when he saw this breach of unity between his favorites. Hiram had in some degree become necessary to his vanity, and Benjamin, strange as it may appear, he really loved. This attachment was exhibited in the first words that he uttered. "'Squire Doolittle, Squire Doolittle, I am ashamed to see a man of your character and office forget himself so much as to disturb the peace, insult the court, and beat poor Benjamin in this manner.' At the sound of Mr. Jones's voice the steward ceased his employment, and Hiram had an opportunity of raising his discomfited visage toward the mediator. Emboldened by the sight of the sheriff, Mr. Doolittle again had recourse to his lungs. "'I'll have law on you for this,' he cried desperately. "'I'll have the law on you for this. I call on you, Mr. Sheriff, to seize this man, and I demand that you take his body into custody.' By this time Richard was master of the true state of the case, and turning to the steward he said reproachfully, "'Benjamin, how came you in the stocks? I always thought you were mild and docile as a lamb. It was for your docility that I most esteemed you. Benjamin, Benjamin!' You have not only disgraced yourself, but your friends, by this shameless conduct. Bless me! Bless me! Mr. Doolittle, he seems to have knocked your face all of one side." Hiram by this time had got on his feet again, and without the reach of the steward, when he broke forth in violent appeals for vengeance. The offence was too apparent to be passed over, and the sheriff, mindful of the impartiality exhibited by his cousin in the recent trial of the leather stocking, came to the painful conclusion that it was necessary to commit his major-domo to prison. As the time of Natty's punishment was expired, and Benjamin found that they were to be confined, for that night at least, in the same apartment, he made no very strong objection to the measure, nor spoke of bail, though as the sheriff preceded the party of constables that conducted them to the jail, he uttered the following remonstrance. As to being berthed with Master Bumpo for a night or so, it's but little I think of it, Squire Dickens, seeing that I calls him an honest man, and one as has a handy way with boat-hooks and rifles. But as for owning that a man desarves anything worse than a double allowance for knocking that carpenter's face a one side, as you call it, I'll maintain it's again reason and Christianity. If there's a bloodsucker in this ere country, it's that very chap. Ay, I know him and if he hasn't got all the same as dead wood in his headworks, he knows summat of me. Where's the mighty harm, squire, that you take it so much to heart? It's all the same as any other battle, do you see, sir, being broadside to broadside, only that it was foot at anchor, which was what we did in Port Prey a Rhodes, when suffering came in among us, and a suffering time he had of it before he got out again. Richard thought it unworthy of him to make any reply to this speech. But when his prisoners were safely lodged in an outer dungeon, ordering the bolts to be drawn and the key turned, he withdrew. Benjamin held frequent and friendly dialogues with different people through the iron gratings during the afternoon. But his companion paced their narrow limits, in his moccasins, with quick impatient treads, his face hanging on his breast in dejection, or when lifted, at moments, to the idlers at the window, lighted perhaps for an instant with the childish aspect of aged forgetfulness, which would vanish directly in an expression of deep and obvious anxiety. At the close of the day, Edwards was seen at the window in earnest dialogue with his friend, and after he departed it was thought that he had communicated words of comfort to the hunter, 
who threw himself on his pallet and was soon in a deep sleep. The curious spectators had exhausted the conversation of the steward, who had drunk good fellowship with half of his acquaintance, and, as Natty was no longer in motion, by eight o'clock, Billy Kirby, who was the last lounger at the window, retired into the Templeton coffee-house, when Natty rose and hung a blanket before the opening, and the prisoners apparently retired for the night. End of chapter 34 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 35 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 35 And to avoid the foe's pursuit, with spurring put their cattle to it, until all four were out of wind, and danger too, near looked behind. Hudibras. As the shades of evening approached, the jurors, witnesses, and other attendants on the court began to disperse, and before nine o'clock the village was quiet, and its streets nearly deserted. At that hour Judge Temple and his daughter, followed at a short distance by Louisa Grant, walked slowly down the avenue, under the slight shadows of the young poplars, holding the following discourse. "'You can best soothe his wounded spirit, my child,' said Marmaduke, "'but it will be dangerous to touch on the nature of his offence. "'The sanctity of the laws must be respected.' "'Surely, sir,' cried the impatient Elizabeth, "'those laws that condemn a man like the leather-stocking "'to so severe a punishment, "'for an offence that even I must think very venial, "'cannot be perfect in themselves.' "'Thou talkest of what thou dost not understand, Elizabeth,' returned her father. Society cannot exist without wholesome restraints. Those restraints cannot be inflicted without security and respect to the persons of those who administer them. And it would sound ill indeed to report that a judge had extended favor to a convicted criminal, because he had saved the life of his child. "'I see. I see the difficulty of your situation, dear sir,' cried the daughter. But in appreciating the offence of poor Natty, I cannot separate the minister of the law from the man. There thou talkest as a woman, child. It is not for an assault on Hiram Doolittle, but for threatening the life of a constable, who was in the performance of— It is immaterial whether it be one or the other, interrupted Miss Temple, with a logic that contained more feeling than reason. I know Natty to be innocent, and thinking so I must think all wrong who oppress him. His judge among the number, thy father, Elizabeth? Nay, 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 do not put such questions to me. Give me my commission, father, and let me proceed to execute it. The judge paused a moment, smiling fondly on his child, and then dropped his hand affectionately on her shoulder, as he answered, Thou hast reason, Bess, and much of it, too, but thy heart lies too near thy head. But listen— in this pocket-book are two hundred dollars. Go to the prison. There are none in this place to harm thee. Give this note to the jailer. And when thou seest Bumpo, say what thou wilt to the poor old man. Give scope to the feeling of thy warm heart. But try to remember, Elizabeth, that the laws alone remove us from the condition of the savages, that he has been criminal, and that his judge was thy father." Miss Temple made no reply, but she pressed the hand that held the pocket-book to her bosom, and, taking her friend by the arm, they issued together from the enclosure into the principal street of the village. As they pursued their walk in silence under the row of houses where the deeper gloom of the evening effectually concealed their persons, no sound reached to them, excepting the slow tread of a yoke of oxen, with the rattling of a cart that were moving along the street in the same direction with themselves. The figure of the teamster was just discernible by the dim light, lounging by the side of his cattle with a listless air, as if fatigued by the toil of the day. At the corner where the jail stood the progress of the ladies was impeded, for a moment, by the oxen, who turned up to the side of the building, and given a lock of hay which they had carried on their necks as a reward for their patient labor. The whole of this was so natural, and so common, 
that Elizabeth saw nothing to induce a second glance at the team, until she heard the teamster speaking to his cattle in a low voice. "'Mind yourself, Brindle, will you, sir, will you?' The language itself was so unusual to oxen with which all who dwell in a new country are familiar. But there was something in the voice, also, that startled Miss Temple. On turning the corner she necessarily approached the man, and her look was enabled to detect the person of Oliver Edwards, concealed under the coarse garb of a teamster. Their eyes met at the same instant, and notwithstanding the gloom and the enveloping cloak of Elizabeth, the recognition was mutual. "'Miss Temple! Mr. Edwards!' were exclaimed simultaneously, though a feeling that seemed common to both rendered the words nearly inaudible. "'Is it possible?' exclaimed Edwards, after the moment of doubt had passed. "'Do I see you so nigh the jail? But you are going to the rectory. I beg pardon, Miss Grant, I believe. I did not recognize you at first. The sigh which Louisa tittered was so faint that it was only heard by Elizabeth, who replied quickly, "'We are going not only to the jail, Mr. Edwards, but into it. We wish to show the leather-stocking that we do not forget his services, and that at the same time we must be just, we are also grateful. I suppose you are on a similar errand, but let me beg that you will give us leave to precede you ten minutes. Good night, sir. I—I I am quite sorry, Mr. Edwards, to see you reduced to such labor. I am sure my father would—' "'I shall await your pleasure, madam.' interrupted the youth coldly. "'May I beg that you will not mention my being here?' "'Certainly,' said Elizabeth, returning his bow by a slight inclination of her head, and urging the tardy Louisa forward. As they entered the jailer's house, however, Miss Grant found leisure to whisper, "'Would it not be well to offer part of your money to Oliver? Half of it will pay the fine of Bumpo. And he is so unused to hardships. I am sure my father will subscribe much of his little pittance.' to place him in a station that is more worthy of him." The involuntary smile that passed over the features of Elizabeth was blended with an expression of deep and heartfelt pity. She did not reply, however, and the appearance of the jailer soon recalled the thoughts of both to the object of their visit. The rescue of the ladies and their consequent interest in his prisoner, together with the informal manners that prevailed in the country, all united to prevent any surprise on the part of the jailer at their request for admission to Bumpo. The note of Judge Temple, however, would have silenced all objections, if he had felt them, and he led the way without hesitation to the apartment that held the prisoners. The instant the key was put into the lock, the hoarse voice of Benjamin was heard demanding, "'Yohoy! Who comes there?' "'Some visitors that you'll be glad to see,' returned the jailer. "'What have you done to the lock, that it won't turn?' "'Handsomely, handsomely, master,' cried the steward. "'I have just drove a nail into a berth alongside of this here bolt, as a stopper, do you see, so that master do but little can't be running in and breezing up another fight atwixt us. For to my account, there'll be but a hanyam with me soon, seeing that they'll milk me of my Spaniards, all the same as if I'd overflogged the lubber.' Throw your ship into the wind, and lay by for a small matter, will you? And I'll soon clear a passage." The sounds of hammering gave an assurance that the steward was in earnest, and in a short time the lock yielded, when the door was opened. Benjamin had evidently been anticipating the seizure of his money, for he had made frequent demands on the favorite cask at the Bold Dragoon, during the afternoon and evening and was now in that state which by marine imagery is called half-seas over. It was no easy thing to destroy the balance of the old tar by the effects of liquor, for as he expressed it himself, he was too low-rigged not to carry sail in all weathers. But he was precisely in that condition which is so expressively termed muddy. When he perceived who the visitors were, he retreated to the side of the room where his pallet lay and regardless of the presence of his young mistress, seated himself on it with an air of great sobriety, placing his back firmly against the wall. "'If you undertake to spoil my locks in this manner, Mr. Pump,' said the jailer, "'I shall put a stopper, as you call it, on your legs, and tie you down to your bed.' 
"'What for should you, master?' grumbled Benjamin. "'I brought out but one squall to-day anchor by the heels, and I wants no more of them. "'Where's the harm of doing all the same as yourself? "'Leave that there door free outboard, and you'll find no locking inboard, I'll promise you.' "'I must shut up for the night at nine, said the jailer, "'and it's now forty-two minutes past eight. He placed the little candle on a rough pine table, and withdrew. "'Leatherstocking,' said Elizabeth, when the key of the door was turned on them again. "'My good friend Leatherstocking, I have come on a message of gratitude. Had you submitted to the search, worthy old man, the death of the deer would have been a trifle, and all would have been well—' "'Submit to the search!' interrupted Natty, raising his face from resting on his knees, without rising from the corner where he had seated himself. "'Do you think, gal, I would let such a varmint into my hut? No, no, I wouldn't have opened the door to your own sweet countenance then. But they are welcome to search among the coals and ashes now. They'll find only some such heap as is to be seen at every pot-ashery in the mountains.' The old man dropped his face again on one hand, and seemed to be lost in melancholy. "'The hut can be rebuilt, and made better than before,' returned Miss Temple and it shall be my office to see it done, when your imprisonment is ended." "'Can you raise the dead, child?' said Natty, in a sorrowful voice. "'Can you go into the place where you have laid your fathers and mothers and children, and gather together their ashes, and make the same men and women of them as afore? You do not know what tis to lay your head for more than forty years under the cover of the same logs, and to look at the same things for the better part of a man's life. You are young yet, child, but you are one of the most precious of God's creatures. I had hoped for you that it might come to pass, but it's all over now. This, put to that, will drive the thing quite out of his mind for ever." Miss Temple must have understood the meaning of the old man better than the other listeners, for while Louisa stood innocently by her side, commiserating the griefs of the hunter, she bent her head aside so as to conceal her features. The action and the feeling that caused it lasted but a moment. "'Other logs, and better, though, can be had, and shall be found for you, my old defender,' she continued. "'Your confinement will soon be over, and before that time arrives I shall have a house prepared for you, where you may spend the close of your long and harmless life in ease and plenty.' "'Ease and plenty! House!' repeated Natty, slowly. You mean well, you mean well, and I quite mourn that it cannot be. But he has seen me a sight and a laughing stock for— Damn your stock, said Benjamin, flourishing his bottle with one hand, from which he had been taking hasty and repeated draughts, while he made gestures of disdain with the other. Who cares for his bilboes? There's a leg that's been stuck up on end like a jibboom for an hour, you see. And what's it the worse for, huh? Canst tell me, what's it the worser, ha? Huh? I believe you forget, Mr. Pump, in whose presence you are, said Elizabeth. Forget you, Miss Lizzie, returned the steward. If I do, damn me. You are not to be forgot. Like goody pretty bones up at the big house there, I say, old sharpshooter, she may have pretty bones, but I can't say so much for her flesh, do you see? for she looks somewhat like a, like anatomy with another man's jacket on. Now for the skin of her face, it's all the same as a new topsail with taut boat rope being snug at the leeches, but all in a bite about the inner cloths. Peace. I command you to be silent, sir, said Elizabeth. Aye, aye, ma'am, returned the steward. He didn't say I shouldn't drink, though. We will not speak of what is to become of others, said Miss Temple, turning again to the hunter, but of your own fortunes, Natty. It shall be my care to see that you pass the rest of your days in ease and plenty. Ease and plenty, again repeated the leather stocking. What ease can there be to an old man, who must walk a mile across the open fields, before he can find a shade to hide him from a scorching sun? Or what plenty is there where you hunt a day and not start a buck, or see anything bigger than a mink, or maybe a stray fox? Ah! 
I shall have a hard time after them very beavers for this fine. I must go low toward the Pennsylvania line in search of the creatures, maybe a hundred mile, for they are not to be got here away. No, no, your betterments and clearings have drove the knowing things out of the country, and instead of beaver dams, which is the nature of the animal, and according to Providence, you turn back the waters over the low grounds with your mill dams, as if twas in man to stay the drops from going where he wills them to go. Benny, unless you stop your hand from going so often to your mouth, you won't be ready to start when the time comes. Harky, Master Bumpo, said the steward, don't you fear for Ben. When the watch is called, set me of my legs and give me the bearings in the distance of where you want me to steer. Now carry sail the best of you, I will. The time has come now, said the hunter, listening. I hear the horns of the oxens rubbing again the side of the jail. We'll say the word, and then heave ahead, shipmate, said Benjamin. You won't betray us, gal, said Natty, looking simply into the face of Elizabeth. You won't betray an old man, who craves to breathe the clear air of heaven. I mean no harm. And if the law says that I must pay the hundred dollars, I'll take the season through, but it shall be forthcoming, and this good man will help me. You catch them, said Benjamin, with a sweeping gesture of his arm, and if they get away again, call me a slink, that's all. But what mean you? cried the wondering Elizabeth. Here you must stay for thirty days, but I have the money for your fine in this purse. Take it, pay it in the morning, and summon patience for your month. I will come often to see you with my friend. We will make up your clothes with our own hands. Indeed, indeed, you shall be comfortable." "'Would ye, children?' said Natty, advancing across the floor with an air of kindness, and taking the hand of Elizabeth. "'Would ye be so careful of an old man, and just for shooting a beast which cost him nothing?' "'Such things doesn't run in the blood, I believe, for you seem not to forget a favor. Your little fingers couldn't do much on a buckskin nor be you used to push such a thread as sinews. But if he hasn't got past hearing, he shall hear it and know it, that he may see, like me, there is some who know how to remember a kindness." "'Tell him nothing,' cried Elizabeth earnestly. "'If you love me, if you regard my feelings, tell him nothing. It is of yourself only I would talk, and for yourself only I act. I grieve, Leatherstocking, that the law requires that you should be detained here so long. But after all, it will be only a short month, and a month!" exclaimed Natty, opening his mouth with his usual laugh. Not a day, nor a night, nor an hour, gal. Judge Temple may sentence, but he can't keep without a better dungeon than this. I was taken once by the French and they put sixty-two of us in a blockhouse, nigh hand to old Frontenac. But twas easy to cut through a pine log to them that was used to timber." The hunter paused, and looked cautiously around the room, when, laughing again, he shoved the steward gently from his post, and, removing the bedclothes, discovered a hole recently cut in the logs with a mallet and chisel. "'It's only a kick, and the outside piece is off, and then—' off. I off, cried Benjamin, rising from his stupor. Well, here's off. Ay, ay, you catch him, and I'll hold on to them said beaver hats. I fear this lad will trouble me much, said Natty. Twill be a hard pull for the mountain, should they take the scent soon, and he is not in a state of mind to run. Run, echoed the steward. No, sheer long side, and let's have a fight of it. Peace, ordered Elizabeth. Ay, ay, ma'am. You will not leave us, surely, Leatherstocking, continued Miss Temple. I beseech you, reflect that you will be driven to the woods entirely, and that you are fast getting old. Be patient for a little time, when you can go abroad openly, and with honor. Is there beaver to be catched here, gal? If not, here is money to discharge the fine, and in a month you are free. See, here it is in gold." "'Gold,' said Natty, with a kind of childish curiosity. It's long sin I seen a gold piece. We used to get the broad joes in the old war as plenty as the bears be now. 
I remember there was a man in Discaw's army that was killed, who had a dozen of the shining things sewed up in his shirt. I didn't handle them myself, but I seen them cut out with my own eyes. They was bigger and brighter than them be. "'These are English guineas, and are yours,' said Elizabeth, "'and earnest of what shall be done for you.' "'Me! Why should you give me this treasure?' said Natty, looking earnestly at the maiden. "'Why? Have you not saved my life? Did you not rescue me from the jaws of the beast?' exclaimed Elizabeth, veiling her eyes as if to hide some hideous object from her view. The hunter took the money, and continued turning it in his hand for some time, piece by piece, talking aloud during the operation. "'There's a rifle, they say, out on the Cherry Valley, that will carry a hundred rods and kill. I've seen good guns in my day, but none quite equal to that. A hundred rods with any certainty is great shooting. Well, well, I'm old, and the gun I have will answer my time. Here, child, take back your gold. But the hour has come. I hear him talking to the cattle, and I must be going. You won't tell of us, gal. You won't tell of us, will you? Tell of you, echoed Elizabeth. But take the money, old man. Take the money, even if you go into the mountains. No, no, said Natty, shaking his head kindly. I would not rob you so for twenty rifles. But there's one thing you can do for me, if you will, that no other is at hand to do. Name it! Name it! Why, it's only to buy a canister of powder. Twill cost two silver dollars. Benny Pump has the money ready, but we daren't come into the town to get it. Nobody has it but the Frenchman. Tis of the best, and just suits a rifle. Will you get it for me, gal? Say, will you get it for me? Will I? I will bring it to you, Leather Stocking, though I toil a day in quest of you through the woods. But where shall I find you? And how? Where? said Natty, musing a moment. Tomorrow on the vision. On the very top of the vision I'll meet you, child, just as the sun gets over our heads. See that it's the fine grain. You'll know it by the gloss and the price. I will do it, said Elizabeth firmly. Natty now seated himself, and placing his feet in the hole, with a slight effort he opened a passage through into the street. The ladies heard the rustling of hay, and well understood the reason why Edwards was in the capacity of a teamster. Come, Benny, said the hunter. Twill be no darker to-night, for the moon will rise in an hour. Stay, exclaimed Elizabeth. It should not be said that you escaped in the presence of the daughter of Judge Temple. Return, Leather Stocking, and let us retire before you execute your plan. Nettie was about to reply, when the approaching footsteps of the jailer announced the necessity of his immediate return. He had barely time to regain his feet, and to conceal the hole with the bedclothes, across which Benjamin very opportunely fell, before the key was turned and the door of the apartment opened. "'Isn't Miss Temple ready to go?' said the civil jailer. "'It's the usual hour for locking up.' "'I follow you, sir,' returned Elizabeth. "'Good night, Leather Stocking.' "'It's a fine grain, gal, and I think twill carry lead further than common. I am getting old, and can't follow up the game with the step I used to could.' Miss Temple waved her hand for silence and preceded Louisa and the keeper from the apartment. The man turned the key once, and observed that he would return and secure his prisoners when he had lighted the ladies to the street. Accordingly they parted at the door of the building, when the jailer retired to his dungeons, and the ladies walked, with throbbing hearts, toward the corner. "'Now the leather-stocking refuses the money,' whispered Louisa. It can all be given to Mr. Edwards, and that added to— Listen, said Elizabeth, I hear the rustling of the hay. They are escaping at this moment. Oh, they will be detected instantly. By this time they were at the corner, where Edwards and Natty were in the act of drawing the almost helpless body of Benjamin through the aperture. The oxen had started back from their hay, and were standing with their heads down the street, 
leaving room for the party to act in. "'Throw the hay into the cart,' said Edwards, "'or they will suspect how it has been done. Quick, that they may not see it.' Natty had just returned from executing this order, when the light of the keeper's candle shone through the hole, and instantly his voice was heard in the jail, exclaiming for his prisoners. "'What is to be done now?' said Edwards. "'This drunken fellow will cause our detection, and we have not a moment to spare.' "'Who's drunk, he lubber? muttered the steward. "'A break-jail! A break-jail!' shouted five or six voices from within. "'We must leave him,' said Edwards. "'Twouldn't be kind, lad,' returned Natty. "'He took half the disgrace of the stocks on himself to-day, and the creature has feeling.' At this moment two or three men were heard issuing from the door of the bold dragoon, and among them the voice of Billy Kirby. "'There's no moon yet,' cried the woodchopper. "'But it's a clear night. Come, who's for home? Hark, what a rumpus they're kicking up in the jail! Here's go and see what it's about.' "'We shall be lost,' said Edwards, "'if we don't drop this man.' At that instant Elizabeth moved close to him, and said rapidly in a low voice, "'Lay him in the cart, and start the oxen. No one will look there.' "'There's a woman's quickness in the thought,' said the youth. The proposition was no sooner made than executed. The steward was seated on the hay, and enjoined to hold his peace and apply the goad that was placed in his hand, while the oxen were urged on. So soon as this arrangement was completed, Edwards and the hunter stole along the houses for a short distance, when they disappeared through an opening that led into the rear of the buildings. The oxen were in brisk motion, and presently the cries of pursuit were heard in the street. The ladies quickened their pace, with a wish to escape the crowd of constables and idlers that were approaching, some execrating, and some laughing at the exploit of the prisoners. In the confusion the voice of Kirby was plainly distinguishable above all the others, shouting and swearing that he would have the fugitives, threatening to bring back Natty in one pocket, and Benjamin in the other. "'Spread yourselves, men!' he cried, as he passed the ladies, his heavy feet sounding along the street like the tread of a dozen. "'Spread yourselves! To the mountains! They'll be in the mountains in a quarter of an hour, and then look out for a long rifle!' His cries were echoed from twenty mouths, for not only the jail but the taverns had sent forth their numbers, some earnest in the pursuit, and others joining it as in sport. As Elizabeth turned in at her father's gate, she saw the woodchopper stop at the cart, when she gave Benjamin up for lost. While they were hurrying up the walk, two figures, stealing cautiously but quickly under the shades of the trees, met the eyes of the ladies, and in a moment Edwards and the hunter crossed their path. "'Miss Temple, I may never see you again,' exclaimed the youth. "'Let me thank you for all your kindness. You do not, cannot know my motives.' "'Fly! fly!' cried Elizabeth. "'The village is alarmed. Do not be found conversing with me at such a moment, and in these grounds.' "'Nay, I must speak, though detection were certain. Your retreat to the bridge is already cut off. Before you can gain the wood, your pursuers will be there.' "'If—if if what?' cried the youth. "'Your advice has saved me once already. I will follow it to death.' "'The street is now silent and vacant,' said Elizabeth, after a pause. "'Cross it.' and you will find my father's boat in the lake. It would be easy to land from it where you please in the hills. But Judge Temple might complain of the trespass. His daughter shall be accountable, sir." The youth uttered something in a low voice that was heard only by Elizabeth, and turned to execute what she had suggested. As they were separating, Natty approached the females, and said, "'You remember the canister of powder, children? Them beavers must be had and I and the pups be getting old. We want the best of ammunition." "'Come, Natty,' said Edwards, impatiently. "'Coming, lad, coming. God bless you, young ones, both of you, for ye mean well, and kindly to the old man.' The ladies paused until they had lost sight of the retreating figures, when they immediately entered the mansion-house. While this scene was passing in the walk, Kirby had overtaken the cart, which was his own and had been driven by Edwards without asking the owner, from the place where the patient 
oxen usually stood at evening, waiting the pleasure of their master. "'Whoa! Come hither, Golden!' he cried. "'Why, how come you off the end of the bridge where I left you, dummies?' "'Heave ahead!' muttered Benjamin, giving a random blow with his lash that alighted on the shoulder of the other. "'Who the devil be you?' cried Billy, turning round in surprise, but unable to distinguish in the dark the hard visage that was just peering over the cart-rails. "'Who be I? Why, I'm helmsman aboard of this here craft, do you see? And a straight wake I'm making of it. Aye, aye, I've got the bridge right ahead, and the bilbo's dead aft. I calls that good steerage, boy. Heave ahead. "'Lay your lash in the right spot, Mr. Benny Pump,' said the woodchopper, "'or I'll put you in the palm of my hand and box your ears. "'Where be you going with my team?' "'Team? Ay, my cart and oxen. "'Why, you must know, Master Kirby, that the leather stocking and I, that's Benny Pump, you knows Ben? "'Well, Benny and I, no, no, me and Benny, damn me, if I know how tis, but some of us are bound after a cargo—' of beaver-skins, do you see? So we press the cart to ship them home in. I say, Master Kirby, what a lowerly oar you pull. You handle an oar, boy, pretty much as a cow would a musket, or a lady would a marling spike. Billy had discovered the state of the steward's mind, and he walked for some time alongside of the cart, musing with himself, when he took the goad from Benjamin, who fell back on the hay and was soon asleep, and drove his cattle down the street, over the bridge, and up the mountain toward a clearing in which he was to work the next day, without any other interruption than a few hasty questions from parties of the constables. Elizabeth stood for an hour at the window of her room, and saw the torches of the pursuers gliding along the side of the mountain, and heard their shouts and alarms, but at the end of that time the last party returned, wearied and disappointed and the village became as still as when she issued from the gate on her mission to the jail. End of chapter 35 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 36 Of the Pioneers, or the Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 36 And I could weep the Oneida chief his descant wildly thus begun, but that I may not stain with grief the death-song of my father's son. Gertrude of Wyoming it was yet early on the following morning, when Elizabeth and Louisa met by appointment, and proceeded to the store of M. Lacroix, in order to redeem the pledge the former had given to the leather stocking. The people were again assembling for the business of the day, but the hour was too soon for a crowd, and the ladies found the place in possession of its polite owner, Billy Kirby, one female customer, and the boy who did the duty of helper or clerk. M. Lequoy was perusing a packet of letters with manifest delight, while the woodchopper, with one hand thrust in his bosom, and the other in the folds of his jacket, holding an axe under his right arm, stood sympathizing in the Frenchman's pleasure with good-natured interest. The freedom of manners that prevailed in the new settlements commonly leveled all difference in rank, and with it, frequently, all considerations of education and intelligence. At the time the ladies entered the store, they were unseen by the owner, who was saying to Kirby, "'Aha! Monsieur Biel! This letter make me most happy of mans. Ah, ma chère France! I will see you again.' "'I rejoice, monsieur, at anything that contributes to your happiness,' said Elizabeth, "'but hope we are not going to lose you entirely.' The complacent shopkeeper changed the language to French, and recounted rapidly to Elizabeth his hopes of being permitted to return to his own country. Habit had, however, so far altered the manners of this pliable personage 
that he continued to serve the woodchopper, who was in quest of some tobacco, while he related to his more gentle visitor the happy change that had taken place in the dispositions of his own countrymen. The amount of it all was that Mr. Lacroix, who had fled from his own country more through terror than because he was offensive to the ruling powers in France, had succeeded at length in getting an assurance that his return to the West Indies would be unnoticed, and the Frenchman, who had sunk into the character of a country shopkeeper with so much grace, was about to emerge again from his obscurity into his proper level in society. We need not repeat the civil things that passed between the parties on this occasion, nor recount the endless repetitions of sorrow that the delighted Frenchman expressed at being compelled to quit the society of Miss Temple. Elizabeth took an opportunity during this expenditure of polite expressions to purchase the powder privately of the boy who bore the generic appellation of Jonathan. Before they parted, however, Mr. Lacroix, who seemed to think that he had not said enough, solicited the honor of a private interview with the heiress, with a gravity in his air that announced the importance of the subject, after conceding the favor, and appointing a more favorable time for the meeting. Elizabeth succeeded in getting out of the store, into which the countrymen now began to enter, as usual, where they met with the same attention and bien séance as formerly. Elizabeth and Louisa pursued their walk as far as the bridge in profound silence, but when they reached the place the latter stopped, and appeared anxious to utter something that her diffidence suppressed. "'Are you ill, Louisa?' exclaimed Miss Temple. "'Had we not better return and seek another opportunity to meet the old man?' "'Not ill, but terrified. Oh, I never, never can go on that hill again with you only.' I am not equal to it. Indeed, I am not." This was an unexpected declaration to Elizabeth, who, although she experienced no idle apprehension of a danger that no longer existed, felt most sensitively all the delicacy of maiden modesty. She stood for some time deeply reflecting within herself. But sensible it was a time for action instead of reflection, she struggled to shake off her hesitation, and replied firmly, "Well." then it must be done by me alone. There is no other than yourself to be trusted, or poor old leather-stocking will be discovered. Wait for me in the edge of these woods, that at least I may not be seen strolling in the hills by myself just now. One would not wish to create remarks, Louisa, if—if— if... You will wait for me, dear girl?" "'A year in sight of the village, Miss Temple,' returned the agitated Louisa. But do not, do not ask me to go on that hill. Elizabeth found that her companion was really unable to proceed, and they completed their arrangement by posting Louisa out of the observation of the people who occasionally passed, but nigh the road, and in plain view of the whole valley. Miss Temple then proceeded alone. She ascended the road, which has been so often mentioned in our narrative, with an elastic and firm step, fearful that the delay in the store of Mr. Lacroix, and the time necessary for reaching the summit, would prevent her being punctual to the appointment. Whenever she pressed an opening in the bushes, she would pause for breath, or, perhaps drawn from her pursuit by the picture at her feet, would linger a moment to gaze at the beauties of the valley. The long drought had, however, changed its coat of verdure to a hue of brown, and though the same localities were there, the view wanted the lively and cheering aspect of early summer. Even the heavens seemed to share in the dried appearance of the earth, for the sun was concealed by a haziness in the atmosphere which looked like a thin smoke without a particle of moisture, if such a thing were possible. The blue sky was scarcely to be seen, though now and then there was a faint lighting up in spots through which masses of rolling vapor could be discerned gathering around the horizon, as if nature were struggling to collect her floods for the relief of man. The very atmosphere that Elizabeth inhaled was hot and dry, and by the time she reached the point where the course led her from the highway she experienced a sensation like suffocation. But disregarding her feelings, she hastened to execute her mission, dwelling on nothing but the disappointment, and even the helplessness, the hunter would experience without her aid. On the summit of the mountain which Judge Temple had named the Vision, 
A little spot had been cleared, in order that a better view might be obtained of the village and the valley. At this point Elizabeth understood the hunter she was to meet him, and thither she urged her way as expeditiously as the difficulty of the ascent, and the impediment of a forest in a state of nature, would admit. Numberless were the fragments of rocks, trunks of fallen trees and branches, with which she had to contend. But every difficulty vanished before her resolution, and by her own watch she stood on the desired spot several minutes before the appointed hour. After resting a moment on the end of a log, Miss Temple cast a glance about her in quest of her old friend, but he was evidently not in the clearing. She arose and walked around its skirts, examining every place where she thought it probable Natty might deem it prudent to conceal himself. Her search was fruitless, and after exhausting not only herself, but her conjectures, in efforts to discover or imagine his situation, she ventured to trust her voice in that solitary place. Natty, leather stocking, old man, she called aloud in every direction. But no answer was given, excepting the reverberations of her own clear tones, as they were echoed in the parched forest. Elizabeth approached the brow of the mountain, where a faint cry, like the noise produced by striking the hand against the mouth, at the same time that the breath is strongly exhaled, was heard answering to her own voice. Not doubting in the least that it was the leather stocking lying in wait for her, and who gave that signal to indicate the place where he was to be found, Elizabeth descended for near a hundred feet, until she gained a little natural terrace, thinly scattered with trees, that grew in the fissures of the rocks, which were covered by a scanty soil. She had advanced to the edge of this platform, and was gazing over the perpendicular precipice that formed its face, when a rustling among the dry leaves near her drew her eyes in another direction. Our heroine certainly was startled by the object that she then saw, but a moment restored her self-possession, and she advanced firmly, and with some interest in her manner, to the spot. Mohegan was seated on the trunk of a fallen oak, with his tawny visage turned toward her, and his eyes fixed on her face with an expression of wildness and fire, that would have terrified a less resolute female. His blanket had fallen from his shoulders, and was lying in folds around him, leaving his breast, arms, and most of his body bare. The medallion of Washington reposed on his chest, a badge of distinction that Elizabeth well knew he only produced on great and solemn occasions. But the whole appearance of the aged chief was more studied than common, and in some particulars it was terrific. The long black hair was plaited on his head, falling away so as to expose his high forehead and piercing eyes, in the enormous incisions of his ears were entwined ornaments of silver, beads, and porcupine's quills, mingled in a rude taste, and after the Indian fashions. A large drop, composed of similar materials, was suspended from the cartilage of his nose, and falling below his lips, rested on his chin. Streaks of red paint crossed his wrinkled brow and were traced down his cheeks, with such variations in the lines as caprice or custom suggested. His body was also colored in the same manner, the whole exhibiting an Indian warrior prepared for some event of more than usual moment. "'John, how fair you, worthy John!' said Elizabeth, as she approached him. "'You have long been a stranger in the village. You promised me a willow basket, and I have long had a shirt of calico in readiness for you.' The Indian looked steadily at her for some time without answering, and then, shaking his head, he replied in his low, guttural tones, "'John's hand can make baskets no more. He wants no shirt.' "'But if he should, he will know where to come for it,' returned Miss Temple. "'Indeed, old John, I feel as if you had a natural right to order what you will from us.' "'Daughter,' said the Indian, "'listen.' Six times ten hot summers have passed since John was young, tall like a pine, straight like the bullet of Hawkeye, strong as all buffalo, spry as the cat of the mountain. He was strong, and a warrior like the young eagle. If his tribe wanted to track the Maquas for many suns, 
the eye of Chingachgook found the print of their moccasins. If the people feasted and were glad as they counted the scalps of their enemies, it was on his pole they hung. If the squaws cried because there was no meat for their children, he was the first in the chase. His bullet was swifter than the deer. Daughter, then Chingachgook struck his tomahawk into the trees. It was to tell the lazy ones where to find him and the Mingos. But he made no baskets. "'Those times have gone by, old warrior,' returned Elizabeth. "'Since then your people have disappeared, and in place of chasing your enemies you have learned to fear God and to live at peace. Stand here, daughter, where you can see the great spring, the wigwams of your father, and the land on the crooked river. John was young when his tribe gave away the country, in council, from where the blue mountain stands above the water to where the Susquehanna is hid by the trees. All this, and all that grew in it, and all that walked over it, and all that fed there, they gave to the fire-eater. For they loved him. He was strong, and they were women, and he helped them. No Delaware would kill a deer that ran in his woods, nor stop a bird that flew over his land. For it was his. Has John lived in peace? Daughter, since John was young, he has seen the white man from Frontenac come down on his white brothers at Albany and fight. Did they fear God? He has seen his English and his American fathers burying their tomahawks in each other's brains, for this very land. Did they fear God, and live in peace? He has seen the land pass away from the fire-eater, and his children, and the child of his child, and a new chief set over the country. Did they live in peace who did this? Did they fear God? Such is the custom of the whites, John. Do not the Delawares fight and exchange their lands for powder and blankets and merchandise? The Indian turned his dark eyes on his companion, and kept them there with a scrutiny that alarmed her a little. Where are the blankets and merchandise that bought the right of the fire-eater? he replied in a more animated voice. Are they with him in his wigwam? Did they say to him, Brother, sell us your land, and take this gold, this silver, these blankets, these rifles, or even this rum? No. They tore it from him, as a scalp is torn from an enemy. And they that did it looked not behind them, to see whether he lived or died. Do such men live in peace, and fear the Great Spirit? "'But you hardly understand the circumstances,' said Elizabeth, more embarrassed than she would own, even to herself. "'If you knew our laws and customs better, you would judge differently of our acts. Do not believe evil of my father, old Mohegan, for he is just and good. The brother of Miquan is good, and he will do right. I have said it to Hawkeye. I have said it to the young eagle that the brother of Miquan would do justice.' "'Whom call you the young eagle?' said Elizabeth, averting her face from the gaze of the Indian, as she asked the question. "'Whence comes he, and what are his rights?' "'Has my daughter lived so long with him to ask this question?' returned the Indian warily. "'Old age freezes up the blood, as the frosts cover the great spring and winter. But youth keeps the streams of the blood open like a sun in the time of blossoms. The young eagle has eyes. Had he no tongue?' The loveliness to which the old warrior alluded was in no degree diminished by his allegorical speech, for the blushes of the maiden who listened covered her burning cheeks till her dark eyes seemed to glow with their reflection. But after struggling a moment with shame, she laughed, as if unwilling to understand him seriously, and replied in pleasantry, "'Not to make me the mistress of his secret. He is too much of a Delaware to tell his secret thoughts to a woman. Daughter, the Great Spirit made your father with a white skin, and he made mine with a red. But he colored both their hearts with blood. When young, it is swift and warm. But when old, it is still and cold. Is there difference below the skin? No. Once John had a woman. She was the mother of so many sons. He raised his hand with three fingers elevated. And she had daughters that would have made the young Delawares happy. She was kind, daughter, 
and what I said she did. You have different fashions. But do you think John did not love the wife of his youth, the mother of his children? And what has become of your family, John? Your wife and your children, asked Elizabeth, touched by the Indian's manner. Where is the ice that covered the great spring? It is melted, and gone with the waters. John has lived till all his people have left him for the land of spirits. His time has come, and he is ready. Mohegan dropped his head in his blanket and sat in silence. Miss Temple knew not what to say. She wished to draw the thoughts of the old warrior from his gloomy recollections. But there was a dignity in his sorrow, and in his fortitude, that repressed her efforts to speak. After a long pause, however, she renewed the discourse by asking, "'Where is the leather-stocking, John? I have brought this canister of powder at his request. But he is nowhere to be seen. Will you take charge of it, and see it delivered?' The Indian raised his head slowly, and looked earnestly at the gift which she put into his hand. "'This is the great enemy of my nation. Without this, when could the white man drive the Delawares?' Daughter, the Great Spirit gave your fathers to know how to make guns and powder, that they might sweep the Indians from the land. There will soon be no redskin in the country. When John has gone, the last will leave these hills, and his family will be dead." The aged warrior stretched his body forward, leaning an elbow on his knee, and appeared to be taking a parting look at the objects of the veil, which were still visible through the misty atmosphere though the air seemed to thicken at each moment around Miss Temple, who became conscious of an increased difficulty of respiration. The eye of Mohegan changed gradually from its sorrowful expression to a look of wildness that might be supposed to border on the inspiration of a prophet, as he continued. But he will go on to the country where his fathers have met. The game shall be plenty as the ash in the lakes. No woman shall cry for meat. No mingo can ever come. The chase shall be for children, and all just red men shall live together as brothers. "'John, this is not the heaven of a Christian,' cried Miss Temple. "'You deal now in the superstition of your forefathers.' "'Fathers, sons,' said Mohegan with firmness, "'all gone, all gone. I have no son but the young eagle, and he has the blood of a white man.' "'Tell me, John,' said Elizabeth, willing to draw his thoughts to other subjects, and at the same time yielding to her own powerful interest in the youth, "'who is this Mr. Edwards? Why are you so fond of him, and whence does he come?' The Indian started at the question, which evidently recalled his recollection to earth. Taking her hand, he drew Miss Temple to a seat beside him, and pointed to the country beneath them. "'See, daughter,' he said directing her looks toward the north. As far as your young eyes can see, it was the land of his. But immense volumes of smoke at that moment rolled over their heath, and, whirling in the eddies formed by the mountains, interposed a barrier to their sight, while he was speaking. Startled by this circumstance, Miss Temple sprang to her feet, and turning her eyes toward the summit of the mountain, she beheld it covered by a similar canopy, while a roaring sound was heard in the forest above her like the rushing of winds. "'What means it, John?' she exclaimed. "'We are enveloped in smoke, and I feel a heat like the glow of a furnace.' Before the Indian could reply, a voice was heard crying in the woods. "'John! Where are you, old Mohegan? The woods are on fire, and you have but a minute for escape.' The chief put his hand before his mouth, and making it lay on his lips, produced the kind of noise that had attracted Elizabeth to the place when a quick and hurried step was heard dashing through the dried underbrush and bushes, and presently Edwards rushed to his side, with horror on every feature. End of chapter 36 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 37 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale, by James Fenimore Cooper this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 37 Love Rules the Court, the Camp, the Grove 
Lay of the Last Minstrel "'It would have been sad indeed to lose you in such a manner, my old friend,' said Oliver, catching his breath for utterance. "'Up and away! Even now we may be too late. The flames are circling round the point of the rock below, and unless we can pass there our only chance must be over the precipice. Away! Away! Shake off your apathy, John. Now is the time of need.' Mohegan pointed toward Elizabeth, who, forgetting her danger, had sunk back to a projection of the rock as soon as she recognized the sounds of Edward's voice, and said with something like awakened animation, "'Save her! Leave John to die!' "'Her! Whom mean you?' cried the youth, turning quickly to the place the other indicated. But when he saw the figure of Elizabeth bending toward him, in an attitude that powerfully spoke terror, blended with reluctance to meet him in such a place, the shock deprived him of speech. "'Miss Temple,' he cried, when he found words, "'you here! Is such a death reserved for you?' "'No, no, no, no death, I hope, for any of us, Mr. Edwards,' she replied, endeavouring to speak calmly. "'There is smoke, but no fire to harm us. Let us endeavour to retire.' "'Take my arm,' said Edwards. There must be an opening in some direction for your retreat. Are you equal to the effort? Certainly. You surely magnify the danger, Mr. Edwards. Lead me out the way you came. I will, I will, cried the youth, with a kind of hysterical utterance. No, no, there is no danger. I have alarmed you unnecessarily. But shall we leave the Indian? Can we leave him, as he says, to die? An expression of painful emotion crossed the face of the young man. He stopped and cast a longing look at Mohegan, but dragging his companion after him, even against her will, he pursued his way with enormous strides toward the pass by which he had just entered the circle of flame. "'Do not regard him,' he said in those tones that denote a desperate calmness. "'He is used to the woods and such scenes.' and he will escape up the mountain, over the rock, or he can remain where he is in safety. "'You thought not so this moment, Edwards. "'Do not leave him there to meet with such a death,' cried Elizabeth, fixing a look on the countenance of her conductor that seemed to distrust his sanity. "'An Indian born! Who ever heard of an Indian dying by fire? An Indian cannot burn! The idea is ridiculous! Hasten! Hasten, Miss Temple!' or the smoke may incommodate you. Edwards, your look, your eye, terrifies me. Tell me the danger. Is it greater than it seems? I am equal to any trial. If we reach the point of yon rock before that sheet of fire, we are safe, Miss Temple, exclaimed the young man in a voice that burst without the bounds of his forced composure. Fly! The struggle is for life! The place of the interview between Miss Temple and the Indian has already been described as one of those platforms of rock, which form a sort of terrace in the mountains of that country, and the face of it, we have said, was both high and perpendicular. Its shape was nearly a natural arc, the ends of which blended with the mountain, at points where its sides were less abrupt in their descent. It was round one of these terminations of the sweep of the rock that Edwards had ascended and it was toward the same place that he urged Elizabeth to a desperate exertion of speed. Immense clouds of white smoke had been pouring over the summit of the mountain, and had concealed the approach and ravages of the element. But a crackling sound drew the eyes of Miss Temple, as she flew over the ground supported by the young man, toward the outline of smoke where she already perceived the waving flames shooting forward from the vapor, now flaring high in the air and then bending to the earth, seeming to light into combustion every stick and shrub on which they breathed. The sight aroused them to redoubled efforts. But unfortunately, a collection of the tops of trees, old and dried, lay directly across their course, and at the very moment when both had thought their safety ensured, the warm current of the air swept a forked tongue of flame across the pile, which lighted at the touch, and when they reached the spot, the flying pair were opposed by the surly roaring of a body of fire, as if a furnace were glowing in their path. They recoiled from the heat, and stood on a point of the rock, gazing in a stupor at the flames which were spreading rapidly down the mountain, whose side, too, became a sheet of living fire. 
It was dangerous for one clad in the light and airy dress of Elizabeth to approach even the vicinity of the raging element, and those flowing robes that gave such softness and grace to her form seemed now to be formed for the instruments of her destruction. The villagers were accustomed to resort to that hill in quest of timber and fuel, in procuring which it was their usage to take only the bodies of the trees, leaving the tops and branches to decay under the operations of the weather. Much of the hill was consequently covered with such light fuel, which, having been scorched under the sun for the last two months, was ignited with a touch. Indeed, in some cases there did not appear to be any contact between the fire and these piles, but the flames seemed to dart from heap to heap, as the fabulous fire of the temple is represented to reillumine its neglected lamp. There was beauty as well as terror in the sight, and Edwards and Elizabeth stood viewing the progress of the desolation with a strange mixture of horror and interest. The former, however, shortly roused himself to new exertions, and drawing his companion after him they skirted the edge of the smoke, the young man penetrating frequently into its dense volumes in search of a passage, but in every instance without success. In this manner they proceeded in a semicircle around the upper part of the terrace, until arriving at the verge of the precipice opposite to the point where Edwards had ascended, the horrid conviction burst on both, at the same instant that they were completely encircled by fire. So long as a single pass up or down the mountain was unexplored, there was hope. But when retreat seemed to be absolutely impracticable, the horror of their situation broke upon Elizabeth as powerfully as if she had hitherto considered the danger light. "'This mountain is doomed to be fatal to me,' she whispered. "'We shall find our graves on it.' "'Say not so, Miss Temple. There is yet hope,' returned the youth, in the same tone, while the vacant expression of his eye contradicted his words. "'Let us return to the point of the rock. There is—there must be—some place about it where we can descend.' "'Lead me there!' exclaimed Elizabeth. "'Let us leave no effort untried.' She did not wait for his compliance, but, turning, retraced her steps to the brow of the precipice murmuring to herself in suppressed hysterical sobs, "'My father! My poor, my distracted father!' Edwards was by her side in an instant, and with aching eyes he examined every fissure in the crags in quest of some opening that might offer facilities for flight. But the smooth, even surface of the rocks afforded hardly a resting place for a foot, much less those continued projections which would have been necessary for a descent of nearly a hundred feet. Edwards was not slow in feeling the conviction that this hope was also futile, and with a kind of feverish despair that still urged him to action, he turned to some new expedient. "'There is nothing left, Miss Temple,' he said, "'but to lower you from this place to the rock beneath. If Natty were here, or even that Indian could be roused, their ingenuity and long practice would easily devise methods to do it. But I am a child at this moment in everything but daring. Where shall I find means? This dress of mine is so light, and there is so little of it. Then the blanket of Mohegan. We must try. We must try. Anything is better than to see you a victim to such a death. And what will become of you? said Elizabeth. Indeed, indeed, neither you nor John must be sacrificed to my safety. He heard her not, for he was already by the side of Mohegan, who yielded his blanket without a question, retaining his seat with Indian dignity and composure, though his own situation was even more critical than that of the others. The blanket was cut into shreds, and the fragments fastened together. The loose linen jacket of the youth and the light muslin shawl of Elizabeth were attached to them, and the whole thrown over the rocks with the rapidity of lightning but the united pieces did not reach half-way to the bottom. "'It will not do! It will not do!' cried Elizabeth. "'For me there is no hope. The fire comes slowly, but certainly. See, it destroys the very earth before it.' Had the flames spread on that rock with half the quickness with which they leaped from bush to tree in other parts of the mountain, our painful task would have soon ended, for they would have consumed already the captives they enclosed. 
but the peculiarity of their situation afforded Elizabeth and her companion the respite of which they had availed themselves to make the efforts we have recorded. The thin covering of earth on the rock supported but a scanty and faded herbage, and most of the trees that had found root in the fissures had already died, during the intense heats of preceding summers. Those which still retained the appearance of life bore a few dry and withered leaves, while the others were merely the wrecks of pines, oaks, and maples. No better materials to feed the fire could be found, had there been a communication with the flames. But the ground was destitute of the brush that led the destructive element, like a torrent, over the remainder of the hill. As auxiliary to this scarcity of fuel, one of the large springs which abound in that country gushed out of the side of the ascent above, and after creeping sluggishly along the level land, saturating the mossy covering of the rock with moisture, it swept around the base of the little cone that formed the pinnacle of the mountain, and, entering the canopy of smoke near one of the terminations of the terrace, found its way to the lake, not by dashing from rock to rock, but by the secret channels of the earth. It would rise to the surface here and there in the wet seasons, but in the droughts of summer it was to be traced only by the bogs and moss that announced the proximity of water. When the fire reached this barrier, it was compelled to pause, until a concentration of its heat could overcome the moisture, like an army awaiting the operations of a battering train to open its way to desolation. That fatal moment seemed now to have arrived, for the hissing steams of the spring appeared to be nearly exhausted, and the moss of the rocks was already curling under the intense heat, while fragments of bark that yet clung to the dead trees began to separate from their trunks, and fall to the ground in crumbling masses. The air seemed quivering with rays of heat, which might be seen playing along the parched stems of the trees. There were moments when dark clouds of smoke would sweep along the little terrace, and as the eye lost its power, the other senses contributed to give effect to the fearful horror of the scene. At such moments the roaring of the flames, the crackling of the furious element, with the tearing of falling branches, and occasionally the thundering echoes of some falling tree, united to alarm the victims. Of the three, however, the youth appeared much the most agitated. Elizabeth, having relinquished entirely the idea of escape, was fast obtaining that resigned composure with which the most delicate of her sex are sometimes known to meet unavoidable evils. While Mohegan, who was much nearer to the danger, maintained his seat with the invincible resignation of an Indian warrior. Once or twice the eye of the aged chief, which was ordinarily fixed in the direction of the distant hills, turned toward the young pair, who seemed doomed to so early a death, with a slight indication of pity crossing his composed features. But it would immediately revert again to its former gaze, as if already looking into the womb of futurity. Much of the time he was chanting a kind of low dirge in the Delaware tongue, using the deep and remarkable guttural tones of his people. "'At such a moment, Mr. Edwards, all earthly distinctions end,' whispered Elizabeth. "'Persuade John to move nearer to us. Let us die together.' "'I cannot. He will not stir,' returned the youth, in the same horridly still tones. He considers this as the happiest moment of his life. He is past seventy, and has been decaying rapidly for some time. He received some injury in chasing that unlucky deer, too, on the lake. Oh, Miss Temple, that was an unlucky chase, indeed. It has led, I fear, to this awful scene. The smile of Elizabeth was celestial. Why name such a trifle now? At this moment the heart is dead to all earthly emotions. If anything could reconcile a man to this death, cried the youth, it would be to meet it in such company. Talk not so, Edwards, talk not so, interrupted Miss Temple. I am unworthy of it, and it is unjust to yourself. We must die, yes, yes, we must die. It is the will of God, and let us endeavor to submit like his own children. Die! the youth rather shrieked than exclaimed, No, 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 there must yet be hope. You at least must not, shall not die. 
"'In what way can we escape?' asked Elizabeth, pointing with a look of heavenly composure toward the fire. "'Observe. The flame is crossing the barrier of wet ground. It comes slowly, Edwards, but surely. Ah, see, the tree. The tree is already lighted.' Her words were too true. The heat of the conflagration had at length overcome the resistance of the spring, and the fire was slowly stealing along the half-dried moss, while a dead pine kindled with the touch of a forked flame that, for a moment, wreathed around the stem of the tree, as it whined in one of its evolutions under the influence of the air. The effect was instantaneous. The flames danced along the parched trunk of the pine, like lightning quivering on a chain and immediately a column of living fire was raging on the terrace. It soon spread from tree to tree, and the scene was evidently drawing to a close. The log on which Mohegan was seated lighted at its further end, and the Indian appeared to be surrounded by fire. Still he was unmoved. As his body was unprotected, his sufferings must have been great, but his fortitude was superior to all. His voice could yet be heard even in the midst of these horrors. Elizabeth turned her head from the sight, and faced the valley. Furious eddies of wind were created by the heat, and just at the moment the canopy of fiery smoke that overhung the valley was cleared away, leaving a distinct view of the peaceful village beneath them. "'My father! My father!' shrieked Elizabeth. "'Oh, this surely might have been spared me. But I submit.' The distance was not so great, but the figure of Judge Temple could be seen, standing in his own grounds, and apparently contemplating, in perfect unconsciousness of the danger of his child, the mountain in flames. This sight was still more painful than the approaching danger, and Elizabeth again faced the hill. "'My intemperate warmth has done this,' cried Edwards in the accents of despair. If I had possessed but a moiety of your heavenly resignation, Miss Temple, all might yet have been well. "'Name it not! Name it not!' she said. "'It is now of no avail. We must die, Edwards. We must die. Let us do so as Christians. But—no, you may yet escape, perhaps. Your dress is not so fatal as mine. Fly! Leave me! An opening may yet be found for you, possibly. Certainly it is worth the effort. Fly! Leave me! But stay! You will see my father, my poor, my bereaved father. Say to him, then, Edwards, say to him all that can appease his anguish. Tell him that I died happy and collected, that I have gone to my beloved mother, that the hours of this life are nothing when balanced in the scales of eternity. Say how we shall meet again. And say, she continued, dropping her voice, that had risen with her feelings, as if conscious of her worldly weakness, how dear, how very dear was my love for him, that it was near, too near, to my love for God. The youth listened to her touching accents, but moved not. In a moment he found utterance, and replied, And it is me that you command to leave you. To leave you on the edge of the grave? Oh, Miss Temple, how little have you known me, he cried, dropping on his knees at her feet, and gathering her flowing robe in his arms as if to shield her from the flames. I have been driven to the woods in despair, but your society has tamed the lion within me. If I have wasted my time in degradation, t'was you that charmed me to it. If I have forgotten my name and family, your form supplied the place of memory. If I have forgotten my wrongs, t'was you that taught me charity. No, no, dearest Elizabeth, I may die with you, but I can never leave you." Elizabeth moved not, nor answered. It was plain that her thoughts had been raised from the earth. The recollection of her father, and her regrets at their separation, had been mellowed by a holy sentiment that lifted her above the level of earthly things and she was fast losing the weakness of her sex in the near view of eternity. But as she listened to those words she became once more woman. She struggled against these feelings, and smiled, as she thought she was shaking off the last lingering feeling of nature, when the world, and all its seductions, 
rushed again to her heart, with the sounds of a human voice, crying in piercing tones, "'Gal! Where be ye, gal? Gladden the heart of an old man, if ye yet belong to earth!' "'Hist!' said Elizabeth. "'Tis the leather-stocking. He seeks me!' "'Tis Natty!' shouted Edwards, "'and we may yet be saved!' A wide and circling flame glared on their eyes for a moment, even above the fire of the woods, and a loud report followed. "'Tis the canister! "'Tis the powder!' cried the same voice, evidently approaching them. "'Tis the canister, and the precious child is lost!' At the next instant Natty rushed through the steams of the spring, and appeared on the terrace, without his deerskin cap, his hair burnt to his head, his shirt of country check, black and filled with holes, and his red features of a deeper color than ever, by the heat he had encountered. End of chapter 37 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 38 of the Pioneers, or the Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 38 Even from the land of shadows now my father's awful ghost appears. Gertrude of Wyoming for an hour after Louisa Grant was left by Miss Temple, in the situation already mentioned, she continued in feverish anxiety, awaiting the return of her friend. But as the time passed by without the reappearance of Elizabeth, the terror of Louisa gradually increased, until her alarmed fancy had conjured every species of danger that appertained to the woods, excepting the one that really existed. The heavens had become obscured by degrees and vast volumes of smoke were pouring over the valley, but the thoughts of Louisa were still recurring to beasts, without dreaming of the real cause for apprehension. She was stationed in the edge of the low pines and chestnuts that succeed the first or large growth of the forest, and directly above the angle where the highway turned from the straight course to the village, and ascended the mountain laterally. Consequently, she commanded a view not only of the valley, but of the road beneath her. The few travellers that passed, she observed, were engaged in earnest conversation, and frequently raised their eyes to the hill, and at length she saw the people leaving the courthouse, and gazing upward also. While under the influence of the alarm, excited by such unusual movements, reluctant to go, and yet fearful to remain, Louisa was startled by the low, cracking, but cautious treads of some one approaching through the bushes. She was on the eve of flight when Natty emerged from the cover, and stood at her side. The old man laughed as he shook her kindly by a hand that was passive with fear. "'I am glad to meet you here, child,' he said. "'For the back of the mountain is a fire, and it would be dangerous to go up it now, till it has been burnt over once, and the dead wood is gone. There's a foolish man, the comrade of that barment who has given me all this trouble, digging for ore on the east side.' I told him that the careless fellows who thought to catch a practiced hunter in the woods after dark had thrown the lighted pine knots in the brush, and that would kindle like tow, and warned him to leave the hill. But he was set upon his business, and nothing short of providence could move him. If he isn't burnt and buried in a grave of his own digging, he's made of salamanders. Why, what ails the child? You look as skeery as if you'd seed more painters. I wish there were more to be found. They'd count up faster than the beaver. But where's the good child with a bad father? Did she forget her promise to the old man? The hill! The hill! shrieked Louisa. She seeks you on the hill with the powder! Natty recoiled several feet at this unexpected intelligence. The Lord of Heaven have mercy on her. She's on the vision. And that's a sheet of fire agin this. Child, if you love the dear one— and hope to find a friend when you need it most, to the village, and give the alarm. The men are used to fighting fire, and there may be a chance left. Fly! I bid ye fly, nor stop even for breath." The leather-stocking had no sooner uttered this injunction than he disappeared in the bushes, 
and when last seen by Louisa was rushing up the mountain with a speed that none but those who were accustomed to the toil could attain. "'Have I found you?' the old man exclaimed, when he burst out of the smoke. "'God be praised that I have found you! But follow! There's no time for talking!' "'My dress,' said Elizabeth. "'It would be fatal to trust myself nearer to the flames in it.' "'I bethought me of your flimsy things,' cried Natty, throwing loose the folds of a covering buckskin that he carried on his arm, and wrapping her form in it, in such a manner as to envelop her whole person. Now, follow, for it's a matter of life and death to us all.' "'But, John, what will become of John?' cried Edwards. "'Can we leave the old warrior here to perish?' The eyes of Natty followed the direction of Edward's finger, where he beheld the Indian still seated as before, with the very earth under his feet consuming with fire. Without delay the hunter approached the spot, and spoke in Delaware. "'Up and away, Chingachgook! Will you stay here to burn like a mingo at the stake? The Moravians have teached you better, I hope. The Lord preserve me if the powder hasn't flashed atween his legs, and the skin of his back is roasting. Will you come, I say?' Will you follow me?" "'Why should Mohegan go?' returned the Indian gloomily. "'He has seen the days of an eagle, and his eye grows dim. He looks on the valley, he looks on the water, he looks in the hunting-grounds, but he sees no Delawares. Every one has a white skin. My fathers say, from the far-off land, come. My women, my young warriors, my tribe say, come. The Great Spirit says, come. Let Mohegan die. "'But you forget your friend,' cried Edwards. "'Tis useless to talk to an Indian with the death-fit on him, lad,' interrupted Natty, who seized the strips of the blanket, and with wonderful dexterity strapped the passive chieftain to his own back. When he turned, and with a strength that seemed to bid defiance, not only to his years, but to his load, he led the way to the point whence he had issued. As they crossed the little terrace of rock, one of the dead trees that had been tottering for several minutes fell on the spot where they had stood, and filled the air with its cinders. Such an event quickened the steps of the party, who followed the leather stocking with the urgency required by the occasion. "'Tread on the soft ground,' he cried, when they were in a gloom where sight availed them but little, and keep in the white smoke. Keep the skin close on her, lad. She's a precious one. Another will be hard to be found.' Obedient to the hunter's directions, they followed his steps and advice implicitly, and although the narrow passage along the winding of the spring led amid burning logs and falling branches, they happily achieved it in safety. No one but a man long accustomed to the woods could have traced his route through the smoke, in which respiration was difficult and sight nearly useless, but the experience of Natty conducted them to an opening through the rocks, where, with a little difficulty, they soon descended to another terrace, and emerged at once into a tolerably clear atmosphere. The feelings of Edwards and Elizabeth at reaching this spot may be imagined, though not easily described. No one seemed to exult more than their guide, who turned with Mohegan still lashed to his back, and laughing in his own manner, said, "'I knowed twas the Frenchman's powder, gal. It went so altogether. Your coarse grain will squib for a minute.' The Iroquois had none of the best powder when I went again the Canada tribes under Sir William. Did I ever tell you the story, lad, concerning the scrimmage with— For God's sake! Tell me nothing now, Natty, until we are entirely safe. Where shall we go next? Why, on the platform of rock, over the cave, to be sure. You will be safe enough there. Or we'll go into it, if you be so minded. The young man started, and appeared agitated. But looking around him with an anxious eye, said quickly— Shall we be safe on the rock? Cannot the fire reach us there, too? Can't the boy see, said Natty, with the coolness of one accustomed to the kind of danger he had just encountered. Had you stayed in the place above ten minutes longer, you would both have been in ashes. But here you may stay forever, and no fire can touch you, until they burn the rocks as well as the woods. With this assurance, which was obviously true, they proceeded to the spot, and Natty deposited his load placing the Indian on the ground with his back against a fragment of the rocks. Elizabeth sank on the ground and buried her face in her hands, while her heart was swelling with a variety of conflicting emotions. "'Let me urge you to take a restorative, Miss Temple,' said Edwards respectfully. 
Your frame will sink, else. Leave me, leave me, she said, raising her beaming eyes for a moment to his. I feel too much for words. I am grateful, Oliver, for this miraculous escape, and next to my God, to you. Edwards withdrew to the edge of the rock, and shouted, Benjamin! Where are you, Benjamin? A hoarse voice replied, as if from the bowels of the earth. Here away, master. Stowed in this here bit of a hole, which is all the time as hot as the cook's coppers. I'm tired of my berth, d'ye see, and if so be that leather-stocking has got much overhauling to do before he sails after them said beaver, I'll go into dock again, and write out my quarantine, till I can get protic from the law, and so hold on uh, upon the rest of my spaniolas. Bring up a glass of water from the spring, continued Edwards, and throw a little wine in it. Hasten, I entreat you. I knows but little of your small drink, Master Oliver, returned the steward, his voice issuing out of the cave into the open air, and the Jamaiki held out no longer than to take a parting kiss with Billy Kirby, when he anchored me alongside the highway last night, where you run me down in the chase. But here's summit of a red collar that may suit a weak stomach, mayhap. That Master Kirby is no first-rate in a boat, but he'll tack a cart among the stumps, all the same as a London pilot will back and fill through the colliers in the pool. As the steward ascended while talking, by the time he had ended his speech he appeared on the rock with the desired restoratives, exhibiting the worn-out and bloated features of a man who had run deep in a debauch, and that lately. Elizabeth took from the hands of Edwards the liquor which he offered, and then motioned to be left again to herself. The youth turned at her bidding, and observed Natty kindly assiduous around the person of Mohegan. When their eyes met, the hunter said sorrowfully, "'His time is come, lad. See it in his eyes. When an Indian fixes his eye, he means to go but to one place. And what the willful creatures put their minds on, they're sure to do.' A quick tread prevented the reply, and in a few moments, to the amazement of the whole party, Mr. Grant was seen clinging to the side of the mountain, and striving to reach the place where they stood. Oliver sprang to his assistance, and by their united efforts the worthy divine was soon placed safely among them. "'How came you added to our number?' cried Edwards. "'Is the hill alive with people at a time like this?' The hasty but pious thanksgivings of the clergyman were soon ejaculated, and when he succeeded in collecting his bewildered senses, he replied, I heard that my child was seen coming to the mountain, and when the fire broke over its summit, my uneasiness drew me up the road, where I found Louisa, in terror for Miss Temple. It was to seek her that I came into this dangerous place, and I think, but for God's mercy, through the dogs of Natty, I should have perished in the flames myself. "'Aye, follow the hounds, and if there's an opening they'll scent it out,' said Natty. "'Their noses be given them the same as man's reason.' I did so, and they led me to this place, but praise be to God that I see you all safe and well. No, no, returned the hunter. Safe we be, but as for well, John can't be called in a good way, unless you'll say that for a man that's taking his last look at earth. He speaks the truth, said the divine, with the holy awe with which he ever approached the dying. I have been by too many deathbeds not to see that the hand of the tyrant is laid on this old warrior. Oh, how consoling it is to know that he has not rejected the offered mercy in the hour of his strength and of worldly temptations. The offspring of a race of heathens, he has in truth been as a brand plucked from the burning. No, no, returned Natty, who alone stood with him by the side of the dying warrior. It is no burning that ails him, though his Indian feelings made him scorn to move, unless it be the burning of man's wicked thoughts for near fourscore years but it's nature giving out in a chasm that's run too long. Down with you, Hector, down, I say. Flesh isn't iron, that a man can live forever, and see his kith and kin driven to a far country, and he left to mourn, with none to keep him company. John, said the divine tenderly, do you hear me? Do you wish the prayers appointed by the church at this trying moment? The Indian turned his ghastly face toward the speaker, and fastened his dark eyes on him steadily but vacantly. No sign of recognition was made, and in a moment he moved his head again slowly toward the veil, and began to sing, using his own language, in those low guttural tones, 
that have been so often mentioned, his notes rising with his theme, till they swelled so loud as to be distinct. I will come, I will come, to the land of the just I will come. The Maquas I have slain, I have slain the Maquas, and the great spirit calls to his son. I will come, I will come to the land of the just, I will come. What says he, Leather Stocking? inquired the priest with tender interest. Sings he the Redeemer's praise? No, no, tis his own praise that he speaks now, said Natty, turning in a melancholy manner from the sight of his dying friend. And a good right he has to say it all, for I know every word to be true. May heaven avert such self-righteousness from his heart. Humility and penitence are the seals of Christianity and without feeling them deeply seated in the soul, all hope is delusive, and leads to vain expectations. Praise himself when his whole soul and body should unite to praise his Maker. John, you have enjoyed the blessings of a gospel ministry, and have been called from out a multitude of sinners and pagans, and, I trust, for a wise and gracious purpose. Do you now feel what it is to be justified by our Saviour's death? and reject all weak and idle dependence on good works that spring from man's pride and vainglory?" The Indian did not regard his interrogator, but he raised his head again, and said in a low, distinct voice, "'Who can say that the Makas know the back of the Mohegan? What enemy that trusted in him did not see the morning? What Mingo that he chased ever sang the song of triumph? Did Mohegan ever he? No. The truth lived in him, and none else could come out of him. In his youth he was a warrior, and his moccasins left the stain of blood. In his age he was wise. His words at the council fire did not blow away with the winds. Ah! He has abandoned that vain relic of paganism, his songs, cried the divine. What says he now? Is he sensible of his lost state? "'Lord, man,' said Natty, "'he knows his end is at hand as well as you or I. "'But so far from thinking it a loss, "'he believes it to be a great gain. "'He is old and stiff, "'and you have made the game so scarce and shy "'that better shots than him find it hard to get a livelihood. "'Now he thinks he shall travel "'where it will always be good hunting, "'where no wicked or unjust Indians can go, "'and where he shall meet all his tribe together again.' There's not much loss in that, to a man whose hands are hardly fit for basket-making. Loss! If there be any loss, twill be to me. I'm sure after he's gone there will be but little left for me but to follow. His example and end, which I humbly trust, shall yet be made glorious, returned Mr. Grant, should lead your mind to dwell on the things of another life. But I feel it to be my duty to smooth the way for the parting spirit. This is the moment, John, when the reflection that you did not reject the mediation of the Redeemer will bring balm to your soul. Trust not to any act of former days, but lay the burden of your sins at his feet, and you have his own blessed assurance that he will not desert you. Though all you say be true, and you have scripture gospels for it, too, said Natty, you will make nothing of the Indian. He hasn't seen a Moravian since the war and it's hard to keep them from going back to their native ways. I should think twould be as well to let the old man pass in peace. He's happy now. I know it by his eye. And that's more than I would say for the chiefs in the time the Delawares broke up from the headwaters of their river and went west. Ah's me! Tis a grievous long time, that, and many dark days have we seen together sin it. Hawkeye! said Mohegan, rousing with the last glimmering of life. Hawkeye, listen to the words of your brother. Yes, John, said the hunter in English, strongly affected by the appeal, and drawing to his side. We have been brothers, and more so than it means in the Indian tongue. What would you have with me, Chingachgook? Hawkeye, my fathers call me to the happy hunting grounds. The path is clear and the eyes of Mohegan grow young. I look, but I see no white skins. There are none to be seen but just and brave Indians. Farewell, Hawkeye. You shall go with the fire-eater and the young eagle to the white man's heaven, but I go after my father's. 
Let the bow, and tomahawk, and pipe, and the wampum of Mohegan be laid in his grave. For when he starts, twill be in the night, like a warrior, on a war-party, and he cannot stop to seek them. "'What says he, Nathaniel?' cried Mr. Grant, earnestly and with obvious anxiety. "'Does he recall the promises of the mediation, and trust his salvation to the Rock of Ages?' Although the faith of the hunter was by no means clear, yet the fruits of early instruction had not entirely fallen in the wilderness. He believed in one God, and one heaven, and when the strong feeling excited by the leave-taking of his old companion, which was exhibited by the powerful working of every muscle in his weather-beaten face, suffered him to speak, he replied, No, no. He trusts only to the great spirit of the savages, and to his own good deeds. He thinks, like all his people, that he is to be young again, and to hunt, and be happy to the end of eternity. It's pretty much the same with all colors, parson. I could never bring myself to think that I shall meet with these hounds, or my peace, in another world, though the thought of leaving them forever sometimes brings hard feelings over me, and makes me cling to life with a greater craving than beseems threescore and ten. The Lord in his mercy avert such a death from one who has been sealed with the sign of the cross, cried the minister, in holy fervor. John! He paused for the elements. During the period occupied by the events which we have related, the dark clouds in the horizon had continued to increase in numbers and multitude, and the awful stillness that now pervaded the air announced a crisis in the state of the atmosphere. The flames, which yet continued to rage along the sides of the mountains, no longer whirled in uncertain currents of their own eddies, but blazed high and steadily toward the heavens. There was even a quietude in the ravages of the destructive element, as if it foresaw that a hand greater than even its own desolating power was about to stay its progress. The piles of smoke which lay above the valley began to rise, and were dispelling rapidly. And streaks of livid lightning were dancing through the masses of clouds that impended over the western hills. While Mr. Grant was speaking, a flash, which sent its quivering light through the gloom, laying bare the whole opposite horizon, was followed by a loud crash of thunder, that rolled away among the hills, seeming to shake the foundations of the earth to their center. Mohegan raised himself, as if in obedience to a signal for his departure, and stretched his wasted arm toward the west his dark face lighted with a look of joy, which, with all other expressions, gradually disappeared, the muscles stiffening as they retreated to a state of rest. A slight convulsion played, for a single instant, about his lips, and his arms slowly dropped by his side, leaving the frame of the dead warrior reposing against the rock, with its glassy eyes open, and fixed on the distant hills, as if the deserted shell were tracing the flight of the spirit to its new abode. All this Mr. Grant witnessed in silent awe. But when the last echoes of the thunder died away, he clasped his hands together with pious energy, and repeated in the full rich tones of assured faith, Lord, how unsearchable are thy judgments, and thy ways past finding out! I know that my Redeemer liveth, and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth. And though after my skin worms destroy this body, yet in my flesh shall I see God, whom I shall see for myself, and mine eyes shall behold, and not another. As the divine closed this burst of devotion, he bowed his head meekly to his bosom, and looked all the dependence and humility that the inspired language expressed. When Mr. Grant retired from the body, the hunter approached, and taking the rigid hand of his friend, looked him wistfully in the face for some time without speaking, when he gave vent to his feelings by saying in the mournful voice of one who felt deeply, "'Red skin or white, it's all over now. He's to be judged by a righteous judge, and by no laws that's made to suit times and new ways. Well, there's only one more death and the world will be left to me and the hounds. Ah's me! A man must wait the time of God's pleasure, but I begin to weary of life. There is scarcely a tree standing that I know, and it's hard to find a face that I was acquainted with in my younger days. 
Large drops of rain now began to fall, and diffused themselves over the dry rock, while the approach of the thunder-shower was rapid and certain. The body of the Indian was hastily removed into the cave beneath, followed by the whining hounds who missed and moaned for the look of intelligence that had always met their salutations to the chief. Edwards made some hasty and confused excuse for not taking Elizabeth into the same place, which was now completely closed in front with logs and bark, saying something that she hardly understood about its darkness, and the unpleasantness of being with the dead body. Miss Temple, however, found a sufficient shelter against the torrent of rain that fell, under the projection of a rock which overhung them, but long before the shower was over, the sounds of voices were heard below them crying aloud for Elizabeth, and men soon appeared beating the dying embers of the bushes as they worked their way cautiously among the young extinguished brands. At the first short cessation in the rain, Oliver conducted Elizabeth to the road, where he left her. Before parting, however, he found time to say, in a fervent manner that his companion was now at no loss to interpret, "'The moment of concealment is over, Miss Temple. By this time to-morrow I shall remove a veil that perhaps it has been weakness to keep around me and my alias so long. But I have had romantic and foolish wishes and weakness. And who is not that is young and torn by conflicting passions? God bless you. I hear your father's voice. He is coming up the road.' and I would not just now subject myself to detention. Thank heaven you are safe again. That alone removes the weight of a world from my spirit." He waited for no answer, but sprang into the woods. Elizabeth, notwithstanding, she heard the cries of her father as he called upon her name, paused until he was concealed among the smoking trees, when she turned, and in a moment rushed into the arms of her half-distracted parent. A carriage had been provided into which Miss Temple hastily entered, when the cry was passed along the hill that the lost one was found, and the people returned to the village wet and dirty, but elated with the thought that the daughter of their landlord had escaped from so horrid and untimely an end. AUTHOR'S INSERTION The probability of a fire in the woods similar to that here described has been questioned. The writer can only say that he once witnessed a fire in another part of New York that compelled a man to desert his wagon and horses in the highway, and in which the latter were destroyed. In order to estimate the probability of such an event, it is necessary to remember the effects of a long drought in that climate, and the abundance of dead wood which is found in a forest like that described. The fires in the American forests frequently rage to such an extent as to produce a sensible effect on the atmosphere at a distance of fifty miles. Houses, barns, and fences are quite commonly swept away in their course. End of chapter 38 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 39 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale by James Fenimore Cooper this is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 39 Selectar, unsheath then our chief's scimitar. Tambergi, thy larum gives promise of war. Ye mountains that see us descend to the shore, shall view us as victors, or view us no more. Byron the heavy showers that prevailed during the remainder of the day completely stopped the progress of the flames. Though glimmering fires were observed during the night on different parts of the hill, wherever there was a collection of fuel to feed the element. The next day the woods for many miles were black and smoking, and were stripped of every vestige of brush and dead wood, but the pines and hemlocks still reared their heads proudly among the hills and even the smaller trees of the forest retained a feeble appearance of life and vegetation. The many tongues of rumor were busy in exaggerating the miraculous escape of Elizabeth, and a report was generally credited that Mohegan had actually perished in the flames. This belief became confirmed, and was indeed rendered probable, when the direful intelligence reached the village that Jotham Riddell, the miner, 
was found in his hole, nearly dead with suffocation, and burnt to such a degree that no hopes were entertained of his life. The public attention became much alive to the events of the last few days, and just at this crisis the convicted counterfeiters took the hint from Natty, and on the night succeeding the fire found means to cut through their log prison also, and to escape unpunished. When this news began to circulate through the village, blended with the fate of Jotham, and the exaggerated and tortured reports of the events on the hill, the popular opinion was freely expressed as to the propriety of seizing such of the fugitives as remained within reach. Men talked of the cave as a secret receptacle of guilt, and as the rumor of ores and metals found its way into the confused medley of conjectures, counterfeiting, and everything else that was wicked and dangerous to the peace of society, suggested themselves to the busy fancies of the populace. While the public mind was in this feverish state, it was hinted that the wood had been set on fire by Edwards and the leather stocking, and that consequently they alone were responsible for the damages. This opinion soon gained ground, being most circulated by those who, by their own heedlessness, had caused the evil. And there was one irresistible burst of the common sentiment that an attempt should be made to punish the offenders. Richard was by no means deaf to this appeal, and by noon he set about in earnest to see the laws executed. Several stout young men were selected, and taken apart with an appearance of secrecy, where they received some important charge from the sheriff immediately under the eyes, but far removed from the ears, of all in the village. Possessed of a knowledge of their duty, these youths hurried into the hills, with a bustling manner, as if the fate of the world depended on their diligence, and at the same time with an air of mystery as great as if they were engaged on secret matters of the state. At twelve precisely a drum beat the long roll before the bold dragoon and Richard appeared accompanied by Captain Hollister, who was clad in investments as commander of the Templeton Light Infantry, when the former demanded of the latter the aid of the posse comitatus in enforcing the laws of the country. We have not room to record the speeches of the two gentlemen on this occasion, but they are preserved in the columns of the little blue newspaper which is yet to be found on the file, and are said to be highly creditable to the legal formula of one of the parties and to the military precision of the other. Everything had been previously arranged, and as the red-coated drummer continued to roll out his clattering notes, some five-and-twenty privates appeared in the ranks, and arranged themselves in the order of battle. As this corps was composed of volunteers, and was commanded by a man who had passed the first five-and-thirty years of his life in camps and garrisons, it was the non-parallel of military science in that country, and was confidently pronounced by the judicious part of the Templeton community to be equal in skill and appearance to any troops in the known world. In physical endowments they were certainly much superior. To this assertion there were but three dissenting voices, and one dissenting opinion. The opinion belonged to Marmaduke, who, however, saw no necessity for its promulgation. Of the voices, one, and that a pretty loud one, came from the spouse of the commander himself, who frequently reproached her husband for condescending to lead such an irregular band of warriors, after he had filled the honorable station of sergeant-major to a dashing corps of Virginia cavalry through much of the recent war. Another of these skeptical sentiments was invariably expressed by Mr. Pump whenever the company paraded generally in some such terms as these, which were uttered with that sort of meekness that a native of the island of our forefathers is apt to assume when he condescends to praise the customs or character of her truant progeny. It's mayhap that they knows summit about loading and firing, do you see? But as for working ship, why, a corporal's guard of the Bodishis marines would back and fill on their quarters in such a manner as to surround and captivate them all in half a glass. As there was no one to deny this assertion, the marines of the Bodice were held in a corresponding degree of estimation. The third unbeliever was Monsieur Lacroix, who merely whispered to the sheriff that the corps was one of the finest he had ever seen, second only to the musketeers 
of Le Bois Lewis. However, as Mrs. Hollister thought there was something like actual service in the present appearances, and was in consequence too busily engaged with certain preparations of her own to make her comments, as Benjamin was absent, and M. Le Quoy too happy to find fault with anything, the corps escaped criticism and comparison altogether on this momentous day, when they certainly had greater need of self-confidence than on any other previous occasion. Marmaduke was said to be again closeted with Mr. Van der School, and no interruption was offered to the movements of the troops. At two o'clock precisely the corps shouldered arms, beginning on the right wing, next to the veteran, and carrying the motion through to the left with great regularity. When each musket was quietly fixed in its proper situation, the order was given to wheel to the left and march. As this was bringing raw troops at once to face their enemy, it is not to be supposed that the maneuver was executed with their usual accuracy. But as the music struck up the inspiring air of Yankee Doodle, and Richard, accompanied by Mr. Doolittle, preceded the troops boldly down the street, Captain Hollister led on, with his head elevated to forty-five degrees, with a little low-cocked hat perched on his crown, carrying a tremendous dragoon sabre at a poise, and trailing at his heels a huge steel scabbard that had war in its very clattering. There was a good deal of difficulty in getting all the platoons—there were six—to look the same way. But by the time they reached the defile of the bridge, the troops were in sufficiently compact order. In this manner they marched up the hill to the summit of the mountain, no other alteration taking place in the disposition of the forces, excepting that a mutual complaint was made by the sheriff and the magistrate of a failure in wind, which gradually brought these gentlemen to the rear. It will be unnecessary to detail the minute movements that succeeded. We shall briefly say that the scouts came in and reported that, so far from retreating, as had been anticipated, the fugitives had evidently gained a knowledge of the attack, and were fortifying for a desperate resistance. This intelligence certainly made a material change, not only in the plans of the leaders, but in the countenances of the soldiery also. The men looked at one another with serious faces, and Hiram and Richard began to consult together, apart. At this conjuncture they were joined by Billy Kirby, who came along the highway with his axe under his arm, as much in advance of his team as Captain Hollister had been of his troops in the ascent. The woodchopper was amazed at the military array, but the sheriff eagerly availed himself of this powerful reinforcement, and commanded his assistance in putting the laws in force. Billy held Mr. Jones in too much deference to object, and it was finally arranged that he should be the bearer of a summons to the garrison to surrender before they proceeded to extremities. The troops now divided, one party being led by the captain, over the vision, and were brought in on the left of the cave, while the remainder advanced upon its right, under the orders of the lieutenant. Mr. Jones and Dr. Todd, for the surgeon was in attendance also, appeared on the platform of rock, immediately over the heads of the garrison, though out of their sight. Hiram thought this approaching too near, and he therefore accompanied Kirby along the side of the hill, to within a safe distance of the fortifications, where he took shelter behind a tree. Most of the men discovered great accuracy of eye in bringing some object in range between them and their enemy, and the only two of the besiegers, who were left in plain sight of the besieged, were Captain Hollister on one side, and the woodchopper on the other. The veteran stood up boldly to the front, supporting his heavy sword in one undeviating position, with his eye fixed firmly on his enemy, while the huge form of Billy was placed in that kind of quiet repose, with either hand thrust into his bosom, bearing his axe under his right arm, which permitted him, like his own oxen, to rest standing. So far not a word had been exchanged between the belligerents. The besieged had drawn together a pile of black logs and branches of trees, which they had formed into a chevaux de frise, making a little circular abatis in front of the entrance to the cave. As the ground was steep and slippery in every direction around the place, and Benjamin appeared behind the works on one side, and Natty on the other, the arrangement was by no means contemptible. 
especially as the front was sufficiently guarded by the difficulty of the approach. By this time Kirby had received his orders, and he advanced coolly along the mountain, picking his way with the same indifference as if he were pursuing his ordinary business. When he was within a hundred feet of the works, the long and much dreaded rifle of the leather stocking was seen issuing from the parapet, and his voice cried aloud, "'Keep off, Billy Kirby! Keep off! I wish ye no harm, but if a man of ye all comes a step nigher, there'll be blood spilt atwixt us. God forgive the one that draws it first, but so it must be.' "'Come, old chap,' said Billy, good-naturedly. "'Don't be crabbed, but hear what a man has got to say. I'm no concern in the business, only to see right twixt man and man and I don't care the valley of a beetle-ring. Which gets the better? But there's Squire Doolittle, yonder, behind the beech sapling. He has invited me to come in and ask you to give up to the law. That's all. I see the varmint. I see his clothes, cried the indignant Natty. And if he'll only show so much flesh as will bury a rifle-bullet, thirty to the pound, I'll make him feel me. Go away, Billy. I bid ye. You know my aim, and I bear you no malice. "'You over-calculate your aim, Natty,' said the other, as he stepped behind a pine that stood near him. "'If you think to shoot a man through a tree with a three-foot butt, I can lay this tree right across you in ten minutes, by any man's watch, and in less time, too. So be civil. I want no more than what's right.' There was a simple seriousness in the countenance of Natty that showed he was much in earnest, but it was also evident that he was reluctant to shed human blood. He answered the taunt of the woodchopper by saying, "'I know you drop a tree where you will, Billy Kirby, but if you show a hand or an arm in doing it, there'll be bones to be set and blood to staunch. If it's only to get into the cave that you want, Wait till a two-hour sun, and you may enter it in welcome. But come in now, you shall not. There's one dead body already, lying on the cold rocks, and there's another in which the life can hardly be said to stay. If you will come in, they'll be dead without as well as within." The woodchopper stepped out fearlessly from his cover, and cried, "'That's fair, and what's fair is right. He wants you to stop till it's two hours to sundown, and I see reason in the thing. A man can give up when he's wrong, if you don't crowd him too hard. But you crowd a man, and he gets to be like a stubborn ox. The more you beat, the worse he kicks. The sturdy notions of independence maintained by Billy neither suited the emergency nor the impatience of Mr. Jones, who was burning with a desire to examine the hidden mysteries of the cave. He therefore interrupted this amicable dialogue with his own voice. "'I command you, Nathaniel Bumpo, by my authority, to surrender your person to the law,' he cried. "'And I command you, gentlemen, to aid me in performing my duty.' Benjamin Penguillan, I arrest you, and order you to follow me to the jail of the county, by virtue of this warrant." "'I'd follow you, Squire Dickens,' said Benjamin, removing the pipe from his mouth, for during the whole scene the ex-major domo had been very composedly smoking. "'Aye, I'd sail in your wake to the end of the world, if so be that there was such a place, where there isn't, seeing that it's round. Now mayhap, Master Hollister, having lived all your life on shore, you isn't acquainted with that world, do you see?" "'Surrender!' interrupted the veteran, in a voice that startled his hearers, and which actually caused his own forces to recoil several paces. "'Surrender, Benjamin Penguillan, or expect no quarter.' "'Damn your quarter!' said Benjamin, rising from the log on which he was seated and taking a squint along the barrel of the swivel which had been brought on the hill during the night, and now formed the means of defense on his side of the works. "'Look you, master, or captain, though I questions if you know the name of a rope, 
except the one that's to hang ye. There's no need of singing out as if ye was hailing a deaf man on a topgallant yard. Mayhap you think you've got my true name in your sheepskin, but what British sailor finds it worth while to sail in these seas without a sham on his stern, in case of need, do you see? If you call me Penguillin, you calls me by the name of the man on whose hand, do you see, I hove into daylight, and he was a gentleman. And that's more than my worst enemy will say of any of the family of Benjamin Stubbs. "'Send the warrant round to me, and I'll put in an alias,' cried Hiram, from behind his cover. "'Put in a jackass, and you'll put in yourself, Mr. Do-but-little,' shouted Benjamin, who kept squinting along his little iron tube with great steadiness. "'I give you but one moment to yield,' cried Richard. "'Benjamin! Benjamin! This is not the gratitude I expected from you!' "'I tell you, Richard Jones,' said Natty, who dreaded the sheriff's influence over his comrade, "'though the canister the gal brought be lost, there's powder enough in the cave to lift the rock you stand on. I'll take off my roof if you don't hold your peace.' "'I think it beneath the dignity of my office to parley further with the prisoners,' the sheriff observed to his companion, while they both retired with a precipitancy that Captain Hollister mistook for the signal to advance. "'Charge bayonet!' shouted the veteran. "'March!' Although this signal was certainly expected, it took the assailed a little by surprise, and the veteran approached the works, crying, "'Courage, my brave lads! Give them no quarter unless they surrender!' and struck a furious blow upward with his sabre that would have divided the steward into moieties by subjecting him to the process of decapitation but for the fortunate interference of the muzzle of the swivel. As it was, the gun was dismounted at the critical moment that Benjamin was applying his pipe to the priming, and in consequence some five or six dozen of rifle bullets were projected into the air in nearly a perpendicular line. Philosophy teaches us that the atmosphere will not retain lead, and two pounds of the metal, molded into bullets of thirty to the pound, after describing an ellipsis in their journey, returned to the earth, rattling among the branches of the trees directly over the heads of the troops stationed in the rear of their captain. Much of the success of an attack, made by irregular soldiers, depends on the direction in which they are first got in motion. In the present instance it was retrograde, and in less than a minute after the bellowing report of the swivel among the rocks and caverns, the whole weight of the attack from the left rested on the prowess of the single arm of the veteran. Benjamin received a severe contusion from the recoil of his gun, which produced a short stupor, during which period the ex-steward was prostrate on the ground. Captain Hollister availed himself of this circumstance to scramble over the breastwork and obtain a footing in the bastion, for such was the nature of the fortress as connected with the cave. The moment the veteran found himself within the works of his enemy, he rushed to the edge of the fortification, and, waving his sabre over his head, shouted, "'Victory! Come on, my brave boys! The work's our own!' All this was perfectly military, and was such an example as a gallant officer was in some measure bound to exhibit to his men, but the outcry was the unlucky cause of turning the tide of success. Natty who had been keeping a vigilant eye on the woodchopper, and the enemy immediately before him, wheeled at this alarm, and was appalled at beholding his comrade on the ground, and the veteran standing on his own bulwark, giving forth a cry of victory. The muzzle of the long rifle was turned instantly toward the captain. There was a moment when the life of the old soldier was in great jeopardy, but the object to shoot at was both too large and too near for the leather stocking, who— instead of pulling his trigger, applied the gun to the rear of his enemy, and by a powerful shove sent him outside of the works with much greater rapidity than he had entered them. The spot on which Captain Hollister alighted was directly in front, where, as his feet touched the ground, so steep and slippery was the side of the mountain, it seemed to recede from under them. His motion was swift, and so irregular as utterly to confuse the faculties of the old soldier. During its continuance, 
he supposed himself to be mounted, and charging through the ranks of his enemy. At every tree he made a blow, of course, as at a foot-soldier, and just as he was making the cut St. George at a half-burnt sapling, he landed in the highway, and to his utter amazement at the feet of his own spouse. When Mrs. Hollister, who was toiling up the hill, followed by at least twenty curious boys, leaning with one hand on the staff with which she ordinarily walked, and bearing in the other an empty bag, witnessed this exploit of her husband, indignation immediately got the better, not only of her religion, but of her philosophy. "'Why, Sergeant, is it flyin' ye are?' she cried. "'That I should live to see a husband of mine turn his back to an enemy, and such a one. Here I have been tellin' the boys, as we come along, all about the sage of Yorktown, and how ye was hurted, and how ye'd be acting the same again the day. And I met ye retreating, just as the first gun is fired. Ach, I may throw away the bag, for if there's plunder, twill not be the wife of sich as yourself that will be privileged to be getting the same. They do say, too, there is a power of gold and silver in the place. The Lord forgive me for setting my heart on worldly things, but what falls in the battle, there's scripture for believing, is just the property of the victor. Retreating! exclaimed the amazed veteran. Where's my horse? He has been shot under me. I— Is the man mad? interrupted his wife. Devil the horse do ye own, sergeant, and you're nothing but a shabby captain of Malachy. Oh, if the rail captain was here, tis the other way ye'd be riding, dear, or you would not follow your later. While this worthy couple were thus discussing events, the battle began to rage more violently than ever above them. When Leatherstocking saw his enemy fairly under headway, as Benjamin would express it, he gave his attention to the right wing of the assailants. It would have been easy for Kirby, with his powerful frame, to have seized the moment to scale the bastion, and, with his great strength, to have sent both of its defenders in pursuit of the veteran. But hostility appeared to be the passion that the woodchopper indulged the least in at that moment, for in a voice that was heard by the retreating left wing, he shouted, "'Hurrah! Well done, Captain! Keep it up! How he handles his bush-hook! He makes nothing of a sapling!' And such other encouraging exclamations to the flying veteran, until overcome by mirth, the good-natured fellow seated himself on the ground, kicking the earth with delight, and giving vent to peal after peal of laughter. Natty stood all this time in a menacing attitude with his rifle pointed over the breastwork, watching with a quick and cautious eye the least movement of the assailants. The outcry, unfortunately, tempted the ungovernable curiosity of Hiram to take a peep from behind his cover at the state of the battle. Though this evolution was performed with great caution, in protecting his front, he left, like many a better commander, his rear exposed to the attacks of his enemy. Mr. Doolittle belonged physically to a class of his countrymen to whom nature has denied, in their formation, the use of curved lines. Everything about him was either straight or angular. But his tailor was a woman who worked like a regimental contractor, by a set of rules that gave the same configuration to the whole human species. Consequently, when Mr. Doolittle leaned forward in the manner described, a loose drapery appeared behind the tree at which the rifle of Natty was pointed with the quickness of lightning. A less experienced man would have aimed at the flowing robe, which hung like a festoon halfway to the earth. But the leather stocking knew both the man and his female tailor better. And when the smart report of the rifle was heard, Kirby, who watched the whole maneuver in breathless expectation, saw the bark fly from the beach and the cloth at some distance above the loose folds wave at the same instant. No battery was ever unmasked with more promptitude than Hiram advanced from behind the tree at this summons. He made two or three steps with great precision to the front, and placing one hand on the afflicted part, stretched forth the other with a menacing air toward Natty, and cried aloud, "'God darn ye! This shan't be settled so easy. I'll follow it up from the commons, please, to the court of errors.' 
Such a shocking imprecation from the mouth of so orderly a man as Squire Doolittle, with the fearless manner in which he exposed himself, together with perhaps the knowledge that Natty's rifle was unloaded, encouraged the troops in the rear, who gave a loud shout, and fired a volley into the tree-tops, after the contents of the swivel. Animated by their own noise, the men now rushed on in earnest, and Billy Kirby, who thought the joke, good as it was, had gone far enough, was in the act of scaling the works when Judge Temple appeared on the opposite side, exclaiming, "'Silence and peace! Why do I see murder and bloodshed attempted? Is not the law sufficient to protect itself, that armed bands must be gathered, as in rebellion and war, to see justice performed?' "'Tis the posse comitatus!' shouted the sheriff, from a distant rock. "'Who say, rather, a posse of demons! I command the peace!' "'Hold! Shed not blood!' cried a voice from the top of the vision. "'Hold! For the sake of heaven! Fire no more! All shall be yielded! You shall enter the cave!' Amazement produced the desired effect. Natty who had reloaded his piece, quietly seated himself on the logs, and rested his head on his hands, while the light infantry ceased their military movements and waited the issue in suspense. In less than a minute Edwards came rushing down the hill, followed by Major Hartman, with a velocity that was surprising for his years. They reached the terrace in an instant, from which the youth led the way, by the hollow in the rock, to the mouth of the cave into which they both entered, leaving all without silent, and gazing after them with astonishment. End of chapter 39 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 40 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, a descriptive tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, Please visit LibriVox.org. CHAPTER Forty. I am dumb. Were you the doctor, and I knew you not? SHAKESPEARE During the five or six minutes that elapsed before the youth and Major reappeared, Judge Temple and the Sheriff together with most of the volunteers ascended to the terrace, where the latter began to express their conjectures of the result, and to recount their individual services in the conflict. But the sight of the peacemakers ascending the ravine shut every mouth. On a rude chair, covered with undressed deerskins, they supported a human being, whom they seated carefully and respectfully in the midst of the assembly. His head was covered by long smooth locks of the color of snow. His dress, which was studiously neat and clean, was composed of such fabrics as none but the wealthiest classes wear but was threadbare and patched, and on his feet were placed a pair of moccasins, ornamented in the best manner of Indian ingenuity. The outlines of his face were grave and dignified, though his vacant eye, which opened and turned slowly to the faces of those around him in unmeaning looks, too surely announced that the period had arrived when age brings the mental imbecility of childhood. Natty had followed the supporters of this unexpected object to the top of the cave, and took his station at a little distance behind him, leaning on his rifle in the midst of his pursuers, with a fearlessness that showed that heavier interests than those which affected himself were to be decided. Major Hartman placed himself beside the aged man, uncovered, with his whole soul beaming through those eyes which so commonly danced with frolic and humor. Edwards rested with one hand familiarly but affectionately on the chair, though his heart was swelling with emotions that denied him utterance. All eyes were gazing intently, but each tongue continued mute. At length the decrepit stranger, turning his vacant looks from face to face, made a feeble attempt to rise, while a faint smile crossed his wasted face, like an habitual effort at courtesy as he said, in a hollow, tremulous voice, "'Be pleased to be seated, gentlemen. The council w w will open immediately. Each one who loves a good and virtuous king will wish to see these colonies continue loyal. Be seated, I pray you. Be seated, gentlemen. 
the troops shall halt for the night. This is the wandering of insanity, said Marmaduke. Who will explain this scene? No, sir, said Edwards firmly, tis only the decay of nature. Who is answerable for its pitiful condition remains to be shown. "'Will the gentleman dine with us, my son?' said the old stranger, turning to a voice that he both knew and loved. "'Order a repast suitable for His Majesty's officers. You know we have the best of game always at command.' "'Who is this man?' asked Marmaduke, in a hurried voice, in which the dawnings of conjecture united with interest to put the question. This man, returned Edwards calmly, his voice, however, gradually rising as he proceeded, this man, sir, whom you behold hid in caverns, and deprived of everything that can make life desirable, was once the companion and counsellor of those who ruled your country. This man, whom you see helpless and feeble, was once a warrior, so brave and fearless that even the intrepid natives gave him the name of the Fire-Eater. This man— whom you now see destitute of even the ordinary comfort of a cabin, in which to shelter his head, was once the owner of great riches, and, Judge Temple, he was the rightful proprietor of this very soil on which we stand. This man was the father of— "'This, then,' cried Marmaduke, with a powerful emotion, "'this, then, is the lost Major Effingham.' "'Lost, indeed,' said the youth, fixing a piercing eye on the other. "'And you, and you,' continued the judge, articulating with difficulty, "'I am his grandson.' A minute passed in profound silence. All eyes were fixed on the speakers, and even the old German appeared to wait the issue in deep anxiety. But the moment of agitation soon passed. Marmaduke raised his head from his bosom, where it had sunk, not in shame, but in devout mental thanksgivings and, as large tears fell over his fine manly face, he grasped the hand of the youth warmly, and said, "'Oliver, I forgive all thy harshness, all thy suspicions. I now see it all. I forgive thee everything, but suffering this aged man to dwell in such a place, when not only my habitation but my fortune were at his and thy command.' "'He's true as to steel.' shouted Major Hartman. Didn't I tell you, lad, that Marmaduke Temple was a friend that would never fail in ter dime of neat? It is true, Judge Temple, that my opinions of your conduct have been staggered by what this worthy gentleman has told me. When I found it impossible to convey my grandfather back whence the enduring love of this old man brought him, without detection and exposure, I went to the Mohawk in quest of one of his former comrades in whose justice I had dependence. He is your friend, Judge Temple, but, if what he says be true, both my father and myself may have judged you harshly." "'You name your father,' said Marmaduke tenderly. Was he indeed lost in the packet?" "'He was. He had left me, after several years of fruitless application and comparative poverty, in Nova Scotia, to obtain the compensation for his losses which the British commissioners had at length awarded. After spending a year in England he was returning to Halifax, on his way to a government to which he had been appointed in the West Indies, intending to go to the place where my grandfather had sojourned during and since the war, and take him with us. "'But thou,' said Marmaduke, with powerful interest, "'I had thought that thou hadst perished with him.' A flush passed over the cheeks of the young man, who gazed about him at the wondering faces of the volunteers and continued silent. Marmaduke turned to the veteran captain, who just then rejoined his command, and said, "'March thy soldiers back again, and dismiss them. The zeal of the sheriff has much mistaken his duty. Dr. Todd, I will thank you to attend to the injury which Hiram Doolittle has received in this untoward affair. Richard, you will oblige me by sending up the carriage to the top of the hill. Benjamin, return to your duty in my family.' Unwelcome as these orders were to most of the auditors, the suspicion that they had somewhat exceeded the wholesome restraints of the law, and the habitual respect with which all the commands of the judge were received, induced a prompt compliance. When they were gone, 
and the rock was left to the parties most interested in an explanation, Marmaduke, pointing to the aged Major Effingham, said to his grandson, "'Had we not better remove thy parent from this open place until my carriage can arrive?' "'Pardon me, sir, the air does him good, and he has taken it whenever there was no dread of a discovery. I know not how to act, Judge Temple. Ought I? Can I suffer Major Effingham to become an inmate of your family?' "'Thou shalt be thyself the judge,' said Marmaduke. "'Thy father was my early friend. He entrusted his fortune to my care. When we separated he had such confidence in me that he wished no security, no evidence of the trust, even had there been time or convenience for exacting it. "'This thou hast heard?' "'Most truly, sir,' said Edwards, or rather Effingham, as we must now call him. "'We differed in politics.' If the cause of this country was successful, the trust was sacred with me, for none knew of thy father's interest. If the crown still held its sway, it would be easy to restore the property of so loyal a subject as Colonel Effingham. Is not this plain? The premises are good, sir, continued the youth, with the same incredulous look as before. Listen, listen, poy, said the German. There is not a hair as of der rogue and der hat of hair chuge. We all know the issue of the struggle, continued Marmaduke, disregarding both. Thy grandfather was left in Connecticut, regularly supplied by thy father, with the means of such a subsistence as suited his wants. This I well knew, though I never had intercourse with him, even in our happiest days. Thy father retired with the troops to prosecute his claims on England. At all events, his losses must be great, for his real estates were sold, and I became the lawful purchaser. It was not unnatural to wish that he might have no bar to its just recovery. There was none, but the difficulty of providing for so many claimants. But there would have been one, and an insuperable one, and I announced to the world that I held these estates, multiplied by the times and my industry, a hundredfold in value, only as his trustee. Thou knowest that I supplied him with considerable sums immediately after the war. You did, until my letters were returned unopened. Thy father had much of thy own spirit, Oliver. He was sometimes hasty and rash. The judge continued in a self-condemning manner. Perhaps my fault lies the other way. I may possibly look too far ahead and calculate too deeply. It certainly was a severe trial to allow the man whom I most loved to think ill of me for seven years in order that he might honestly apply for his just remunerations. But had he opened my last letters, thou wouldst have learned the whole truth. Those I sent him to England, by what my agent writes me, he did read. He died, Oliver, knowing all. He died my friend, and I thought thou hadst died with him. Our poverty would not permit us to pay for two passages, said the youth with the extraordinary emotion with which he ever alluded to the degraded state of his family. I was left in the province to wait for his return, and when the sad news of his loss reached me I was nearly penniless. "'And what didst thou, boy?' asked Marmaduke in a faltering voice. I took my passage here in search of my grandfather, for I well knew that his resources were gone, with the half-pay of my father. On reaching his abode, I learned that he had left in secret, though the reluctant hireling, who had deserted him in his poverty, owned to my urgent entreaties that he believed he had been carried away by an old man, who had formerly been his servant. I knew at once it was Natty, for my father often— "'Was Natty a servant of thy grandfather?' exclaimed the judge. "'Of that too were you ignorant?' said the youth, in evident surprise. "'How should I know it? I never met the Major.' nor was the name of Bumpo ever mentioned to me. I knew him only as a man of the woods, and one who lived by hunting. Such men are too common to excite surprise. He was reared in the family of my grandfather, served him for many years during their campaigns at the West, where he became attached to the woods. And he was left here as a kind of locum tenens on the lands that old Mohegan, whose life my grandfather once saved, induced the Delawares to grant to him when they admitted him as an honorary member of their tribe. This, then, is thy Indian blood? 
"'I have no other,' said Edward, smiling. Major Effingham was adopted as the son of Mohegan, who at that time was the greatest man in his nation, and my father, who visited those people when a boy, received the name of the Eagle from them, on account of the shape of his face, as I understand. They have extended this title to me. I have no other Indian blood or breeding, though I have seen the hour, Judge Temple, when I could wish that such had been my lineage and education. Proceed with thy tale, said Marmaduke. I have but little more to say, sir. I followed to the lake where I had so often been told that Natty dwelt, and found him maintaining his old master in secret, for even he could not bear to exhibit to the world in his poverty and dotage a man whom a whole people once looked up to with respect. And what did you? What did I? I spent my last money in purchasing a rifle, clad myself in a coarse garb, and learned to be a hunter by the side of leather stocking. You know the rest, Judge Temple. And where was old Fritz Hartmann? said the German reproachfully. Didst never hear a name as of old Fritz Hartmann from der mouth of der father, lad? I may have been mistaken, gentlemen, returned the youth, but I had pride, and could not submit to such an exposure as this day even has reluctantly brought to light. I had plans that might have been visionary, but, should my parents survive till autumn, I proposed taking him with me to the city, where we have distant relatives, who must have learned to forget the Tory by this time. He decays rapidly, he continued mournfully, and must soon lie by the side of old Mohegan. The air being pure, and the day fine, the party continued conversing on the rock, until the wheels of Judge Temple's carriage were heard clattering up the side of the mountain during which time the conversation was maintained with deep interest, each moment clearing up some doubtful action and lessening the antipathy of the youth to Marmaduke. He no longer objected to the removal of his grandfather, who displayed a childish pleasure when he found himself seated once more in a carriage. When placed in the ample hall of the mansion-house, the eyes of the aged veteran turned slowly to the objects in the apartment, and a look like the dawn of intellect would for moments flit across his features when he invariably offered some useless courtesies to those near him, wandering painfully in his subjects. The exercise and the change soon produced an exhaustion that caused them to remove him to his bed, where he lay for hours evidently sensible of the change in his comforts, and exhibiting that mortifying picture of human nature, which too plainly shows that the propensities of the animal continue even after the nobler part of the creature appears to have vanished. Until his parent was placed comfortably in bed, with Natty seated at his side, Effingham did not quit him. He then obeyed a summons to the library of the judge, where he found the latter, with Major Hartman, waiting for him. "'Read this paper, Oliver,' said Marmaduke to him as he entered, "'and thou wilt find that, so far from intending thy family wrong during life, it has been my care to see that justice should be done at even a later day.' The youth took the paper which his first glance told him was the will of the judge. Hurried and agitated as he was, he discovered that the date corresponded with the time of the unusual depression of Marmaduke. As he proceeded, his eyes began to moisten, and the hand which held the instrument shook violently. The will commenced with the usual forms, spun out by the ingenuity of Mr. Vanderschool. But after this subject was fairly exhausted, the pen of Marmaduke became plainly visible. In clear, distinct, manly, and even eloquent language, he recounted his obligations to Colonel Effingham, the nature of their connection, and the circumstances in which they separated. He then proceeded to relate the motives of his silence, mentioning, however, large sums that he had forwarded to his friend, which had been returned with the letters unopened. After this, he spoke of his search for the grandfather who unaccountably disappeared and his fears that the direct heir of the trust was buried in the ocean with his father. After, in short, recounting in a clear narrative the events which our readers must now be able to connect, he proceeded to make a fair and exact statement of the sums left in his care by Colonel Effingham. A devise of his whole estate to certain responsible trustees followed, 
to hold the same for the benefit in equal moieties of his daughter, on one part, and of Oliver Effingham, formerly a major in the army of Great Britain, and of his son Edward Effingham, and of his son Edward Oliver Effingham, or to the survivor of them, and the descendants of such survivor forever on the other part. The trust was to endure until 1810, when, if no person appeared, or could be found, after sufficient notice, to claim the moiety so devised, then a certain sum, calculating the principal and interest of his debt to Colonel Effingham, was to be paid to the heirs at law of the Effingham family, and the bulk of his estate was to be conveyed in fee to his daughter, or her heirs. The tears fell from the eyes of the young man as he read this undeniable testimony of the good faith of Marmaduke, and his bewildered gaze was fastened on the paper when a voice that thrilled on every nerve spoke near him, saying, "'Do you yet doubt us, Oliver?' "'I have never doubted you,' cried the youth, recovering his recollection and his voice, as he sprang to seize the hand of Elizabeth. "'No, not one moment has my faith in you wavered.' and my father? God bless him. I thank thee, my son, said the judge, exchanging a warm pressure of the hand with the youth. But we have both erred. Thou hast been too hasty, and I have been too slow. One half of my estate shall be thine as soon as they can be conveyed to thee, and if what my suspicions tell me be true, I suppose the other must follow speedily. He took the hand which he held, and united it with that of his daughter, and motioned toward the door to the major. "'I telt yon vat, gal,' said the old German good-humouredly. "'If I was as I was ven I servit mit his grandfather, under lakes, ter lazy tog shouldn't vin ter prizes for nothing.' "'Come, come, old Fritch,' said the judge. "'You are seventy, not seventeen. Richard waits for you with a bowl of eggnog in the hall.' "'Richard, de devil!' exclaimed the other hastening out of the room. He makes ter nog as for ter horse, built show ter sheriff mit my own hands. Ter devil! I believe he sweetens mit ter Yankee molasses. Marmaduke smiled and nodded affectionately at the young couple, and closed the door after them. If any of our readers expect that we are going to open it again for their gratification, they are mistaken. The tete-a-tete continued for a very unreasonable time how long we shall not say. But it was ended by six o'clock in the evening, for at that hour M. Le Quoy made his appearance agreeably to the appointment of the preceding day, and claimed the ear of Miss Temple. He was admitted. When he made an offer of his hand, with much suavity, together with his amis big and lit, his père, his mère, and his sucre bouche, Elizabeth might possibly have previously entered into some embarrassing and binding engagements with Oliver, for she declined the tender of all, in terms as polite, though perhaps a little more decided, than those in which they were made. The Frenchman soon joined the German and the sheriff in the hall, who compelled him to take a seat with them at the table, where, by the aid of punch, wine, and eggnog, they soon extracted from the complacent Monsieur Lacroix the nature of his visit. It was evident that he had made the offer as a duty which a well-bred man owed to a lady in such a retired place, before he had left the country, and that his feelings were but very little, if at all, interested in the matter. After a few potations, the waggish pair persuaded the exhilarated Frenchman that there was an inexcusable partiality in offering to one lady, and not extending a similar courtesy to another. Consequently, about nine, M. Le Quoy sallied forth to the rectory on a similar mission to Miss Grant, which proved as successful as his first effort in love. When he returned to the mansion-house at ten, Richard and the Major were still seated at the table. They attempted to persuade the Gaul, as the sheriff called him, that he should next try remarkable Pettibone. But, though stimulated by mental excitement and wine, two hours of abstruse logic were thrown away on this subject for he declined their advice with a pertinacity truly astonishing in so polite a man. When Benjamin lighted M. Le Quoy from the door, he said at parting, "'If so be, Monsieur, you'd run alongside Mistress Pettibones, as the Squire Dickens was bidding you, tis my notion you'd have been grappled, in which case, do you see, 
ye might have been troubled in swinging clear again in a handsome manner. For though if Miss Lizzie and the Parson's young and be tidy little vessels that shoot by a body on a wind, Mistress Remarkable is summit of a galliot fashion. When you once takes em in tow, they doesn't like to be cast off again. End of chapter 40 Recording by Bill Borst Chapter 41 of The Pioneers, or The Sources of the Susquehanna, A Descriptive Tale by James Fenimore Cooper. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Chapter 41 Yes, sweep ye on! We will not leave, for them who triumph those who grieve. With that armada gay be laughter loud and jocund shout, but with that skill abides the minstrel tale. Lord of the Isles The events of our tale carry us through the summer, and after making nearly the circle of the year, we must conclude our labors in the delightful month of October. Many important incidents had, however, occurred in the intervening period a few of which it may be necessary to recount. The two principal were the marriage of Oliver and Elizabeth, and the death of Major Effingham. They both took place early in September, and the former preceded the latter only a few days. The old man passed away like the last glimmering of a taper, and though his death cast a melancholy over the family, grief could not follow such an end. One of the chief concerns of Marmaduke was to reconcile the even conduct of a magistrate with the course that his feelings dictated to the criminals. The day succeeding the discovery at the cave, however, Natty and Benjamin re-entered the jail peaceably, where they continued, well-fed and comfortable, until the return of an express to Albany, who brought the governor's pardon to the leather stocking. In the meantime, proper means were employed to satisfy Hiram for the assaults on his person and on the same day the two comrades issued together into society again, with their characters not at all affected by the imprisonment. Mr. Doolittle began to discover that neither architecture nor his law was quite suitable to the growing wealth and intelligence of the settlement, and after exacting the last cent that was attainable in his compromise, to use the language of the country he pulled up stakes, and proceeded farther west, scattering his professional science and legal learning through the land, vestiges of both of which are to be discovered there even to the present hour. Poor Jotham, whose life paid the forfeiture of his folly, acknowledged before he died that his reasons for believing in a mine were extracted from the lips of a sibyl, who by looking in a magic glass was enabled to discover the hidden treasures of the earth. Such superstition was frequent in the new settlements and after the first surprise was over, the better part of the community forgot the subject. But at the same time that it removed from the breast of Richard a lingering suspicion of the acts of the three hunters, it conveyed a mortifying lesson to him, which brought many quiet hours in future to his cousin Marmaduke. It may be remembered that the sheriff confidently pronounced this to be no visionary scheme, and that word was enough to shut his lips at any time within the next ten years. M. Lacroix, who has been introduced to our readers because no picture of that country would be faithful without some such character, found the island of Martinique and his sucre-bouche in possession of the English, but Marmaduke and his family were much gratified in soon hearing that he had returned to his bureau in Paris, where he afterward issued yearly bulletins of his happiness and of his gratitude to his friends in America. With this brief explanation, we must return to our narrative. Let the American reader imagine one of our mildest October mornings, when the sun seems a ball of silvery fire, and the elasticity of the air is felt while it is inhaled, imparting vigor and life to the whole system. The weather, neither too warm nor too cold, but of that happy temperature which stirs the blood, without bringing the lassitude of spring. It was on such a morning, about the middle of the month, that Oliver entered the hall where Elizabeth was issuing her usual orders for the day, and requesting her to join him in a short excursion to the lakeside. The tender melancholy in the manner of her husband caught the attention of Elizabeth, who instantly abandoned her concerns, 
threw a light shawl across her shoulders, and concealing her raven hair under a gypsy hat, took his arm and submitted herself, without a question, to his guidance. They crossed the bridge, and had turned from the highway along the margin of the lake before a word was exchanged. Elizabeth well knew by the direction the object of the walk, and respected the feelings of her companion too much to indulge in untimely conversation. But when they gained the open fields, and her eye roamed over the placid lake, covered with wild fowl, already journeying from the great northern waters to seek a warmer sun, but lingering to play in the limpid sheet of the Otsego, and to the sides of the mountain, which were gay with the thousand dyes of autumn, as if to grace their bridal, the swelling heart of the young wife burst out in speech. "'This is not a time for silence, Oliver,' she said, clinging more fondly to his arm. Everything in nature seems to speak the praises of the Creator. Why should we, who have so much to be grateful for, be silent?" "'Speak on,' said her husband, smiling. "'I love the sounds of your voice. You must anticipate our errand hither. I have told you my plans. How do you like them?' "'I must first see them,' returned his wife. "'But I have had my plans, too. It is time I should begin to divulge them. You. It is something for the comfort of my old friend Natty, I know. Certainly of Natty. But we have other friends besides the leather stocking to serve. Do you forget Louisa and her father? No, surely. Have I not given one of the best farms in the county to the good divine? As for Louisa, I should wish you to keep her always near us. You do, said Elizabeth, slightly compressing her lips. But poor Louisa may have other views for herself. She may wish to follow my example, and marry." "'I don't think it,' said Effingham, musing a moment. "'I really don't know any one hereabouts good enough for her.' "'Perhaps not her. But there are other places besides Templeton, and other churches besides New St. Paul's.' "'Churches, Elizabeth. You would not wish to lose Mr. Grant, surely. Though simple, he is an excellent man. I shall never find another who has half the veneration for my orthodoxy. You would humble me from a saint to a very common sinner." "'It must be done, sir,' returned the lady, with a half-concealed smile, though it degrades you from an angel to a man. "'But you forget the farm? He can lease it, as others do. Besides, would you have a clergyman toil in the fields? Where can he go? You forget Louisa. "'No, I do not forget Louisa,' said Elizabeth, again compressing her beautiful lips. "'You know, Effingham, that my father has told you that I ruled him, and that I should rule you. I am now about to exert my power.' "'Anything, anything, dear Elizabeth, but not at the expense of us all, not at the expense of your friend.' "'How do you know, sir, that it will be so much at the expense of my friend?' said the lady, fixing her eyes with a searching look on his countenance where they met only the unsuspecting expression of manly regret. "'How do I know it? Why, it is natural that she should regret us.' "'It is our duty to struggle with our natural feelings,' returned the lady, "'and there is but little cause to fear that such a spirit as Louisa's will not affect it.' "'But what is your plan?' "'Listen, and you shall know.' My father has procured a call for Mr. Grant to one of the towns on the Hudson, where he can live more at his ease than in journeying through these woods, where he can spend the evening of his life in comfort and quiet, and where his daughter may meet with such society and form such a connection as may be proper for one of her years and character. Bess, you amaze me. I did not think you had been such a manager. Oh, I manage more deeply than you imagine, sir, said the wife, archly smiling again but it is thy will, and it is your duty to submit, for a time at least." Effingham laughed. But as they approached the end of their walk, the subject was changed by common consent. The place at which they arrived was the little spot of level ground where the cabin of the leather stocking had so long stood. Elizabeth found it entirely cleared of rubbish, and beautifully laid down in turf, by the removal of sods which, in common with the surrounding country, had grown gay under the influence of profuse showers, as if a second spring had passed over the land. This little place was surrounded by a circle of mason-work, and they entered by a small gate, near which, to the surprise of both, 
The rifle of Natty was leaning against the wall. Hector and the slut reposed on the grass by its side, as if conscious that, however altered, they were lying on the ground and were surrounded by objects with which they were familiar. The hunter himself was stretched on the earth, before a headstone of white marble, pushing aside, with his fingers, the long grass that had already sprung up from the luxuriant soil around its base, apparently to lay bare the inscription. By the side of this stone, which was a simple slab at the head of a grave, stood a rich monument, decorated with an urn and ornamented with the chisel. Oliver and Elizabeth approached the graves with a light tread, unheard by the old hunter, whose sunburnt face was working, and whose eyes twinkled as if something impeded their vision. After some little time Natty raised himself slowly from the ground, and said aloud, "'Well, well, I'm bold to say it's all right. There's something that I suppose is reading, but I can't make anything of it, though the pipe and the tomahawk and the moccasins be pretty well, pretty well for a man that, I dares to say, never seed either of the things. Oz me! There they lie, side by side, happy enough. Who will there be to put me in the earth when my time comes? When that unfortunate hour arrives, Natty, friends shall not be wanting to perform the last offices for you," said Oliver, a little touched at the hunter's soliloquy. The old man turned, without manifesting surprise, for he had got the Indian habits in this particular, and running his hand under the bottom of his nose seemed to wipe away his sorrow with the action. "'You've come out to see the graves, children, have you?' he said. "'Well, well, they're wholesome sights, too young as well as old. "'I hope they are fitted to your liking,' said Effingham. "'No one has a better right than yourself to be consulted in the matter.' "'Why, seeing that I ain't used to fine graves,' returned the old man, "'it is but little matter concerning my taste. "'You laid the Major's head to the west, and Mohegan's to the east, did you, lad?' "'At your request it was done.' "'It's so best,' said the hunter. "'They thought they had to journey different ways, children, though there is one greater than all who will bring the just together, at his own time, and who will whiten the skin of a blackamoor, and place him on a footing with princes.' "'There is but little reason to doubt that,' said Elizabeth, whose decided tones were changed to a soft, melancholy voice. "'I trust we shall all meet again, and be happy together.' "'Shall we, child?' "'Shall we?' exclaimed the hunter, with unusual fervor. "'There's comfort in that thought, too. But before I go I should like to know what tis you tell these people that be flocking into the country like pigeons in the spring, of the old Delaware, and of the bravest white man that ever trod the hills.' Effingham and Elizabeth were surprised at the manner of the leather-stocking, which was unusually impressive and solemn, but attributing it to the scene, the young man turned to the monument and read aloud. Sacred to the memory of Oliver Effingham, Esquire, formerly a major in his B. Majesty's sixtieth foot, a soldier of tried valor, a subject of chivalrous loyalty, and a man of honesty. To these values he added the graces of a Christian. The morning of his life was spent in honor, wealth, and power, but its evening was obscured by poverty, neglect, and disease which were alleviated only by the tender care of his old, faithful, and upright friend and attendant, Nathaniel Bumpo. His descendants rest this stone to the virtues of the master, and to the enduring gratitude of the servant. The leather stocking started at the sound of his own name, and a smile of joy illuminated his wrinkled features, as he said, "'And did you say it, lad?' Have you then got the old man's name cut in the stone by the side of his master's? God bless you, children. Twas a kind thought, and kindness goes to the heart as life shortens." Elizabeth turned her back to the speakers. Effingham made a fruitless effort before he succeeded in saying, "'It is there cut in plain marble, but it should have been written in letters of gold.' "'Show me the name, boy,' said Natty, with simple eagerness. "'Let me see my own name placed in such honour. "'Tis a generous gift to a man who leaves none of his name and family behind him "'in a country where he has tarried so long.' "'Effingham guided his finger to the spot, "'and Natty followed the windings of the letters to the end with deep interest, "'when he raised himself from the tomb and said, 
I suppose it's all right, and it's kindly thought and kindly done. But what have you put over the redskin? You shall hear. This stone is raised to the memory of an Indian chief of the Delaware tribe, who was known by the several names of John Mohegan, Mohican, Mohican lad, they call themselves Hecan, Mohican, and Chingagook, Gatch boy, Gatch Gook, Chingachgook, which interpreted means Big Serpent. The name should be set down right, for an Indian's name has always some meaning in it. I will see it altered. He was the last of his people who continued to inhabit this country, and it may be said of him that his faults were those of an Indian, and his virtues those of a man. You never said truer word, Mr. Oliver, Oz me. If you had knowed him as I did, in his prime, in that very battle where the old gentleman, who sleeps by his side, saved his life, when them thieves, the Iroquois, had him at the stake, you'd have said all that, and more, too. I cut the thongs with this very hand, and gave him my own tomahawk and knife, seeing that the rifle was always my favorite weapon. He did lay about him like a man. I met him as I was coming home from the trail, with eleven mingle scalps on his pole. You needn't shudder, Madam Effingham, for they was all from shaved heads and warriors. When I look about me at these hills, where I used to could count sometimes twenty smokes, curling over the tree-tops, from the Delaware camps, it raises mournful thoughts to think that not a red skin is left of them all, unless it be a drunken vagabond from the Oneidas, or them Yankee Indians who, they say, be moving up from the seashore, and who belong to none of God's creatures to my seeming, being, as it were, neither fish nor flesh, neither white man nor savage. Well, well, the time has come at last, and I must go. Go? echoed Edwards. Whither do you go? The leather-stocking, who had imbibed unconsciously many of the Indian qualities, though he always thought of himself as a civilized being, compared with even the Delawares, averted his face to conceal the workings of his muscles as he stooped to lift a large pack from behind the tomb, which he placed deliberately on his shoulders. "'Go!' exclaimed Elizabeth, approaching him with a hurried step. "'You should not venture so far in the woods alone at your time of life, Natty.' Indeed, it is imprudent. He is bent, Effingham, on some distant hunting. What Mrs. Effingham tells you is true, Leatherstocking, said Edwards. There can be no necessity for your submitting to such hardships now. So throw aside your pack, and confine your hunt to the mountains near us, if you will go. Hardship. Tis a pleasure, children, and the greatest that is left me on this side of the grave. "'No, no, you shall not go to such a distance,' cried Elizabeth, laying her white hand on his deerskin pack. "'I am right. I feel his camp-kettle and a canister of powder. He must not be suffered to wander so far from us, Oliver. Remember how suddenly Mohegan dropped away.' "'I knowed the parting would come hard, children. I knowed it would,' said Natty. "'And so I got aside to look at the graves by myself.' and thought if I left ye the keepsake which the Major gave me, when we first parted in the woods, ye wouldn't take it unkind, but would know that, let the old man's body go where it might, his feelings stayed behind him. "'This means something more than common,' exclaimed the youth. "'Where is it, Natty, that you purpose going?' The hunter drew nigh him with a confident, reasoning air, as if what he had to say would silence all objections, and replied, why, lad, they tell me that on the big lakes there's the best of hunting, and a great range without a white man on it, unless it be one like myself. I'm weary of living in clearings, and where the hammer is sounding in my ears from sunrise to sundown. And though I'm much bound to you both, children, I wouldn't say it if it was not true, I crave to go into the woods again. I do. Woods, echoed Elizabeth, trembling with her feelings. Do you not call these endless forests woods? Ah, child, these be nothing to a man that's used to the wilderness. I have took but little comfort sin your father come on with his settlers. But I wouldn't go far while the life was in the body that lies under the sod there. But now he's gone, and Chingachgook is gone, and you be both young and happy. Yes, 
The big house has rung with merriment this month past, and now I thought was the time to get a little comfort in the close of my days. Woods, indeed. I doesn't call these woods, Madam Effingham, where I lose myself every day of my life in the clearings. If there be anything wanting to your comfort, name it, Leatherstocking. If it be attainable, it is yours. You mean all for the best, lad. I know. And so does Madam, too. But your ways isn't my ways. Tis like the dead there, who thought, when the breath was in them, that one went east and one went west to find their heavens. But they'll meet at last, and so shall we, children. Yes, and as you've begun, and we shall meet in the land of the just at last. This is so new, so unexpected, said Elizabeth, in almost breathless excitement. I had thought you meant to live with us and die with us, Natty. Words are of no avail, exclaimed her husband. The habits of forty years are not to be dispossessed by the ties of a day. I know you too well to urge you further, Natty, unless you will let me build you a hut on one of the distant hills, where we can sometimes see you, and know that you are comfortable. Don't fear for the leather stocking, children. God will see that his days be provided for, and his end happy. I know you mean all for the best, but our ways doesn't agree. I love the woods, and ye relish the face of man. I eat when hungry, and drink when a dry, and ye keep stated hours and rules. Nay, nay, you even overfeed the dogs, lad, from pure kindness, and hounds should be gaunty to run well. The meanest of God's creatures be made for some use, and I am formed for the wilderness. If you love me, let me go where my soul craves to be again." The appeal was decisive, and not another word of entreaty for him to remain was then uttered. But Elizabeth bent her head to her bosom and wept, while her husband dashed away the tears from his eyes, and with hands that almost refused to perform their office he procured his pocket-book and extended a parcel of bank-notes to the hunter. Take these, he said, at least take these, secure them about your person, and in the hour of need they will do you good service. The old man took the notes and examined them with curious eye. This, then, is some of the new-fashioned money that they've been making at Albany, out of paper. It can't be worth much to they that hasn't learning. No, no, lad, take back the stuff. It will do me no service. I took care to get all the Frenchman's powder afore he broke up and they say lead grows where I'm going. It isn't even fit for wads, seeing that I use none but leather. Madam Effingham, let the old man kiss your hand, and wish God's choicest blessings on you and yourn. Once more let me beseech you, stay, cried Elizabeth. Do not, leather stocking, leave me to grieve for the man who has twice rescued me from death, and who has served those I love so faithfully. For my sake, if not for your own, stay. I shall see you in those frightful dreams that still haunt my nights, dying in poverty and age by the side of those terrific beasts you slew. There will be no evil that sickness, want, and solitude can inflict, that my fancy will not conjure as your fate. Stay with us, old man, if not for your own sake, at least for ours. Such thoughts and bitter dreams, Madam Effingham, returned the hunter solemnly, will never haunt an innocent person long. They'll pass away with God's pleasure, and if the catamounts be yet brought to your eyes in sleep, tis not for my sake, but to show you the power of him that led me there to save you. Trust in God, madam, and your honorable husband, and the thoughts for an old man like me can never be long nor bitter. I pray that the Lord will keep you in mind, the Lord that lives in clearings as well as in the wilderness, and bless you and all that belong to you from this time till the great day when the whites shall meet the redskins in judgment, and justice shall be the law, and not power." Elizabeth raised her head and offered her colorless cheek to his salute, when he lifted his cap and touched it respectfully. His hand was grasped with convulsive fervor by the youth, who continued silent. The hunter prepared himself for his journey, drawing his belt tighter, and wasting his moments in the little reluctant movements of a sorrowful departure. Once or twice he essayed to speak, but a rising in his throat prevented it. At length he shouldered his rifle, and cried with a clear huntsman's call that echoed through the woods, "'Here, 
Here, pups! Away, dogs, away! You'll be footsore afore you see the end of the journey. The hounds leaped from the earth at this cry, and scenting around the grave and silent pair, as if conscious of their own destination, they followed humbly at the heels of their master. A short pause succeeded, during which even the youth concealed his face on his grandfather's tomb. When the pride of manhood, however, had suppressed the feelings of nature, he turned to renew his entreaties, but saw that the cemetery was occupied only by himself and his wife. "'He is gone!' cried Effingham. Elizabeth raised her face, and saw the old hunter standing looking back for a moment on the verge of the wood. As he caught their glances, he drew his hard hand hastily across his eyes again, waved it on high for an adieu, and, uttering a forced cry to his dogs, who were crouching at his feet, he entered the forest. This was the last they ever saw of the leather stocking, whose rapid movements preceded the pursuit, which Judge Temple both ordered and conducted. He had gone far toward the setting sun, the foremost in that band of pioneers who are opening the way for the march of the nation across the continent. End of chapter 41 Recording by Bill Borst End of the Pioneers by James Fenimore Cooper